Preface of the Boy Travelers in Mexico. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Lynette Calkins. The Boy Travelers in Mexico by Thomas Wallace Knox. Preface Until within the past few years, Mexico was a country not easily reached from the principal cities of the United States, and our relations with it were by no means intimate. Since the completion of the railway from the frontier of Texas to the heart of the most northerly of the Spanish-American republics, there has been a rapid development of commercial and social relations between Mexico and the United States and the tide of travel from one country to the other is steadily increasing year by year. These circumstances have led the author of The Boy Travelers to believe that his young friends everywhere would welcome a book describing the land of the Aztecs, its history and resources, the manners and customs of its people, and the many curious things to be seen, and adventures passed through, in a journey from one end of that country to the other. In this belief, he sought the aid of his and their friends, Frank and Fred, immediately after their return from Australasia. Ever ready to be of service, the youths assented to his request to make a tour of the Mexican Republic, in company with their guide and mentor, Dr. Bronson, and the result of their journey is set forth in the following pages. It is confidently hoped that the narrative will be found in every particular fully equal to any of its predecessors in the series to which it belongs. The methods on which the boy travelers have hitherto performed their work have been adhered to in the present volume. In addition to his personal acquaintance with Mexico and travels in that country, the author has drawn upon the observations of those who have preceded and followed him there. He has consulted books of history, travel, and statistics in great number, has sought the best and most accurate maps, and while his work was in progress, he consulted many persons familiar with Mexico, and was in frequent correspondence with gentlemen now residing there. He has sought to bring the social, political, and commercial history of the country down to the latest date, and to present a truthful picture of the present status of our sister republic. The result of his efforts he submits herewith to the judgment of his readers. Many of the works that have been consulted are named in the text, but it has not been convenient to refer to all. Among those to which the author is indebted may be mentioned the following. Bishop's Old Mexico and Her Lost Provinces Griffin's Mexico of Today Havens, Our Next Door Neighbor, Charnay's, Ancient Cities of the New World, Squires, Nicaragua, and Central America, Wells's, Honduras, Stevens's, Travels in Central America, Chiapas, and Yucatan, Baldwin's, Ancient America, Wilson's, Mexico and its Religions, Abbott's, Hernando Cortez, Prescott's, Conquest of Mexico, Ober's, Travels in Mexico, Geiger's, Peep at Mexico, Gucci's, Face to Face with the Mexicans, Chevalier's, Mexique Echant et Moderne, and the handbooks of Hanvier, Conkling, and Hamilton. As in the other boy traveler volumes, the author is indebted to the liberality of his publishers, Messrs. Harper and Brothers, for the use of engravings that have appeared in previous publications relative to Mexico and Central America, in addition to those specially prepared for this book. As a result of their generosity, he has been enabled to add greatly to the interest of the work, particularly to the younger portion of his readers, for whom illustrations always have an especial charm. York, June 1889 End of preface. Chapter One of The Boy Travelers in Mexico. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. 
Read by Lynette Calkins. The Boy Travelers in Mexico by Thomas Wallace Knox. Chapter 1 I've news for you, Frank. Well, what is it? We're going to Mexico next week, answered Fred. At any rate, that is Uncle's plan, and he will tell us all about it this evening. The news is good news, was the reply, for Mexico is one of the countries that just now I want very much to see. We have heard a great deal about it since the railway was completed to the capital, and then, you know, the Mexicans are our neighbors. That is true, said Fred. Here we've been going all over the rest of the world and haven't yet called on our neighbors, and next-door neighbors, too. But we're not alone in this, as it is probable that for every inhabitant of the northern states who has visited Mexico, a hundred have been across the Atlantic. This conversation occurred between Frank Bassett and Fred Bronson, shortly after returning from their tour among the islands of the Pacific Ocean and through New Zealand, Tasmania, and Australia. The accounts of their journeys have appeared in several volumes with which our readers are or should be familiar. The youths waited with some impatience until evening when they were to hear from Dr. Bronson the details of the proposed trip. In the meantime, they devoted themselves to their Spanish grammars and dictionaries, which they had not seen for months owing to their occupation with other matters. And we may here add that until their departure and while they were on the road, every moment that could be applied to the study of the language of the country whither they were bound was industriously employed. By the time they crossed the border, they were able to speak Spanish very well, and had very little need of interpreters. "'We shall go to Mexico by rail,' said the doctor, "'and return by sea. At any rate, that is my plan at present, but circumstances may change it. It is my intention to visit the principal cities and other places of interest.' and also to give some attention to the antiquities of the country and of Central America. Exactly what places we shall see, I cannot say at this moment, nor how long we shall be absent. What shall we need in way of baggage? one of the youths asked. About what you need for a long journey north and south in the United States, was the reply. You will need clothing for hot weather as well as for cold, we shall find it quite chilly in certain parts of the Tierra Fria, or highlands, and warm enough in the Tierra Caliente, or lowlands along the coast. You must have outer and under clothing adapted to warm and cool climates, and your ulsters may be placed for convenience in the same bundle with your linen dusters. Have a good supply of underclothing, as the facilities for laundry work are not the best, even in the large cities but do not load yourselves with anything not absolutely necessary, as the Mexican railways allow only 33 pounds of baggage to a local passenger, and the charges for extra weight are high. Passengers with through tickets from the United States are entitled to 150 pounds of baggage free. Of course, continued the doctor, you will want some books on Mexico, partly for historical research and partly for description. There is an excellent guidebook which was written by Mr. Hanvier, and there is another by Mr. Conkling. Get them both, and also Old Mexico and Her Lost Provinces by Mr. Bishop, Mexico of Today by Mr. Griffin, and Our Next Door Neighbor by Bishop Haven. Don't forget Charney's Ancient Cities of the New World and Prescott's Conquest of Mexico. You can read the latter book before we go. It is inconveniently large for traveling purposes, and so we will be leaving it behind us, as we can easily find it in the city of Mexico, in case we wish to refer to it again. Abbott's Life of Hernando Cortes is a more portable work and will serve to refresh your memory concerning what you read in Prescott's volumes. The conversation lasted an hour or more, and by the time it ended, the boys almost felt that they were already in the land of the Aztecs. Their dreams through the night were of ancient temples and modern palaces, 
Aztec and Spanish warriors, snowy mountains and palm-covered plains, mines of silver and other metals, fortresses, cathedrals, haciendas, and hovels, and of many races and tribes of men that dwell in the land they were about to see. Fred declared in the morning that he had dreamed of Montezuma and Maximilian walking arm in arm, and Frank professed to have had a similar vision concerning Cortez and General Scott. For the next few days the youths had no spare time on their hands, and when the start was made for the proposed journey, they were well prepared for it both mentally and materially. They had followed Dr. Bronson's directions as to their outfit of clothing and other things, had procured the books which he named, and, as we have already seen, had made a vigorous overhauling of their Spanish grammars and phrase books. From New York there are several routes westward, as our readers are pretty well aware, and the youths were a little puzzled to know which one would be chosen. The mystery was solved by the doctor on the day before their departure. He announced that they would go to St. Louis by the Pennsylvania Railroad, and from there to the frontier of Mexico by the Missouri Pacific and Southern Pacific lines. And now, said he, I will leave you to choose the route to the capital city, and you need not decide until we reach St. Louis. The doctor's suggestion compelled a study of the maps and a careful reading of the guidebooks and other literature pertaining to the journey. The result of their study may be summed up as follows from an entry which Frank made in his notebook. The first railway which was opened from the United States to the city of Mexico was the Mexican Central, which runs from El Paso, Texas, or rather from Paso del Norte, Mexico, which is opposite to El Paso, on the other side of the Rio Grande. Its length is 1,224 miles, and it was completed March 8, 1884, at the station of Fresnillo, 750 miles from Paso del Norte, the line having been built from both ends at the same time. Three years and six months were required for its construction, and the line is said to have cost more than 32 millions of dollars. Eight miles of track were laid during the last day of the work before the two ends of the line were brought together, and considering all the disadvantages of the enterprise, it reflects great credit upon those who managed it. For more than four years, the Mexican Central was the only all-rail route for travelers from the United States to the city of Mexico, and it had a practical monopoly of business. In 1888, two other lines were opened, or perhaps we might say another line and half of a third. These are the Mexican National Railway from Laredo, Texas to Mexico City, a distance of 825 miles, and the International Railway from Piedras Negras, Mexico, opposite Eagle Pass, Texas, to a point on the Mexican Central, about halfway between El Paso and Mexico. The International is the one which we call half a line, as it makes a new route into Mexico, and from all we can learn, a very good one, too. The Central is a standard gauge road, four feet, eight and one half inches wide, while the National is a narrow gauge line, three feet between the rails. The advantage of the National line is that it is much shorter than the Central, as I will proceed to show. From St. Louis to Mexico City, by way of Laredo, the distance is 1,823 miles, while by the central line it is 2,584 miles. There is thus a saving of 761 miles, or about 30 hours in time. But the central will take us through five or six interesting cities, while the national only goes near Monterey, San Luis Potosí, and Toluca. Fred and I have decided to ask Uncle to go by neither one route nor the other, but to travel by both of them, and the international line in addition, and this is the way we propose to do it. We'll go from St. Louis to Laredo because of the saving of time and distance, and then we'll go to Monterey, which is an interesting city, by the National Railway. 
After we've done Monterey, we'll go further on to Saltillo, and then we can cross over to Jaral, about 40 miles, and find ourselves on the main line of the International Railway. There, the train will pick us up and carry us to Torreon, on the Mexican Central Railway, and from there we can continue to the capital, seeing the best part of the central line, or rather of the country through which it runs. The northern part of the route through the central is said to be dreary and uninteresting, and so we shall be able to avoid it by the plan we have made. The scheme was duly unfolded to the doctor, who promptly gave his approval and commended the youths for the careful study they had made of the railway system of northern Mexico. Later on, said he, we will consider the subject of railways in other parts of Mexico, and I'm sure you will be able to make some interesting notes about it for your friends at home. Mexico was for a long time very backward in railway enterprises, but in the last few years she has gone ahead very rapidly. Ten years ago there were not five hundred miles of railway in the country. Now there are nearly, if not quite, five thousand miles, and in ten years from this time there will be double that number. The Mexico of today is very different from the Mexico of a quarter of a century ago. Our friends stopped a day in St. Louis, and another at San Antonio, Texas, partly for sightseeing purposes and partly for rest. At the former city, the great bridge over the Mississippi excited the wonder and admiration of the youths who heard with much interest the story of its construction and the difficulties which the engineers encountered in laying the foundations. At San Antonio they had their first glimpse of Mexican life, as the city is quite Mexican in character, and at one time was almost wholly so. Dr. Bronson told them that about one-third of the inhabitants are of Mexican origin, and they could easily believe it as they saw the Mexican features all about them on the streets and heard the Mexican language quite as often as any other. The object of greatest interest to them was the Alamo, the old fort which, in 1836, the Texans who were fighting for independence so heroically but unsuccessfully defended. They were disappointed to find that there is not much remaining of the fort, which originally consisted of an oblong enclosure about an acre in extent, with walls three feet thick and eight or ten feet high. There were 144 men in the Alamo, and they were besieged by 4,000 Mexican troops under General Santa Anna, said a gentleman who accompanied them to the spot. The Mexicans had artillery, and the Texans had none, and against such odds it was hopeless to resist. Santa Anna sent a summons for them to surrender and throw themselves upon Mexican mercy, but they refused to do so and defied him and his army. As he paused a moment, Fred asked why they refused to surrender when the odds were so much against them. They knew what Mexican mercy was, said the gentleman. It was illustrated not long afterwards at Goliad, where Colonel Fannin surrendered with 412 men as prisoners of war. They were promised to be released under the rules of war, and one Sunday morning, when they were singing Home Sweet Home, they were marched out and massacred, every man of them. The slaughter lasted from six till eight, and then the bodies of the slain were burned by orders of the general. It is proper to say that the Mexican officers were generally disgusted with the terrible business, but they were obliged to obey the orders of Santa Anna or be themselves shot down. His policy was one of extermination, and he could have said on his deathbed that he left no enemies behind him, as he had killed them all. Well, continued their informant, the siege of the Alamo began on the 23rd of February, 1836, and lasted for 13 days. Over 200 shells were thrown into the fort in the first 24 hours, but not a man was injured by them, while the Texan sharpshooters picked off a great number of the Mexicans. 
Santa Anna made several assaults, but was driven back each time, and it is believed that he lost fully 1,500 men in the siege. On the morning of the 6th of March, a final assault was made, and the fort was captured. Every man was killed in the fighting except six who surrendered, and among the six was the famous Colonel David Crockett. Santa Anna ordered all of them to be cut to pieces, and Crockett fell with a dozen sword wounds after his own weapons had been given up. Colonel Travis, who commanded the fort, was also killed, and so was Colonel Bowie, who was ill in bed at the time, and was shot where he lay. He was the inventor of the Bowie knife, which has been famous throughout the West and Southwest for a good many years. Only three persons were spared from death, a woman, a child, and a servant. How long was that before the Battle of San Jacinto? One of the youths asked. Less than seven weeks, was the reply, and never was there a more complete victory than at that battle. General Sam Houston retreated slowly and was followed by the Mexican army. He burned a bridge behind his enemies and suddenly attacking them on the afternoon of April 21st, he killed half their number and captured nearly all the rest. The war cry of the Texans was, Remember the Alamo! Remember Goliad! And maddened by the recollection of the cruelties of the Mexicans, they fought like tigers and carried everything before them. Santa Anna, disguised as a soldier, was captured the next day. Houston had hard work to save him from the fury of the Texans, but he was saved and lived to fight again ten years later. But the Battle of San Jacinto ended the war and made Texas independent of Mexico. A ride of a 150 miles to the southwest from San Antonio brought our friends to Laredo on the banks of the Rio Grande, the dividing line between the United States and Mexico. The ride was through a thinly settled country devoted principally to grazing, and there were few objects of interest along the route. The time was varied with looking from the windows of the car, with the perusal of books, and by conversation concerning the Texan War for Independence, to which the thoughts of the party had naturally turned through their visit to the Alamo at San Antonio. Texas was a province of Mexico, said the doctor, in the early part of the present century the Spaniards having established missions and stations there at the same time that the French established missions and military posts in Louisiana. The territorial boundaries between France and Spain were never very clearly defined. The two countries were in a constant quarrel about their rights, and when we purchased the Louisiana territory from France, we inherited the dispute about the boundaries. Adventurers from various parts of the United States poured into the country, and the population was more American than Mexican. There were many respectable men among the American settlers, but there was also a considerable proportion of what might be called a bad lot. I have read somewhere, said Frank, a couplet which is said to have been composed by a resident of the country fifty years ago, and to have given the state its name. When every other land rejects us, this is the land that freely takes us. And I, said Fred, have read somewhere that when a man ran away to cheat his creditors, or for any more serious reason, it was commonly said that he had gone to Texas. When the sheriffs looked for somebody whom they wished to arrest and were unable to find him, they endorsed the warrant with the initial letters G.T.T., -T, before returning it to the authorities who issued it. Sometimes an absconding debtor saved his friends the trouble of looking for him by leaving on his door a card bearing these interesting letters. Undoubtedly, continued the doctor, there was a rough population in Texas in those days, but the men composing it were not deficient in bravery, and they had the spirit of independence in the fullest degree. While the United States and Mexico were disputing about the boundaries, the Texans set up a claim for independence, and the war which was ended by the Battle of San Jacinto was like our Revolutionary War a hundred and more years ago. 
After Texas had secured her independence, she set up a government of her own. She had a president and all the other officials pertaining to a republic, and was recognized by England, France, and other European countries. This did not last long, as her finances fell into a deplorable condition, and the preponderance of Americans among the population naturally led to a movement for annexation to the United States. Annexation was followed by war with Mexico, and it grew out of the old dispute about the boundaries. Mexico claimed all land west of the Nueces River, while Texas claimed to own as far west as the Rio Grande. Every country believed it was right, and our war with Mexico resulted in the defeat of the Mexican armies, the occupation of their capital, and the establishment of the right of the United States to all territory east of the Rio Grande. Texas is therefore one of the lost provinces of Mexico, said Frank. Yes, was the reply. It is one of them, and a very large one, as it has an area of nearly 300,000 square miles, and is a country of great future possibilities. But Texas was by no means the greatest of the losses of Mexico by the war, as California, Nevada, Utah, Arizona, and New Mexico were taken by us as compensation for our trouble, and you know what they are today. About the time that the Treaty of Peace was signed and the cession of territory made, gold was discovered in California, and the wonderful wealth of the Pacific Coast and the Rocky Mountain region was rapidly developed. Look on the map in Mr. Bishop's book and see what Mexico was before and after the war. The boys made a careful inspection of the map, and as it will be interesting to their friends at home, we here reproduce it. The Mexicans were severely punished for their cruelty to the Texans, said Fred, and were probably sorry for their butcheries at Goliad and the Alamo when they sat down to think of the war and how it turned out. The responsibility for those butcheries rests rather upon General Santa Anna than on the officers and soldiers who executed his orders. He started out in a war of extermination, and there is abundant evidence that his officers loathed the work they had to perform. One of them, writing from Goliad at the time of the massacre of Colonel Fannin and his men, said, This day, Palm Sunday, has been to me a day of heartfelt sorrow. What an awful scene did the field present when the prisoners were executed and fell in heaps, and what spectator could view it without horror? It has been said that the feeble resistance that Santa Anna's men made at the Battle of San Jacinto was in consequence of the willingness of officers and soldiers to be captured so that the terrible war could come to an end. Texas is now a very prosperous state, continued the doctor. The value of its taxable property is nearly seven hundred millions of dollars, and some authorities say it is more, and has seven millions of cattle ten millions of sheep, and horses and mules in proportion. By the census of 1880, it had a population of more than one and a half millions, and it is probable that 1890 will give it more than two millions. Its area would make five states as large as New York, 33 as large as Massachusetts, and 212 of the size of Rhode Island that it has changed greatly from the days before the annexation and is favorable to peace and good order is shown by its liberal appropriation for schools, its laws relative to the sale of intoxicating drinks, the fines it imposes for carrying pistols and bowie knives, and its penalties for using them. There was further conversation about the Southwest and its peculiarities when the train reached the frontier and attention was turned to Mexico and the new land that they were about to visit. End of chapter 1 Chapter 2 of The Boy Travelers in Mexico This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Ryan Loner. The Boy Travelers in Mexico by Thomas Wallace Knox. Chapter 2. 
it was nine o'clock in the evening when the train reached laredo from san antonio and our friends found that they would have to pass the night in the town they had been recommended to patronize the commercial hotel their informant said he could not speak loudly in its praise it is the least bad of the hotels in the place said he and a great deal better than sleeping on the ground in the open air as you would have been obliged to do here only a few years ago in the language of the far west it beats nothing all out of sight there was a sign of civilization in the shape of an omnibus rather a rickety and weak springed affair it is true but still an omnibus and it carried them safely to the hotel whither their baggage followed in a wagon the crowd around the station where the train arrived was a mixture of american and mexican with a few indians by way of variety the population of the frontier is quite a puzzle to the ethnologist at times and the work of classification is by no means easy some of the patrons of the hotel were mexicans of the better sort and they mingled freely with the americans who had lived long enough in texas to feel at home the texas towns along the border contain a goodly number of residents who are engaged in defrauding the revenue of mexico by engaging in the business of smuggling goods into that country there is also a fair amount of smuggling from mexico into the united states and the customs officials on both sides are kept reasonably busy in seeing that the rights of their respective nations are defended the peculiarity of revenue laws all the world over is that every country considers it quite proper to violate those of any other but it is very indignant if its own regulations are not respected supper at the hotel was endurable by hungry travellers but would have failed to meet the desires of the epicure and the same may be said of breakfast on the following morning as the train for mexico started at eight o'clock there was not much time for sightseeing after breakfast though sufficient to discover that laredo was a comparatively new town whose existence was mainly due to the railways that lead to it there was a town there in the early days of the spanish colonization but it was completely destroyed in the frontier troubles and the site was deserted until texas became one of the united states the international and great northern railway runs to san antonio and beyond one division of the mexican national railway known as the texas mexican connects laredo with corpus christi on the gulf of mexico one hundred and sixty miles away and the next called the northern division unites it with the city of mexico other railways are projected and those who have corner or other lots in laredo predict a great future for the city the rio grande is not an imposing river at laredo and our young friends were disappointed when they saw it they had looked for a stream of magnitude as implied by the name and were not prepared for one that could be forded without much danger and was so diminutive as to remind them of those rivers in the western states where it is necessary to use a sprinkling pot at certain seasons of the year to let strangers know where the stream is the doctor told them that the rio grande was known as the rio bravo in the lower part of its course and frank suggested that it was because the river was very brave to come so far with such poor encouragement but the stream which now looks so insignificant dr bronson explained is subject to periodical floods owing to the melting of the snows in the mountains where it takes its rise they begin in april reach their greatest height in may and subside in june and while they last they fill the whole bed of the stream and overflow the banks wherever they are low some of its tributaries at such times are roaring floods while ordinarily they are only dry beds where not a drop of water can be seen for many miles but if you dig a few feet into the sandy bed of these streams you will find water emigrants travelling through this country carry an empty barrow from which both heads are removed and by sinking this barrel into the sand they obtain a plentiful supply of water a knowledge of this fact has saved many lives and ignorance of it has caused deaths by thirst when suffering might easily have been avoided the first bridge erected by the railway company at laredo was of wood it served its purpose until the first flood when it was torn from its foundations and carried away the present bridge is a substantial one of iron and promises to last a long time from laredo the train moved slowly across the river along a bridge whose height was intended to make it secure against the severest floods until it reached the station of nuevo laredo on the mexican side two or three miles from texan laredo here there was an examination of baggage by the mexican customs officials they were polite and our friends had learned from long experience at custom houses to be polite in return the result was that the examination of their belongings was very slight while that of some of the passengers who displayed ill manners was much more severe the doctor and the youth produced the keys of their trunks and opened them before being asked to do so and promptly announced the contents of the receptacles they had nothing dutiable and in a very few minutes the ordeal was ended frank made the following note about the mexican custom house 
Mexico is a land of high tariffs, and pretty nearly everything that can be imported is taxed. Machinery was formerly imported free, but it is now subject to duty, and so is almost everything except agricultural and scientific instruments and books. There is also a duty on packages apart from their contents, and there is a heavy duty on all kinds of carriages. Baggage for personal use is admitted free of duty unless there is a reason to suspect that the owner has an intention to sell. Two or three suits of clothing will pass without question, but ten or twelve would be liable to detention and duty. The laws require that the examination of baggage shall be conducted liberally and with prudence and moderation, and certainly we have no occasion to complain of discourtesy. In addition to clothing, not excessive in quantity, a traveler may have two watches with their chains, a cane, an umbrella, one or two pistols with equipments and cartridges, one hundred cigars, forty small packages of cigarettes, a rifle or fowling piece, one pound of smoking tobacco or snuff, and any musical instruments in actual use except pianos and organs. When a resident of the United States crosses the Rio Grande into Mexican territory with his own carriage, he must pay the duties on the vehicle or give a bond for their payment in case he does not return to the United States. As the relations of the United States and Mexico increase in intimacy, it is probable that there will be a reciprocity treaty. Negotiations to that end have been going on for some time, but are delayed by the usual hitches that arise in such matters. At the entrance of Mexican cities, there is an examination something like the actua of European cities, but so far as tourists are concerned, it is very slight. They merely declare that they have nothing dutiable and are allowed to pass on. There is an examination on leaving Mexico, as there is an export duty of 5% on bullion and a prohibition against taking antiquities from the country. As a matter of fact, a good many antiquities are carried away, but as the greater part of them are fictitious, the restriction is not rigidly enforced. We have heard several stories about how the Mexican custom house is defrauded by the bribery of officials, but have no means of knowing if they are true or false. Certainly, we did not offer any money to the men at the custom house, and none of them intimated that he desired to be bribed. If a quarter of the stories have any truth at all, there must be a great deal of dishonesty along the frontier, but it is not confined to the Mexicans. Pack trains loaded with dutiable goods start openly from the frontier towns of Texas, ford the river, and make their way into the interior of Mexico. The trade is so large that it could hardly be carried on without official connivance. The author of Mexico of Today says in regard to this subject, those well informed with regard to trade interests agree that a great deal of smuggling exists owing to the high tariff and the great frontier stretch that invites lawbreakers. It is said that millions more of American goods find their way into Mexico than show in the statistics prepared by either government. Another writer says the traveler is permitted to enter all his personal apparel free of duty, in fact everything that he really needs. A great many things he does not need may be taken in also, for the official's pay is meager and he loves to gaze on the portraits of American worthies as depicted on our national currency. It is well to caution the traveler that he must, if requested, state to the proper authorities his name and profession. In due time, the train rolled out of Nuevo Laredo, and our friends were contemplating the scenery of northern Mexico. For the first fifty or sixty miles, there was not much to contemplate, as the country consists of a plain covered with chaparral, and one mile of it is very much like any other. A little of it goes a great way, said Frank to Fred, and after a brief study of the cactus and mesquite landscape, the youths turned to their books or their observations upon the train and the passengers accompanying them. As stated elsewhere, the national railway is of three feet gauge, and therefore it was to be expected that the cars would be narrow and possibly inconvenient. But our friends found them roomy and comfortable. There was a parlor car with reclining chairs for which an extra price was charged, and sleeping cars all the way from Laredo to the city of Mexico, just as sleeping cars are run on other lines. The passengers included several tourists like themselves, a few railway agents, some mysterious characters who could not be placed, and six or eight men of business who cared nothing for scenery, politics, or anything else pertaining to Mexico, except the facilities for commerce and the duties upon imported goods. One of these individuals loudly denounced the protective duties in the Mexican tariff system and declared that the country would never amount to anything until it abolished its restrictions upon importations and opened its markets to the world. In the discussion that followed, the fact was revealed that he was a citizen of the United States and interested in manufactures. Concerning the tariff system of his own country, he favored protection, as it encouraged American industries and was the only system under which the people who worked with their hands could make a living. 
Frank wanted to ask him why he favored one system for Mexico and another for the United States, but he modestly refrained from so doing. Another passenger asked the question, but it remained unanswered, and to this day the youth has not been enlightened on the subject. Among the passengers were several Mexicans whose nationality was readily shown by their swarthy complexions and the peculiarities of their dress. They wore the sombrero, or wide-brimmed hat of the country, but it may here be remarked that of late years the American hat has come somewhat into fashion and is less unpopular than of yore. Some of them proved to be naturalized Mexicans rather than native-born. One in particular was a jolly Irishman who had been thirty years in Mexico, spoke its language fluently, and had been so browned by the sun that his complexion was fully up to the national standard. He joined Dr. Bronson and the youths in conversation, and cordially invited them to make a break in their journey and visit his hacienda. He had a Mexican wife, and was the owner of a large area of land on which he had so many cattle that he was unable to give their number within two or three hundred. He said he came from Ireland to the United States, drifted down to the frontier of Mexico just before the American Civil War, and in order to avoid being mixed up in the troubles, he crossed the boundary and sought shelter under a neutral flag. There he had remained and prospered to such an extent that he had no wish to return either to the United States or his native land. Fred made note of the dress of a haciendado, or ranch owner, who was seated near him and might fairly be taken as the type of dandy horseman of Mexico. The man wore a suit of dark blue or blue-black cloth, the suit consisting of two garments, a jacket, and trousers. The jacket was short and well-fitted, and it was ornamented with large buttons of silver. The trousers were close-fitting, and on the outer seams were rows of silver buttons smaller than those that decorated the jacket. The feet were encased in top boots with high heels, and each boot carried a large spur of solid silver. The spur is a cruel weapon, with long rowels upon wheels as large as a half dollar. The man's jacket was open in front, displaying a frilled or ruffled shirt, white as snow, and connected to the trousers at the waist by a faja, or sash, whose predominating color was red. The Mexicans are fond of gaudy colors, and the taste for them runs through all classes of the population. Though it was not worn in the railway train, we must not forget the serape, or Mexican blanket, which is carried over the shoulders or on the arm, or in the case of a mounted horseman, is thrown across the front of the saddle. The sombrero of this haciendado was of a light gray color. The head covering may be of almost any color under the sun, but the preference is nearly always for something bright. The crown may be rounded off like the large end of an egg, or form a truncated cone like the crown of the hat worn by the Puritans, and it is encircled by three or four turns of silver or gold cord. Gold or silver trimming around the brim completes the ornamentation. Altogether, there is considerable weight to the Mexican sombrero, but nobody seems to mind it. At the stations where the train halted from time to time, the travelers obtained glimpses of men and things peculiar to the country. Horsemen were in goodly proportion, as no Mexican who can afford a horse will be without one, and sometimes when he cannot afford it, he manages to possess the seed of his desires by the simple process of stealing it. Wagons and pack trains were not infrequent, and one of the picturesque spectacles in connection with them was the muleteers, or mule drivers, who were almost invariably barefooted, wore with little clothing, and carried the ropes and other apparatus needed for their professions in bags slung over their shoulders or hung at their sides. Some of the stations were frail buildings of wood, while others were of the adobe, or sun-dried brick, the favorite construction material of Mexico and the countries that once belonged to her. Fred was interested in the adobe, and learned on inquiry that its use is a matter of great antiquity. The Mexican Indians made sun-dried bricks long before Columbus discovered America, and it should be borne in mind that some of the pyramids of Egypt, which have stood for thousands of years, were of the same material. The bricks that the Egyptians compelled the Israelites to make without straw were dried in the sun, and therefore identical with the Mexican adobe. Fred asked his Irish-Mexican acquaintance how an adobe house was made, and the gentleman kindly explained. An adobe house, said he, costs very little, and it is warmer in winter and cooler in summer than either wood or brick. It will last as long as anybody can want it to. I know some adobe houses that are said to be a hundred years old, and many that have stood twenty or thirty years without any sign of decaying. Adobe bricks are made of one-third clay dust and two-thirds fine sand, and it takes four men to form a brick-making team. One mixes the mass with a little water so as to form it into a heavy mortar. Two men carry it in a hand barrow to the place where the bricks are to be spread out and dried, and the fourth man shapes the bricks in the mould. After drying somewhat while flat on the ground, which has been previously leveled and made smooth as a floor, the adobes are set up edgewise and stay so until the sun finishes them completely. They are laid in mortar made from mud, and when a wall is two feet high, the work stops for a week to allow the mortar to be firmly set before putting more pressure on it. When a week has passed, another height of two feet may be laid, and so the work goes on until the building is finished. Then it must wait a week before the roof is put up. 
You see, it takes time for building an adobe house, but time was of no consequence in the land of Manayana. What is the meaning of Manayana? one of the youth asked. It means tomorrow, was the reply, and as you go through Mexico, you will hear the word in constant use. Ask a Mexican when he will do anything, pay a bill, return the horse he borrowed, build a sheep pen or a corral for his cattle, get married, buy a new saddle, in fact, do anything that can be done. His answer is manana. Mexico is the land of manana, and the habit of procrastination is exasperating to a man of any other nationality. You'll get used to it in time, but it takes a long while to do so. It wouldn't be so bad if the man literally meant what he said, and when tomorrow comes would do as he promised. The word is used like the coming sir of the English waiter, or they tote to sway to the French one, and means next week or next year, or more properly an indefinite time in the future. There's another word, or rather two words, where the meaning is identical with manana and the use the same. You'll hear them often in Mexico, but more frequently in Central America and farther south. What are they? Pauco tiempo, was the reply. The literal meaning is in a little while, but the practical usage is the same as that of manana. Then there's another lesson in language you may have gratis. Ask a man any question for which he does not know the answer, and his response will be, Kian sabe? Who knows? It is less exasperating than the other words I told you of, as it is simply a form of saying, I don't know. The youths made proper acknowledgement for the instruction they had received and took good care to remember it. The dreary plain ceased at length, and the mountains began to be visible. About seventy-five miles from Laredo, Frank's attention was called to a mesa, or high tableland, a little beyond the station of Lampasas. It is a mountain which spreads out flat like a table, and the area on the top is said to be not far from 80,000 acres. Its sides are 1,400 feet high, and so nearly perpendicular that it is impossible to ascend them except in a few places. There is a path three miles long leading to the summit. It is impassable for wheeled vehicles and can only be traversed by sure-footed quadrupeds or men. It is called the Mesa de los Catuyanos, Carthusians, a tribe of Indians who probably derived their name from a Benedictine monastery which was once established there. The mesa is well watered and its surface is divided between forest and grassland in such proportion as to make it an excellent pasture. No fences are needed beyond a single gate at the top of the path to keep the cow from straying into the country below, unless we include the division fences for the separation of herds. From Lampasas to Monterey, the country improved greatly, and for a hundred miles or so, the train wound through a valley where the scenery was almost constantly picturesque, and the land showed signs of agriculture and stock raising. Near one of the stations, the boys caught sight of a threshing floor where horses were driven around in a circle to tread out the grain with their hoofs. This is the primitive mode of threshing to which reference is made in the Bible. It is still in use in various parts of southern Europe and also in Asia and northern Africa. The American invasion of Mexico will doubtless introduce the threshing machine. In fact, the machine has already been introduced, and many of the raisers of wheat on a large scale have adopted it. In the cultivated districts, many fruit trees were seen, and Fred made note of the fact that the orchards produced figs, pomegranates, lemons, oranges, aguacates, and chiramoyas, in addition to most of the fruits of the temperate zones. He learned that the state of Nuevo Leon, which they were then traversing, produced tobacco, sugar, Indian corn, wheat, Mexican hemp, and similar things, and contained a million dollars worth of cattle and horses. Its elevation is from 1,000 to 2,300 feet above the level of the sea, and its climate ranks as temperate or semi-tropical. Lempasas is said to be a great resort for smugglers who carry on a regular business with comparatively little disturbance by the authorities. Probably the railway has interfered with them, and they can hardly be expected to look upon it with a kindly eye. About 30 miles beyond Lampasas is Bustamente, a town founded 200 years ago by the Spaniards as a frontier post against the Indians of the north, and now the seat of a manufacturing interest that promises to increase. The cloth of Bustamente has a high reputation throughout Mexico, and the town contains a tribe of Indians descended from the Tlaxcalans, who helped Cortes to conquer the Aztecs and make Guatemozin a prisoner. As the train approached Monterey, about four o'clock in the afternoon, a mountain shaped like a saddle was pointed out on the left of the line. What do you suppose is the name of that mountain, says the gentleman who called attention to it, while the eyes of Frank and Fred were turned in its direction. I don't know, I'm sure, said Fred. Perhaps they named it for its shape and call it Saddle Mountain. That's exactly what it is, was the reply. It is called La Silla, or The Saddle, and is a prominent landmark around Monterey. Then the gentleman pointed to a mountain on the right, which he said was called Cerro de la Mitra, Mountain of the Mitre, from its resemblance to the mitre worn by a bishop. Then between them and farther away, he pointed out the chain of the Sierras, and the youths realized that they were in a region of mountains. The train wound through a cleft in the hills and came to a halt at the station of Monterey, a mile and a half from the city. 
It is proper to remark that most of the towns and cities of Mexico require the railways to stop outside the walls or limits, but for what a special reason, unless to give occupation to the inhabitants in transporting passengers, baggage, and freight, our young friends were unable to ascertain. The custom is Spanish as well as Mexican, as the traveler in Spain will vividly remember. There is a good supply of cabs and omnibuses at the station, and there is a horse railway connecting the city and the railway station, so that travelers have a choice of conveyances. The horse railway was built by an American who obtained a concession from the government and thought he was making a wonderfully profitable investment. But the local authorities hampered him with many restrictions. They compelled him to carry a policeman in every car, and the policemen generally took the side of those who did not pay their fare. It was fashionable to ride in the cars, but not fashionable to pay, or at any rate, it was optional to pay or not. A good many foreigners who have settled in Mexico complain that their enterprises are seriously interfered with by the authorities, national, state, and local. Every town and village, according to the old Spanish law and custom, has the right to levy tolls or taxes on everything that passes through it, and in all business conducted within its limits. Then the state or district can levy a tax, and the national government comes in for a levy of its own in addition. The result is that every enterprise is liable to be taxed to death, and many a man who has carried money to Mexico to engage in what promised to be a profitable business has left it behind him in the hands of the various authorities. Taxes, forced loans, and various expenses that can never be foreseen swallow up all the profits and altogether too often the original investment. Very few silver mines in Mexico pay dividends to their stockholders, and the few that are worth owning have no stock for sale. The American saying that it takes a gold mine to work a silver mine is as true of Mexico as of any other country. Our friends went to the Hotel Hidalgo and found it endurable. It had been recommended by one of their fellow passengers on the train who showed his good faith in his recommendation by accompanying them thither. Immediately after securing rooms and completing arrangements for their stay, the party started for a drive around the city, which boasts an age of more than 300 years. Having been founded in 1560, though it did not receive its present name until 1596. Monterey means King Mountain or Mountain of the King, and the name of the city was given in honor of Don Gaspar de Zuniga, Conde de Monterey, who was Viceroy of Mexico in 1596. The name given to the settlement in 1560 was Santa Lucia, a little stream which crosses the city from west to east preserves the original appellation, but comparatively few of the inhabitants are aware of its origin. End of chapter 2, read by Ryan Lohner. Chapter 3 of The Boy Travelers in Mexico This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Mario Pineda The Boy Travelers in Mexico by Thomas Wallace Knox Chapter 3 the first opportunity to see a Mexican city was afforded to our friends at Monterrey, and they fully enjoyed it. Every walk along the streets and every drive in the city and its vicinity was full of interest, and there was little that escaped their observation. Being the most northern city of Mexico, Monterrey has been much invaded by Americans during the last decade, and many citizens of the United States are established there in various lines of business. The city has been extensively advertised as a health resort, and considerable numbers of invalids have gone there. A fair proportion of them have breathed their last in Monterrey or its neighborhood, but the same may be said of many other health resorts in different parts of the world. For the present, invalids would do well to think twice before going to Monterrey or any other part of Mexico in the hope of recovering their health, as the accommodations for them are hardly such as they are required. A Mexican hotel may do well enough for a vigorous man, but it is ill-suited to one who should be shielded from draughts, need to sit in front of a comfortable fire, and has a dread of damp walls and similar adversities. The cooking is suited to robust stomachs rather than to delicate ones, and the attendance leaves much to be desired. Monterrey is built in a plain surrounded by mountains, and the ground on which it stands is somewhat broken or undulating in places. It has a population of about 40,000, and is said to be increasing every year, in consequence of the impulse which the opening of the railway has given it. Our friends visited the Ojo de Agua, a great spring that opens in the center of the city and furnishes a copious supply of water. Then they went to the Plaza Mayor, a pretty garden with an interesting fountain in its center, then to the Plaza de Zaragoza, 
and then to the cathedral, which looks upon it and has the Church of San Francisco as a near neighbor. The church is the oldest religious edifice in the city. It is said to have been founded in 1560, and though there is some obscurity about the exact date, it is pretty certain to owe its beginning to the 16th century. But of the old structure only the foundations remain, the present building having been erected around 1730, and it has undergone alterations of various periods since that time. The cathedral is quite modern. It was dedicated in 1833, and at the time of its dedication had been about 30 years in process of erection. The walls are very thick, and its constructors must have possessed the gift of foresight and had in mind its possible uses for war purposes, as it was converted into a powder magazine at the time of General Taylor's attack in 1846. Shot and shell fell thickly around it, but the massive walls preserved it from destruction or serious injury, and saved its contents from being blown up. The original site selected for the cathedral was at the north of the city, and work was begun upon it, but the place was abandoned for the present one. A fort was erected on the abandoned site, and it was one of the chief obstacles to the capture of the city by the Americans. Frank and Fred were especially interested in the war history of Monterey, and as soon as the inspection of the Plaza Mayor and the edifices around it had been completed, they asked to be taken to the scene of the fighting between the American and Mexican armies. Their guide took them first to the bridge of the Purisima in the northeastern quarter of the city, where there was a sharp battle in which the Mexicans successfully resisted the Americans, and then to the old citadel, the fort already mentioned. It is now in a ruinous condition, and it is generally spoken of as the Black Fort. On the way to the citadel, Dr. Bronson tested the knowledge of the Jews concerning the events which made Monterey's name so well known in the United States. In reply to his questions, Frank and Fred alternated with each other in telling the following, Frank being the first to speak. General Taylor's army landed at Corpus Christi in Texas and marched from there to Matamoros on the Rio Grande early in 1846. Before crossing the Rio Grande, they fought two battles, that of Palo Alto on the 8th of May and the Battle of Resaca de la Palma on the following day. General Taylor defeated the Mexicans in both battles, though his army was much smaller than theirs, the Mexicans having about 6,000 men and the Americans 3,000. After capturing Matamoros, he advanced into northern Mexico. On the Rio Grande, he had been joined by a reinforcement of troops, and when he came in front of Monterey, he had between six and 7,000 men. Yes, said Fred, the historians say he had 6,645 officers and men altogether, and that the Mexican army at Monterrey under General Ampudia contained fully 10,000 men. You have evidently been studying the history of the Mexican War very carefully, the doctor remarked, as the Jews paused. We've tried to, certainly, responded Fred, and we believe we ought to know what the relations have been between this country and ours in order to understand intelligently what we see. If we study today the peaceful invasion of Mexico, we ought to know about the war like one. Dr. Bronson nodded assent to this view, and the story of the war was resumed. General Taylor came in sight of Monterey on September the 20th, said Frank, and immediately rode forward till he was within range of one of the forts. A cannon was fired upon the group of officers that surrounded the general, and immediately the army was ordered to advance and form a camp opposite the city, but far enough away from the forts to be out of range of the cannon. The battle began the next morning, the 21st, the city being attacked on the west by a division commanded by General Worth, whose monument stands in front of Madison Square in New York, and on the west by the rest of the army under General Taylor. The Americans had no artillery heavier than six-pounders, while the Mexicans had their forts filled with large cannon, and they had a strong force of cavalry, while the Americans had a very small one. The forts were attacked first, and one after the other they were taken, till the only remaining one outside the city was the Bishop's Palace, as it was called, though it was really a fort, as we shall see when we get to it. Partly by means of a cannon that was dragged up a hill, which commanded the Bishop's Palace, and partly by an attack of the infantry, the place was captured, and our flag was over all the heights that overlooked the city. It had taken two days to accomplish this, 
and a great many of our soldiers had fallen, but the army had no idea of giving up the attack, and when they had possession of the heights, they felt as sure of the victory as though it was already won. On the morning of the 23rd of September, the third day of the battle, a fire was opened on the city from the bishop's palace on the west and from two forts on the east, and at the same time the troops on each side of the city began to force their way inside towards the Grand Plaza in the center. The Mexicans fought desperately and swept the streets with such fire of musketry that our men had to take shelter in the houses and cut their way from house to house towards the Grand Plaza. It was a slow work, and when night came, the troops had still two blocks to cut through before getting to the plaza. They were getting ready for work early the next morning when a flag of truce came from General Ampudia and the city was surrendered. What was the loss of the Americans in the battle? queried Dr. Bronson as Frank paused. They lost 158 killed and 368 wounded, answered Fred, and the Mexican loss was said to be fully 1,000. And to what was the disparity of the losses attributed? It was thought, said Fred, at least so I read in the account published at that time, that the western and southwestern men who fought under General Taylor were better marksmen than the Mexicans. The Texas riflemen in particular were famous for their skill in shooting, and their weapons were better than those of their enemies. You've made a very good short history of the capture of Monterrey, said the doctor, and must write it down for the benefit of your friends at home. The youths followed this bit of practical advice, and we are permitted to publish their story. By the time the talk about the war was ended, the party had reached the citadel, which they visited with interest, and then proceeded to the bishop's palace, now occupied as a military barrack and in a bad state of repair. While they stood looking down upon the city and the grassy and bushy slope of the hill, Frank recited the following piece of verse, which was written by Charles Fenno Hoffman shortly after the stirring events commemorated in the lines. We were not many, we who stood, before the iron slid that day, yet many a gallant spirit would give half his years if he but could have been with us at Monterey. Now here, now there, the shot it hailed, in deadly drifts of fire spray, yet not a single soldier quailed, when wounded comrades rammed and wailed, their dying shouts at Monterey. And on, still on, our columns kept, through walls of flame its withering way, where fell the dead the living stepped, still charging on the guns that swept, the slippery streets of Monterey. The foe himself recalled the ghast, when striking where his strongest lay, we swooped his flank in batteries past, and braving full their murderous blast, the storm hummed the towers of Monterey. Our banners and those turrets wave, and there our even buggles play, where orange bows above their grave keep green the memory of the brave we fought and fell at Monterey. We were not many, we who pressed, besides the brave who fell that day, but who of us hath not confessed, he'd rather share their warrior rest, that not have been a Monterey. There is one thing we must mention in our account of the battle, said Fred, as they were returning from the bishop's palace to the city. What is that? Frank asked. Why, we must say that there was a young officer here named U.S. Grant. He was a second lieutenant of the 4th Infantry, and was one of those who charged up the side of the hill to the bishop's palace. He afterwards became General Grant, whom all the world knows of, and whose name will be remembered in America for all time. I didn't think of that when I was talking about the battle, Frank answered, but I remember it all now, and I have read in one of the books of Mexico that he was offered promotion for his conduct in the battle, but declined it because another one was promoted at the same time. In declining the offer, he said, If lieutenant deserves promotion, I do not. And there is another thing that needs explanation, continued the youth, and that is the uniform of the officers and soldiers of our army in the pictures of the battles in Mexico. It is quite unlike the uniform worn in the Civil War 15 years later, and now in use. I will explain that, said the doctor, and he did so in these words. After peace had been declared and our army returned from Mexico, the War Department realized 
that there were certain features of the uniform and equipment of the men that might be changed to advantage. No action was taken in the matter until Jefferson Davis was Secretary of War, between 1853 and 1857, and I will here remark that Jefferson Davis commanded a regiment of Mississippi volunteers during the Mexican War and fought in this very battle of Monterey we have just been talking about. Well, Mr. Davis sent a circular letter to the officers of the army stating that changes were contemplated and asking for suggestions from them, and the inducement was held out that those who suggested changes which were adopted would be liberally compensated. One of the circulars was received by Lieutenant George H. Derby, who afterwards obtained considerable literary reputation as John Phoenix. Derby was a born humorist and generally saw the ludicrous side of a subject before anything else. In a short time after receiving the circular, he sent a variety of suggestions to the department, which were very funny, to say the least. He designed a hat which, in addition to covering the head, could be used as a camp kettle, a water bucket, and a feedback for a horse, and with the design for the article, which was to be made of sheet iron, there was a picture representing it applied to each of his proposed uses. Instead of the shoulder cross belts, he proposed that the soldier should have a leather belt around his waist, and to this belt should be attached a stout hook with a shank six inches long at the point of the hook standing outward from the man's back. On this hook the soldier could hang his knapsack or equipments when on the march. He could be harnessed by means of it so as to drag a wagon or a cannon, and in an assault on a fortress he could be made to drag a scaling ladder up the walls by means of this hook. Derby also proposed that the officers should be provided with poles like rake handles, 10 or 12 feet long, with rings at one end, and if a soldier should try to run away in battle, he could be dragged back to duty by means of the hook. Derby was as skillful with the pencil, and he sent a sketch of a battlefield in which the various uses of the hook were depicted. To say that Jefferson Davis was angry when he read the letter is to put the case mightily. He turned red and blue with rage and took the document to a cabinet meeting that was being held on the afternoon of the day he received Derby's communication. The members of the cabinet laughed over the suggestions and pictures, and when Davis declared he would have Derby cashiered for disrespect to the Secretary of War, they advised him to say nothing. If the story gets out, said one of them, you'll be the laughing stock of the country from one end to the other and will never hear the end of it. And besides, there is some originality about the man, and he might yet send something that will be really useful. Mr. Davis cooled down, and the story didn't come out until years afterwards. The result of the recommendations of various officers of the army was that the old bellows top cap disappeared, and so did other features of the soldiers' uniform and equipment. That is why the picture of the Battle of Monterey is so unlike that of any of the battles of the Civil War, so far as the uniforms of officers and men are concerned. The Jules had a hearty laugh over the story of Lieutenant Derby's suggestions. Frank thought they were too good to be lost, and he decided to write them down at the first opportunity. On their return to the city, the party visited the Alameda, which forms a very pretty promenade, and is well shaded with trees, though Frank thought it appeared in rather a neglected condition. Then they drove to the hot springs at Topo Chico, about three miles out from the city, in a northerly direction, and indulged in the luxury of a hot bath in natural water. The manager of the establishment said that the baths had a temperature of 106 degrees Fahrenheit, and possessed a high reputation for curing nervous, rheumatic, and other diseases. The arrangements for bathing were formerly very poor, but a new bathhouse was erected in 1887, and resulted in a great increase of patronage. Of course, a visit was paid to the marketplace and the novelties of the spot received due attention. The most interesting features were the fruit and flower markets. Dr. Bronson told the Jews that the Indians of Mexico had a passionate fondness for flowers long before the arrival of their Spanish conquerors, and it continues to the present time. There was a fine display of flowers, and the prices were so low that Frank and Fred regretted that they did not know some fair ones to whom they could send baskets and bouquets. Determined to do something by way of patronizing the flower sellers, they bought a quantity of flowers and sent them to a hospital which their guide pointed out. 
They may serve to cheer some poor invalid, said Frank, and the market is so attractive that I want to encourage the trade. The semi-tropical character of Monterey was shown by the fruits, which seemed to comprise the principal products of two zones, the tropical and the temperate. There were all the fruits named in the last chapter as growing in the region near Lampasas, together with three or four others. Monterey is situated 1,800 feet above the level of the sea, so that it is cooler than other places in the same latitude, but at a lower elevation. Some of the fruits sold in the market of the city were not grown in the immediate neighborhood, but in the lower regions to the eastward. Fred called Frank's attention to the bird sellers with their wares in large wooden cages, evidently of home construction. The canary seems to have spread pretty well over the world. His singing powers have made him welcome everywhere he goes, and our young friends were not at all surprised to find him in the market of Monterey. Several other varieties of singing birds were displayed, and the prices which were asked for them seemed very low. But the doctor whispered to the youths that if they bought anything in the market, they should not offer more than a quarter of what was demanded, and gradually advanced their figures to a half or possibly three-fourths. In a country where time is of no value, everybody who has anything to sell expects to haggle about the price. Some of the pottery in the market was so good that the boys consulted Dr. Bronson as to the advisability of sending home a few specimens of it. The doctor checked their enthusiasm by reminding them that they were just then at the beginning of their journey and it would be prudent to delay purchases until reaching the capital. A few jars and pots were selected and bargained for, more by way of practice in the language and customs than for any other purpose, and they were left with an American merchant who undertook to ship them to New York. They were all from Indian workmanship, the best having come, so the dealer said, from Guadalajara. Mexican pottery deserves a higher rank among ceramics than it has hitherto enjoyed, and some of the handiwork of the descendants of the Aztecs would be worthy of admiration in any collection. There were scores and scores of patient mules standing with drooping ears and waiting for their burdens to be removed. They were laden with everything that an inhabitant of Monterey could want to buy. Milk, vegetables, fruits, fuel, hides, sugar, beans, wheat, ironwork. In fact, anything and everything that has a place in the market. Donkeys are the beasts of burden of Monterey, and almost in the same category belong to cargadores or porters, who are licensed and numbered exactly like caps or drays in an American city. These men are identical with the Turkish Hamals. They carry heavy burdens with apparent ease, and it is no uncommon sight to see one of them slowly creeping along with a piano, an iron safe, or a barrel of wine on his back, or a lighter burden on his head in the same way that the Negro carries it. A gentleman who was stopping at the hotel said he had known a cargador to transport a safe weighing 600 pounds without any apparent suffering a distance of half a mile without stopping to rest. But the donkeys and cargadores do not have a monopoly of the local carrying trade, as there are great numbers of carts drawn by oxen that have come in from the country with loads of produce seeking a market. These carts are of rude construction, and their axles are rarely, if ever, greased. They creak and groan in a manner that falls unpleasantly on the ear, and often suggests that the vehicles are animated beings suffering beneath their burdens and endeavoring to make their grief known. And this reminds us of something which Fred remarked to Frank when the latter was wondering how the Mexicans could endure such a continued complaint of the axles of their carts. I've been thinking of the same thing, was the reply, especially as the Mexicans are previously termed greasers by the people of Texas and the Southwest generally. It is a sort of lucus and un lucendo, that appellation of greaser, at least so far as their cart axles are concerned. After seeing the market, they strolled along some of the narrow streets, which appeared gloomy enough, with their long stretches of masonry, broken only here and there, with a greater window or a balcony, which seemed to be part of a prison, so heavily was it barred with iron. Some of the larger and finer buildings have handsome windows, whose design was evidently brought from all Spain, and in turn obtained from the Moors. Our friends were invited to a house which had formerly belonged to one of the wealthy Spanish residents, but it is now the property of an American merchant. Fred thus describes it. 
Like all the better class of houses in Monterrey, this one is built in the form of a hollow square. This style of architecture was brought from Spain by the conquerors of the country, and it reminded us of houses in Damascus and other cities of the Oriental world. The square encloses a patio, or courtyard, and the rooms of the lower story open on the patio. There is a colonnade surrounding the yard, and it is freely ornamented with tropical plants and flowers, so that you seem at first glance to have entered a conservatory. Vines climb around most of the columns of the colonnade, and in the center is a well in which hangs not the old oaken bucket made famous and sung, but an equally substantial bucket of leather. The water drawn from the well is cool and sweet, and from the length of the rope it is evident that the excavation goes down to a great depth. Monterey is abundantly supplied with water, and in this respect as well as in the appearance of some of the interiors of the houses, it is entitled to be called the Damascus of Mexico. There is one house in Monterey, the residence of Don Patricio Milmo, which has a double arch courtyard and gallery, and is most liberally supplied with plants and flowers, among which a botanist would enjoy himself for many hours, and an ordinary mortal with no scientific knowledge need not be far behind them. There are some very pretty marbles in the neighborhood of Monterey, and they have been liberally used in the ornamentation of these and other houses. Don Patricio is a wealthy banker and the owner of an immense area of land in Nuevo León, including much of the building ground in and around Monterey. End of chapter 3「Chapter 4 of The Boy Travelers in Mexico」This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Mario Pineda The Boy Travelers in Mexico by Thomas Wallace Knox Chapter 4 On resuming their journey through Mexico, Dr. Bronson and his young companions proceeded by the railway southward to Saltillo, 67 miles from Monterrey. As they passed Santa Catarina, 8 or 10 miles beyond Monterrey, one of their fellow passengers told them that there were some interesting caves not very far from the station and also near Garcia, 13 miles farther on. A remarkable hole in the mountain near Santa Catarina was pointed out by the same gentleman but in spite of his voluble account of the attractive features of a journey there, they did not consent to stop for the excursion. They also decided to allow the Capes of Garcia to take care of themselves, much to the disappointment of their informant. The beauty of the scenery along the railway, almost from the very moment of leaving Monterey, kept their eyes busy on both sides of the train. The railway for some distance follows the San Juan Valley, which diminishes in width as it ascends. The labored puffing of the locomotive told that the grade was a steep one and it was evident that the engine was exerting all its powers. On most trains, two locomotives are required and an extra one is always added unless the number of carriages is small and their cargoes are light. The scenery of the Sierra Madre is remarkably fine and surpassed by that of very few railway routes in the world. Frank compared it to that of the Brenner of Semarin passes on the Alps and Fred said he was reminded of the Blue Mountains in Australia and the route traversed by the railway between Colombo and Candy in Ceylon. But they agreed that it differed in some aspects from all these routes and had a beauty and grandeur of its own, just as did each of the places they had mentioned. On each side of the valley, the mountains rose very steeply and in many places they were nearly, if not quite, perpendicular. The rocks were of various shades, in which red had a prominent place, and on the steepest part of the slopes, there was no place where vegetation could cling. The best of the scenery was in the neighborhood of Garcia. Beyond that point it became less grand, and the mountains were farther away in the widening valley, and the steep cliffs were less numerous. But the ascent was steady, and brought the train to the plateau and to a much higher elevation than that of Monterey. Monterrey, as before stated, is 1,800 feet above sea level. Saltillo is at an elevation of 5,200 feet, and consequently the railway ascends 3,400 feet in passing from the former to the latter city. The old route of the diligence before the railway was built 
afforded an exciting ride from San Gregorio to Rinconada, as the descent was very rapid and the coach went down the incline with great rapidity. At one turn in the road there was a point where a misstep would have sent the whole conveyance down a precipitous slope of a thousand feet into the valley below. A thoughtful American who traveled that route years ago regarded the possibilities of such a slide and estimated that the diligence, passengers and all would be worth not more than 19 cents a bushel after making the descent into the yawning gulf. Frank and Fred wish they could gather some of the bright cactus flowers which abounded along the route. There are many varieties of cactus in Mexico. In fact, the country might be said to be the land of the cacti. Botanists have described more than 60 species. They vary in height and size from the little plant, hardly larger than a spray of clover, up to the gigantic growths that rise more than 30 feet above the ground. The flowers run from pure white to a deep scarlet and purple, and some of the flowers are of great beauty. A peculiarity of the cactus is that it thrives best in poor soils, and on a great part of the ground where it grows, few other vegetable products could maintain an existence. The largest of the cactus family is scientifically known as candelabrum, but the Mexicans call it the organo or organ. It grows in straight hexagonal columns, and when many of these columns are clustered together, it bears quite a resemblance to a church organ with its pipes. One variety of cactus nourishes the cochineal insect, another is used for hedges, and owing to the sharp spines for which the plant is noted, it forms an impervious barrier to man or quadruped. The cactus generally has inside its flower a mass of edible substance and in some localities the cactus fruit is collected and sold in the markets. The cactus plant is not wholly inedible, as the donkeys of Mexico feed on some of them and the goat would also make a meal of the leaves and stalks. But this is not to be wondered at when it is borne in mind that the goat is popularly credited with dining upon tomato cans, scraps of tin, old boots, newspapers, umbrellas, and other articles not ordinarily included among esculents. Of late years, the cactus has been found useful for paper making, and thousands of tons of it are annually converted into paper fiber. A little past eight o'clock in the evening, the train rolled into Saltillo, a city containing from 15 to 20,000 inhabitants, the capital of the state of Coahuila, and for some years, the terminus of the National Railway. There are several cotton factories at Saltillo or in its immediate vicinity, and the place boasts of its serapes. Evidently, the boast is justified, as the serapes of Saltillo have a reputation all through northern Mexico. Our friends improved the opportunity to provide themselves with these needed articles of Mexican travel, and through the rest of their journey they carried their souvenirs of Saltillo and were well satisfied with them. They had been advised to go to the Hotel Tomasici, but with the condition that they must not expect anything remarkable in the way of a hotel. The doctor secured a carriage which was so rickety that it threatened dissolution before reaching the Plaza Mayor, where the hotel is situated, but by good fortune it held together and landed them safely. The proprietor of the hotel told them that there was only one good carriage in the city, and if they wanted it for the next day, it would be well to order it at once. It belonged to Señor Sada, the owner of the diligence, that would take them to Haral, where it connected with the trains on the International Railway. The advice was taken, and the one good carriage of Saltillo was ordered for the next day's driving in and around the city. Six reals, or 75 cents an hour, was the price of the vehicle, with a gratification to the driver. By this time, Frank and Fred were able to make all their financial calculations in the currency of the country. Here is the list of values which they had noted down and committed to memory. The peso or dollar is divided into eight reals or reales of the value of twelve and a half cents each. A medio real is six and a quarter cents, a cuartillo is three cents, and a tlaco is one and a half cents. Two reals make a peseta twenty five cents, and for reals a tostón fifty cents. Values are reckoned in centavos, 100 centavos make 1 peso, reals or pesos until large sums are reached when they are counted in gold. Of gold coins there are the escudito de oro, 1 peso, escudo de oro, 2 pesos, pistola, 
4 pesos, media onza de oro, 8 pesos, and onza de oro, gold ounce, 16 pesos. American currency can be used without difficulty in the large cities, but not elsewhere. Notes of the Banco Nacional and the Bank of London, Mexico, and South America can be carried in place of silver, which is inconveniently heavy, but our friends were advised not to rely upon banknotes of any kind away from the lines of railway. Dr. Bronson told the Jews that a metric system of coinage was established some years ago, but the common people were prejudiced against it, and it had made comparatively little progress. Half and quarter dollars are never spoken of as 50 and 25 centavos, but as cuatro reals or dos reals. We will return to Saltillo, where we left our friends while we made an excursion among Mexican currency values. Their supper was a composite of Mexican and Italian cookery, Tomasici being an Italian and his cook a native of Mexico. The chief had instructed the subordinate in the ways of the kitchens of Rome and Naples, but not sufficiently to drive out the ideas of the land of the Aztecs. Stimulated by curiosity and also by a good appetite, the doctor and his nephews made an excellent meal, or at least it was good enough to make them wish to taste the dinner entirely Mexican in character. We will see later on how they succeeded in their experiment. The next morning they started in good season to inspect the city and its surroundings. They found the Alameda much prettier than that of Monterrey, and some travelers have pronounced it the most attractive one to be found in Mexico. The inhabitants are deservedly proud of it. It is a popular resort at all hours, and especially in the evening, where everybody goes out from a promenade. The Plaza Mayor is also an attractive spot, and the Jews wished to make a sketch of it from the side opposite the cathedral, but decided not to take the time to do so, as a photograph would answer their purpose. The general features of Saltillo are much like those of Monterrey, and consequently a detailed description of them is unnecessary. Before starting on the round of sightseeing, Dr. Bronson made inquiries concerning a visit to the battlefield of Buena Vista, which is some 10 miles south of Saltillo. The inquiries resulted in an arrangement to see the spot made famous in the history of the Mexican War, where 5,000 Americans put 20,000 Mexicans to flight. The battlefield lies two or three miles south of the Hacienda of Buena Vista, and the road from Saltillo rises nearly a thousand feet before reaching that place. Consequently, a journey thither must be done at a slow pace, and it was decided to take two days, or rather, a night and part of two days, for the excursion. Early in the afternoon, the party started from Saltillo for the Hacienda of Buena Vista, which they reached before nightfall. The Jutes were happy at the prospect of passing a night in the Hacienda, and obtaining a glimpse of rural Mexican life. The building where they were received was in the form of a hall of a square, like the houses of Monterrey already described. The entrance was sufficiently broad to permit an admission of vehicles, and the carriage was driven inside before the travelers alighted. According to Mexican custom, a mozo, or servant, had been sent in advance to give notice of the advent of the strangers and have the house in readiness. The visitors were shown to rooms on the lower floor, the doctor was assigned to a room by himself, while the boys were lodged together in a large room, very meagerly furnished. The beds were straw-filled mattresses, laid upon strips of rawhide stretched tightly across a frame, and the boys pronounced it an excellent substitute for some of the patent spring mattresses which are sold in American cities. The linen was scrupulously clean, which is not always the case in Mexico, but the supply of blankets were so light that it was evident the travelers were expected to make use of their sarapes to keep off the chill of the night air. They did not stay long inside the room, as they were anxious to see the surroundings of the place. So they wandered about, their first visit being to the stable, which they found commodious enough for the most fastidious horse in the world. I have heard, said Fred, that the people of this country are more particular about their horses than about themselves. A Mexican will take good care of his horse, but leave his wife and children to go hungry and half clothed. To judge by the difference between the rooms of the hacienda and the stable, responded Frank, this statement seems to be well founded. The stable is certainly better, ventilated, and the horses have no reason to complain of the quarters. A Mexican depends so much on his horse that he ought from very selfishness to be very careful of him. From the stable they wander to the kitchen, where three or four native women were at work preparing the meal which the strangers were to eat. 
The first thing to attract Frank's attention was a woman kneeling on the floor of a flat stone raised at one end on which she was rolling some dough into very thin sheets. That must be a tortilla maker, said Frank. We have had tortillas several times since we came into the country, but this is the first good chance I've had to see them made. From his observation at the kitchen and from subsequent information, the youth made the following note. Tortillas, or cakes, are made from cornmeal, which is ground by hand on a flat stone called a metate, a word of Aztec origin. The corn is soaked in lime water till the hull can be separated from it, and then it is pounded and rolled upon the metate until it is ground into meal. In this work, the woman uses a cylinder of stone, something like the American rolling pin, or very often she uses a flat or slightly rounded stone, with which she pounds and twists for hours. When the meal is sufficiently ground, a little water is added, and it is worked into dough. The dough is then rolled or patted in the hand until it is almost as thin as a knife blade and formed into circular cakes. The cakes are baked on an iron kamal or griddle, which has been previously held over the fire until it is so hot that the cooking is done in a few moments. They are not allowed to brown and are best when served hot. They are generally without salt and other seasoning and are very tasteless at first to a stranger but after one has become accustomed to tortillas, he prefers them to any other kind of corn cake. The equipment of the kitchen was exceedingly simple, and the youths wondered how a French cook would get along with none but Mexican utensils to get up a meal with. The stove, or cooking range, consisted simply of a wall or bank of solid adobe, about two feet high, and of the same width. This bank was built against one side of the kitchen, which was ten or twelve feet square, and it extended the whole length of that side. There were depressions in the bank, in which small fires of charcoal or wood were burning. On these fires, the pots, pans, and griddles were placed, and the process of cooking went on. There was no chimney, the smoke escaping, or being supposed to escape, through an opening in the roof directly over the cooking range. But the kitchen of the common people is less elaborate than this. It consists simply of a mound of clay, perhaps a foot in height, and a yard in diameter and depressed in the center. Little fires in this depression furnish the heat for cooking the food placed in the pots and kettles, which are of common unglazed earthenware. The cook sits or squats on the floor close by this primitive range, while the mistress of the kitchen previously described stands and can walk about at will without the trouble of rising. In some parts of Mexico, the cooking is done out of doors. This is particularly the case in the southern portion and in this season of rains, the weather often reduces culinary operations to a very limited quantity. The more rain, the less dinner, unless the food is eaten raw. But as it consists largely of fruits, the inconvenience is less serious than it might be otherwise. When our young friends went to dinner, they found a repast that was entirely Mexican in character. After it was over, they made notes of what they had seen and eaten, and this was the result. We had tortillas, of course, and very good they were. The dinner began with a soup, which was so good that we asked how it was made, as we thought it might be tried by some of our cooks at home. Here's what they told us. We start this soup with the chicken broth, just as chicken broth is made anywhere else. Then we take the meat of the chicken, the white part only, after it has been broiled very tender, and pick it into little bits of shreds. We take some pounded almonds, the yolks of hard-boiled eggs, a little bread which has been soaked in milk, a little spice of some kind and plenty of pepper, and we mix the whole up together till it forms a hard paste. We make this paste into little bowls and drop them into the soup when it was boiling hot and just before it's brought to the table. If you want a good soup and a new one, just try this. You might not hit the seasoning the first time, but when you do, you'll find you've something worth eating. After the soup we had a puchero, which is said to be a very popular dish with the Mexicans, but we were not particularly fond of it. They begin it by boiling mud on to make a broth, and then they throw in every sort of garden vegetable cut in small pieces. Apples, pears, squashes, tomatoes, green corn, onions, potatoes, carrots, parsnips, red or green peppers. In fact, any and everything from the garden that is edible. There is so much pepper in this mess that it burns your mouth like an East Indian curry, but it is said to be good for the stomach and climate. 
They tell us we'll like it after a while, and perhaps we shall, but we certainly don't now. It is a good deal like the down east stew with the addition of the hushed peppers and tree fruits. Next, we had a tamal de cazuela, which was translated into cornmeal pot pie. As nearly as we could make out, it is made by putting a mixture of a scalded meal, flour, eggs, and melted lard into a broth in which chicken and pork have been boiled so as to make a thin paste. Then, make a mixture of the boiled pork and chicken hashed reasonably fine, along with red peppers and tomatoes, and cook them in lard. Next, you spread the paste on the bottom and sides of a dish that has been well greased so as to prevent sticking, lay in your meat mixture, cover with more of the paste, and bake it gently, but thoroughly. For a hungry man, the dish ought to be very satisfying. Our dinner ended with frijoles, or beans, and we remark here that beans are the principal food of the Mexicans of the lower ranks of life and are largely used by the middle and upper classes. The great majority of Mexicans eat them twice a day, and a dinner would be incomplete without them. The annual crop of these beans in Mexico must be something enormous, and its failure would be as bad as that of wheat in our northern states, potatoes in Ireland, or codfish along the New England coast. They cook them in various ways, but the favorite form is in a stew. They are usually considered unwholesome if eaten on the day they are cooked. They are always prepared with pepper, either green or red, and the preparation is so hot with pepper that one seems to be eating melted lead while partaking of frijoles a la Mexican. Peppers enter into nearly all the Mexican cookery. An American who does not like them told us that the proportions for a Mexican stew were one pound of meat, one quart of water, and one pound of hashed peppers. It is a common remark in Texas and Colorado that a wolf will not eat a dead Mexican because he is so impregnated with pepper that even the stomach of that voracious animal can't stand it. The Mexican dinner proved a digestible one. At all events, Frank and Fred slept soundly and were fully refreshed for the visit to the battlefield on the following day. Saddle horses were in readiness as soon as breakfast was over and the party made a good start. We will listen to Fred's account of the excursion. After the capture of Monterrey, General Taylor remained for a while at that city and then marched upon Saltillo, which he occupied without opposition. General Scott ordered the divisions of Worf and Twiggs to join him at Veracruz for the advance upon the city of Mexico, and this reduced Taylor's force to 5,000 men, nearly all of them volunteers. The Mexicans assembled a large army at San Luis Potosí and advanced upon Saltillo with 20,000 men, expecting to drive the Americans out of the country. On the 22nd of February, 1847, Washington's birthday, General Taylor met them at Buena Vista, or rather at the pass of La Angostura, the Narrows, three miles south of the hacienda which gives the name to the battle. He occupied a position where he had great advantage as a single battery of artillery protected the entire front, while the flanks were defended by steep gullies and ravines that the Mexicans could not hope to pass, and by the mountains that rose on the east to a height of 2,000 feet. There is a plateau to the east which Santa Ana, the Mexican commander, tried to reach, as by gaining it he would be able to turn the pass where the Americans were posted. Some of his troops advanced to it during the afternoon of the 22nd, but were driven back by the Americans. During the night, the Mexican army gained the plateau, and the Americans then changed their position to the plain at the base, but continuing to hold the entrance of the pass. On the morning of the 23rd, the fighting began in full earnest, the Mexicans attacking in three heavy columns which were directed on the American left. The American line was broken on that side, but the center and right held their ground and drove the enemy back. Then the Americans attacked the Mexican infantry on the right and drove them back. As a last move, Santa Ana formed his whole force into a single column which drove the Americans back for some distance until the Mexicans were checked by the artillery. In this last part of the battle, when the cause of the Americans seemed lost, General Taylor gave the celebrated order which has passed into history. Give them a little more grape, Captain Bragg. Captain Bragg's battery of artillery was stationed on one of the little mounds or hillocks at the entrance of the defile, and from that point he threw an iron hail among the advancing Mexicans that drove them into disorder and flight. The battle lasted all day, 
and when night came the two armies occupied very nearly the same positions they held in the morning. The men slept where they were, and General Taylor was uncertain whether the battle would be resumed the next morning or not. When morning came, it was seen that the Mexican army had fled, and the whole ground where they were at sunset was deserted. About 20,000 men had been beaten by less than 5,000. Their losses were placed at 2,000, while that of the Americans was 746, or about one-sixth their entire number. General Lew Wallace, in writing about the battle, says that by every rule of scientific warfare, the Americans were beaten oftener than they were hours in the day, but they did not know it. They rallied and fought, and rallied and fought again, till they finally wrung victory from the hands of a sure defeat. We spent two or three hours on the battlefield visiting all the points of interest and listening to the story as it was told by our guide, an intelligent Mexican who was born in the vicinity and has latterly made it his business to show strangers over the ground. He said there had been very few changes since the battle. The public road runs straight through the battlefield and it is easy to understand the positions of the opposing armies. One thing we understood after seeing the ground which we did not comprehend before we had wondered why the Mexicans made so little use of their cavalry, of which they had 4,000, and the Mexican horsemen are among the best in the world. When we saw how the ground is cut up with barrancas or deep ravines, making it impossible for companies and regiments of mountain men to preserve their formation, we did not wonder any more. We returned to the hacienda in time for the midday meal, and in the afternoon went back to Saltillo. The journey to Saltillo was quickly made, as the road descends a good deal, and the horses went along at an excellent pace. The rest of the day was spent in sightseeing about Saltillo, including visits to some of the cotton and other factories for which the place is famed. The machinery in the cotton factories is of foreign make, some of it from England and some from the United States. The cloth made there is of ordinary quality, and sells for a price that ought to give a fine profit to the owners of the establishment. Frank asked about the wages of the laborers in the mills and found that they received from 30 to 50 cents a day for 12 or 14 hours work according to their skill and the amount of labor they performed. It is estimated that about 30 million pounds or 60,000 bales of cotton are annually converted into cloth in Mexico. Most of the raw cotton is grown in the country and while with the cultivation of the product and its manufacture into textiles, it is thought that 50,000 families are supported by the cotton industry. Where the mills are carefully managed, they are profitable and make a liberal return for the investment of capital. End of chapter 4 Chapter 5 of The Boy Travelers in Mexico this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Mario Pineda The Boy Travelers in Mexico by Thomas Wallace Knox Chapter 5 Bright and early the next morning, our friends were ready for the journey to Jaral, where they were to connect with the train on the International Railway to carry them farther into Mexico. The distance is about 40 miles and was to be made by diligence as the railway from Jaral to Saltillo was not then completed. They by no means regretted this, as a ride in one of these vehicles would be a novelty. The boys had read and heard a great deal about diligence travel in Mexico and were more than willing to have an experience of it. The start was made about 7 o'clock in the morning and there was a considerable crowd in the street to see them off. The arrival and departure of the diligence is an event in a Mexican town, though less so than it was before the days of the railway. It is probable that by the time this book is in the hands of the reader, the locomotive will have a finished track between Saltillo and Jaral, and the diligence will be known no more except as a relic of past days. Those who have been jolted for hours and days in these heavily built carriages and over bad roads will give the hardiest kind of welcome to the new order of things. The diligence will long continue on many of the side roads in Mexico where it will not pay to build the railway, just as the stagecoach still exists in part of the United States, but the great through routes have lost it for all time. 
Immediately on their arrival at Saltillo before going to Buena Vista, Dr. Bronson secured places for the trio in the diligence for Jaral. At the diligence offices all through Mexico, the rule of first come, first served is followed as in a steamship or a pullman car, and when the vehicle is full, the traveler whose place is unsecured must wait for the next journey, extra carriages being very rarely put on. If the weather is good, an outside seat, el pescante, is decidedly preferable, as it affords a much better view of the scenery along the route. American tourists generally take the chances of the weather and select outside places, but the native, who does not care for the prospect and desires nothing beyond making the journey as speedily as possible, is quite content with the inside, el interior. Mexican roads are bad, and Mexican carriages are constructed with a view to withstanding all the shaking that a rough road can give. The result is that at the end of a long journey, the traveler feels very much as though he had been passed through a patent clothes wringer or an improved threshing machine. But no such fear troubled our friends, as the distance to Jaral was but 42 miles and the scheduled time for the journey, 7 hours. The road was bad enough, it is true, but the Jews heeded the advice of Dr. Brunson and consoled themselves with the reflection that it might have been a great deal worse than it was. They had read so much about brigandage in Mexico that the possibilities of an encounter with highwaymen naturally came into their minds. At the first opportunity, they asked an American resident of Saltillo about the state of the country through which they were to pass and the liability to an unpleasant encounter. There is hardly any danger on this line now, was the reply, and it is a long time since a robbery was committed. There is less brigandage in Mexico today than there was a few years ago, but there is still too much of it to make traveling altogether agreeable. The government has put down the system of robbery as much as possible, partly by capturing and killing the brigands, and partly by hiring them to quit the business and become respectable citizens. That's a curious way to suppress crime, said one of the Jews, to hire a man, to be honest, after he has spent a good part of his life on robbery. It doesn't harmonize with our ideas of propriety, said the gentleman, but it had the desired effect at all events. General Diaz, when he became president, induced the robber chiefs to quit the business they were in and enter the service of the government. They were pardoned for their misdeeds, commissioned as officers in the army, and appointed to preserve order in certain districts. Their followers were enlisted as soldiers to serve under their old leaders. Each soldier receives 40 pesos a month and furnishes his own horse and equipments. As they know the whole country where they are on duty, they have effectually put down brigandage in their districts. They are the best horsemen in the world, and there is no finer body of cavalry anywhere than the Mexican rurales, the reformed brigands. Doesn't it sometimes happen that they turn robbers temporarily just to keep themselves in practice? Yes, they have done so in several instances, but on the whole, these converted highwaymen have kept faith with the government very thoroughly. You must remember that brigandage has been a regular occupation for centuries, and it cannot be broken up in a hurry. In some parts of the country, it was organized as a business, and many men who stood well in the community were associated with the robbers and received a percentage of their earnings. Did they take any part in the robberies? Not exactly with their own hands, but they used to notify the brigands when valuable trains were to be on the road and at what time they would start. They acted as scouts or spies, if you please, and in this way earned their right to a share of the plunder. I was once captured and carried into the mountains by a party of brigands who held me for a ransom. In the old times, before Maximilian came here, the Mexican brigands simply robbed travelers who made no resistance and killed those who resisted unsuccessfully. Maximilian imported some Italians, who were soon turned robbers and affiliated with the Mexican bandits. They thought the Mexicans the Italian trick of holding prisoners for ransom, and it was practiced very extensively. Well, the rascals carried me off on their retreat in the hills, and made me write to my brother demanding $5,000 as ransom for me. They threatened that, in case it was not paid by a certain day, I would be shot, and my friends would receive my head as a proof that the threat had been carried out. The letter was delivered by a respectable citizen, 
who was on friendly terms with my brother and myself. I had dined at his house and he at mine, and we had had several business transactions. It had been intimated that he was friendly with the brigands, and this circumstance proved it. My brother paid the money to him, and I was released and allowed to come home. They treated me well while I was with them, but kept a guard over me all the time with orders to kill me instantly in case I attempted to escape. I suppose they made you promise not to reveal the name of that man to the authorities. Not at all. I could have done so, and he would have been tried and convicted on the evidence of myself and brother. He would have been shot without mercy, but the matter would not have ended there. The brigands would have avenged his death and assassinated both of us within a week, sure. In some respects, the brigands were not so bad as they have been painted, the gentleman continued. The diligence companies have an arrangement whereby a traveler can buy a letter of credit to pay his bills with along the road instead of carrying money, which would be a temptation to robbers. His expenditures are endorsed on the letter of credit by the company's agents, or he can draw a few dollars every night upon his letter to pay his hotel bill with. But it is necessary to carry some money in your pocket to pay the robbers for the trouble of stopping and examining you. If they find absolutely nothing to reward them for their efforts, you will very likely be killed as a warning to be more considerate the next time you travel. If they should rob you of your letter of credit, you can write or telegraph back to the agency where you obtained it, and a telegraphic transfer will be made for the amount remaining. Their usual plan of operations is to rush out suddenly from the roadside and present pistols and guns in the faces of passengers and drivers with a suddenness that prevents resistance. The passengers are ordered to alight, hold their hands in the air, then to lay down and place their mouths to the ground, and in this attitude their pockets are searched. The brigands are generally polite, but firm, and in the American phrase, they won't stand any nonsense. When the examination of pockets is completed, they order the passengers to lie still for five or ten minutes, perhaps for a quarter of an hour, and during that time the fellows disappear from sight. If no resistance is offered, no one is harmed, except once in a while, when a bloody thirsty brigand kills for the sheer pleasure of it. But such fellows are soon apprehended, and generally they are betrayed by their followers, who do not relish the crimes that may be visited on their hands. Sometimes they build a barricade across the road at a place where there is a sharp turn, and in the confusion that follows the arrival of the coach at the barricade, they perform their work. In such cases, the robbers are concealed in the bushes all along the roadside, and the passengers suddenly discover a dozen or more guns bearing on them at once. Discretion is always advisable under such circumstances, and the traveler who is prudent will surrender his valuables at once. A friend of mine tells a story, he continued, that illustrates the politeness of the Mexican robbers. He was traveling on horseback with a friend and a servant, and fell into the hands of a band of brigands whose leader was named Manuel. The fellows took everything of value that the travelers had, and then the chief told the sufferers that he would give them a pass which would save them from further molestation. Perhaps he was not altogether disinterested in so doing, as the exhibition of the pass would save his friends the trouble of searching an array of empty pockets and getting nothing for their trouble. Thereupon he wrote on a leaf for my friend's notebook something like the following. Dear Gomez, this party has been thoroughly examined, and we've left them nothing you want. Please allow them to go on without delay. Then he told them where they would be stopped, and was about to bid them goodbye, when my friend suggested that he had nothing with which to pay his expenses on the road. Manuel suggested that the travelers ought not want for anything, and immediately gave them five dollars, which he placed in a neat pocketbook that he had taken from another traveler the day before. They met the other robbers at the place designated, and on presenting the pass were not interfered with in any way. My friend's horse had become lame, and Gomez generously gave him a fresh horse, stolen, no doubt, from somebody else, and turned the lame steed out by the roadside. Other stories of the same sort were told, and the interview ended with an account of how the American owner of a line of coaches between Veracruz and Mexico City, away back in the 40s, before the days of the railway, made a bargain with the chief of the brigands commanding the route, by which, in consideration of an annual subsidy, they were not to molest his coaches or passengers. 
the subsidy was regularly paid, and the brigands faithfully regarded their side of the bargain. When General Scott was advancing from Veracruz upon the capital, he made a contact with this same American to supply the army with beef, and through the efficient aid of his friends, the brigands, he had no difficulty in carrying out his contract. They stole cattle from all the haciendas within a hundred miles of the route and kept him well supplied. The road from Saltillo to Jaral follows a picturesque valley, and in the 42 miles between the two places makes a descent of nearly 1,400 feet. Consequently, there was more downhill than up, and the diligence went along in fine style. The driver was an accomplished whip and uh, managed his team admirably. For a part of the way, the vehicle was drawn by horses. At the first station, mules were substituted, and our friends were unable to say which were the better for the work. The driver explained that he preferred mules for the reason that in case they ran away, they would keep to the middle of the road, while horses were apt to shy and turn to one side, thereby endangering the safety of the diligence and its passengers. This difference between horses and mules has been noted by drivers in other parts of the world and is said to be correct. The driver had an assistant, whose duty it was to throw stones at the leading animals to encourage them to their work. He was a skilled marksman and rarely missed his aim. Sometimes he threw the missiles while sitting on the box at the driver's side, and at others he ran alongside the team or kept near the wheels of the coach. In either case, the result was the same, and the conveyance under his manipulations made good progress. Crosses at several points on the road showed where travelers had been killed by robbers. On all the roads of Mexico, these crosses can be seen, and on some routes they are painfully numerous. At noon, a halt was made at a hacienda sufficiently long to enable the passengers to have something to eat. They were supplied with chili con carne, a stew of meat and peppers, very hot in two ways, and with the ever-present tortillas and frijoles. The jolting over the road, combined with the pure air of the sierras, gave the travelers a vigorous appetite, and they heartily enjoyed the roadside repast. The service was somewhat primitive in character, and reminded our friends of Delmonico's in New York solely by his contrasts. No brigands came to disturb the progress of the mines of the travelers, and in due time they reached Haral and were landed in safely. Fred made the following practical note for the information of future travelers. The fare between Saltillo and Jaral is 3 pesos and 75 cents. 25 pounds of baggage may be carried free by each passenger. For all excess, he must pay 75 cents for each 25 pounds. There is a daily departure each way, and sometimes, when the business demands it, there are two departures. There was not a great deal to be seen at Jaral, but the Jutes did not waste their time. They devoted themselves to obtaining information about the country to the northward along the line of the International and Central Railways, and here is substantially what they ascertained. A hundred miles to the north, or where we now are, is the city of Monclova, which was for some time the terminus of the International Railway. It was the capital of Texas and Coahuila when they both formed one state, before the war which gave Texas her independence. It is the center of a region rich in minerals, and of late years several enterprising Americans have established themselves there, and are developing the resources of the country. Some of the silver ore in the Monclova district is so rich that it is sent to the United States and to Europe to be reduced, and the transportation of this ore furnishes a good business for the railway company. About halfway from Monclova to the American frontier is the town of Sabinas, which is the center of a rich coal region. Mexico is in great need of coal, and it is only recently that it was known that she had a fine supply of it in her borders. It is found in a large part of the Sabinas Valley. There are extensive mines at Ondo and San Felipe, especially at Ondo, whence they are shipping large quantities for the use of the railways in this country and Texas, and for the mines of the interior of Mexico. There is an abundance of iron ore near Monclova, not far from the railway, and it is proposed to erect extensive iron works at Sabinas for its reduction. The railways seem to have waked up this sleepy country, and if some Rip Van Winkle of other days could arise and look around him, he would rub his eyes in astonishment. 
If we had come into Mexico by the Central Railway, we would have passed through the state of Chihuahua, pronounced Chihuahua, but we wouldn't have seen much, as the train leaves El Paso in the evening, runs through a desolate country, and reaches the city of Chihuahua for breakfast in the morning. Mr. Jambier, the author of The Mexican Guide, says there is not much to be seen in the city and advises travelers not to stop there. According to his account, it is so overrun by Americans that it cannot be called a typical Mexican town. It has about 20,000 inhabitants and no public buildings of importance, with the exception of the Church of San Francisco, which was built by a tax of one real on each pound of silver taken from the Santa Eulalia mines, which are in the vicinity. Chihuahua was once the center of a large trade with the United States, and at one time, when the road was dangerous, armed caravans were made up periodically, just as they are made up in Central Asia and other parts of the old world at the present time. The silver mines of Santa Eulalia are about 15 miles from Chihuahua and have a reputation of being among the richest silver mines in the world. The district is 15 or 20 miles square and contains, or once contained, a good many silver mines, which turned out fabulous amounts of the precious metal. General Lee Wallace has visited and described some of these mines, and judging from his account, they must have been very rich. According to tradition, there was a time when the Real de Santa Eulalia had 7,000 inhabitants and the city of Chihuahua 70,000, all living directly or indirectly upon the product of the mines. Since the Spaniards left Mexico, the mines have not been worked as extensively as before, and the operations now carried on there are upon a limited scale. There is a prospect that some of the old glory of the mines will be restored now that northern Mexico is becoming accustomed to American ways of mining and is beginning to adopt them. There is a romantic story concerning the way the mines were discovered. About the year 1700, three scoundrels who had been driven out of Chihuahua went to find refuge among the mountains of Santa Eulalia. They must have been a very bad lot to be obliged to seek safety in that region which was infested by the Apache Indians who were at war with the white people and would have made quick work of killing these refugees if they had caught them. How they lived nobody knows. They were obliged to shift their locality from time to time to prevent being found by the Indians and one day they came upon a ravine with precipitous sides where there was a good supply of water. One of the men knew something about silver, and in looking around he found a rich deposit of ore. They sent word by the friendly Indian to the senior priest in Chihuahua that they would show him where he could get enough silver to build the finest cathedral in the world, and would do so on condition that he would absolve them for their sins and obtain their pardon from the authorities. The bad men were absolved and pardoned, and kept their promise by showing the way to the mines, which were immediately opened and yielded one hundred millions of dollars in eighty-six years. Enormous fortunes were made by the owners, and there is a story that once on the visit of a bishop who was to perform some religious service, the owner of one of the mines entertained the holy man at his house. He laid a path of silver bricks from his house to the door of the church, and when the bishop proceeded to the church, he walked all the way upon solid silver. And the story ends by saying that the owner was careful to have the bricks taken up as fast as the bishop lifted his feet from them. Leaving Haral a little before noon, our friends proceeded by the southbound train of the International Railway to Torreon, a distance of 130 miles, which was accomplished in about five hours. At Torreon they waited two hours for the train of the Mexican Central Railway, and while looking about them in the dudes spied several carloads of cotton which were about to leave by a freight train then being made up. Naturally, the sight of the cotton led to an inquiry concerning the production of that article in Mexico and the uses made of it. The youths learned that cotton is grown in about half the states of Mexico, the largest quantity being produced in the state of Veracruz, while that of Durango ranks next. In the early part of the century, about one million pounds of cotton were exported annually. Down to the time of the independence of Mexico from Spain, the royal authorities allowed no manufacturers in the colony that would be likely to interfere with those of the mother country, and consequently the manufacture of cotton goods was prohibited. 
After independence was secured, factories were built and set in operation, and at present the production of cotton is not sufficient to meet the demands of the manufacturers. The best cotton is grown in the Tierra Caliente, but the plant thrives in the tableland up to an elevation of 5,000 feet. According to a Mexican statistician, the average product is about 2,000 pounds to the acre, which is more than double the average of the cotton-growing region of the United States. Torreón and its near neighbor, Lerdo, are the principal shipping points for the cotton ground in Durango. It is probable that the opening of the railways will stimulate the growth of cotton in Mexico. The United States and other cotton-growing countries may look for considerable exportations of that product from Mexican seaports at no distant day. The manufacture of cotton clothed in Mexico is encouraged by an import duty on all foreign textiles that does not give much opportunity for competition. German and English manufacturers have labored hard to convince the Mexicans that they would be greatly benefited by allowing other countries to do their manufacturing for them, but thus far the Mexicans have remained obstinately adhesive to their protective tariff. The train left Torreón a few minutes before 7 o'clock in the evening, and consequently but little was seen of the country until the following morning. Soon after daylight it reached Fresnillo, an important mining town which dates from the middle of the 16th century. A valuable silver mine was opened at Fresnillo at that time, but its operation was long ago abandoned. Fresnillo is the point at which the two sections of the Mexican Central Railway were brought together in 1884, and the route was completed for an unobstructed run of the locomotive from the frontier of the United States to the capital of Mexico. Our friends mirror their toilets in the sleeping car as quickly as possible, and they turned to a contemplation of the scenery through which they were passing. On each side of the railway, there was an extensive plain with a fringe of low mountains forming the horizon. Straight ahead lay a range of mountains, which a friendly fellow passenger said was rich in silver and had made the fortunes of Zacatecas and other towns. They stopped for breakfast at a small town bearing the name of Calera, but neither Frank nor Fred could find that it was famous for anything, not even for the quality of the meals supplied by its restaurant. Then they rolled on towards Zacatecas, which they reached in about an hour after leaving Calera. In approaching Zacatecas, the train wound among the mountains in numerous curves and bends, forming mule shoes by the dozen and facing every point of the compass before coming to a halt. Zacatecas affords a good opportunity for studying silver mining in Mexico, and consequently, it had been selected by Dr. Bronson as a convenient stopping place. By advice of the conductor, our friends rode in the tramway cars to the hotel and entrusted their baggage to cargadores, who were more than anxious for employment. The hotel in which they lodged was formerly an Augustinian convent, and all the more interesting for that reason. End of chapter 5「Chapter 6 of The Boy Travellers in Mexico – This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Richard Stibbard The Boy Travellers in Mexico by Thomas Wallace Knox Chapter 6 what is the meaning of Zacatecas? Fred asked while the train was bearing them to the city of that name. Neither the doctor nor Frank could answer the question, and so the desired information was sought from the guidebook. It was found that the name was derived from a tribe of Indians called Zacatecas, and also from a grass that grows there, and is known in Mexico as Zacate. It should be remembered that the city is the capital of the state of Zacatecas. As it stands in a ravine where very little grass of any kind can grow, it is probable that the appellation, so far as the grass is concerned, belongs rather to the state than to the city, which is the centre of the silver mining district. The city, which has a population of about 30,000, is anything but attractive as its position in a deep ravine makes its streets very narrow and crowds the buildings closely together. 
Its streets are badly paved and it is so poorly supplied with water that the drains are not properly washed. Frank thought it averaged a distinct and different smell for each thousand of its inhabitants, and the youths were not surprised to learn that the mortality, especially among the poorer part of the population, is very great. The mountains rise all around and above the city, and the extent of the silver business is shown by the large number of buildings on the mountain sides, which mark the reduction works and the entrances to the mines. There is a ridge called the Bufa, or Buffalo, overlooking the city. It is the site of a little church or chapel that was built there more than a century and a half ago, and was at one time a favourite place of pilgrimage. Ordinary offenders were required to do penance by ascending on foot to the door of the chapel, and extraordinary ones made the journey on their knees. The custom still prevails, though less so than formerly. Frank and Fred saw several pilgrims making the ascent, but were told that days and even weeks might elapse before another scene of the same sort could be witnessed. The travellers paid a hasty visit to the Cathedral of Zacatecas, which was formerly very rich in ornaments. Most of them were removed at the time of the confiscation of the property of the church by the government, and are not likely to be restored. It is said that the baptismal font was of solid silver and worth a hundred thousand dollars. The Jesuits have on the side of the mountain a fine church, which presents a very picturesque appearance and contains some interesting and valuable paintings. The street scenes were much the same as at Monterey and Saltillo, with the addition of groups of miners and men employed about the reduction works, droves of burros or donkeys, laden with ore, and other things peculiar to the industry of the locality. The youths wished to visit the mines and descend to the scene of operations underground, and consequently were not inclined to devote much time to the public buildings and the streets. They observed that the city had sufficient enterprise to be lighted with electricity, and to have a telephone, an exchange, and a fire department though the scarcity of wooden buildings seemed to afford very little use for the latter. They were advised not to go into the mines, as the descent must be made by ladders which are not constructed like ordinary ones, but are nothing more than logs set upright and notched alternately on opposite sides. The miners ascend and descend very nimbly along these rude ladders, and accidents are rare, but strangers find them dangerous. Frank and Fred were quite willing to take the risk, but the doctor was more prudent and suggested that they would defer their visit to the interior of a mine until they reached one with less liability to mishap. But this did not interfere with a visit to one of the reduction works, for which a permit was readily obtained. Before we make the visit, said the doctor, I want you to learn what the patio process of reduction is, so that you can see intelligently. The patio process is in use here, as it is throughout Mexico and South America generally. In the hour they had at their disposal, Frank and Fred informed themselves on the subject, and were able to write as follows. The patio process was invented in 1557 by Bartolomé de Medina, and is so called because a patio, or yard, is required for its operation. The ore is crushed and ground fine in arastras, an arastra is a mill where an animal, generally a mule, walks in a circle and turns a millstone that rolls upon a floor, on which the material to be ground is placed. We have seen arastras at work several times since we came to Mexico, and they are not unknown in the southwestern part of the United States. If there is any gold in the ore, 50 or 60 percent of it may be saved by putting silver or copper amalgam into the arastras. Some of the Mexican ores must be roasted to remove certain chemicals which they contain, but this is not the case with all of them. The paste from the arastras is spread in heaps on the floor of the patio. After it has hardened somewhat by the evaporation of a part of the water it contains, it receives a quantity of salt, which is in proportion to the amount of silver in the ore. Then it is mixed by men with shovels and by the tread of horses or mules, 
and a day or two later a mixture of copper vitriol and salt is added. There follows more treading and mixing. Then quicksilver is spread over the mass and trodden in, and the next day there is another mixing and treading. These performances are repeated on alternate days, quicksilver being added one day and the mass being trodden the next, until the treading has been repeated seven or eight times. The quicksilver unites with the silver and forms an amalgam. The formation is carefully watched, and when it has reached the proper condition, the amalgam is gathered up into hide or canvas bags. Some of the quicksilver is squeezed out, and the rest is driven off by evaporation, and condensed in a pipe that runs into a tub of water. There's a good deal more, said Fred, but I'm afraid if we say too much about the process, we shall lead our young friends at home to skip the whole story. So we've made it short. You've said quite enough, replied the doctor to give a general idea of what the patio process is. Anyone who wants to know more can look it up in books on mining or encyclopedias. Armed with the information they had obtained, the youths were able to understand intelligently the operations at the reduction works that they visited. Frank thought they could find a cheaper way of mixing up the mass of ore than by treading it out with mules. Dr. Bronson told them that methods had been adopted in California and Nevada, whereby all this work is done by machinery, but they were not generally approved in Mexico. The Mexicans, said he, are slow to change. They have done their work in this way for 300 years, and it is not easy to convince them that there is anything better in the world. The Americans who buy or lease mines in Mexico and adopt the plans that suit themselves will afford some instruction by example. The Mexicans may learn by the example, especially if they find that the new process enables their competitors to make money out of a mine they cannot do anything with. In one patio there were 120 horses at work, in gangs of 12 or 16, treading out the ore. They are sorry-looking brutes, said Fred, as their tails are shaved and their bodies splashed with the black mud through which they're walking. To us it looks like ordinary mud, but to the eye of the expert I suppose it is altogether different, as we are told that a mining superintendent can determine almost at a glance how rich the mineral is. Evidently the horses don't know the value of what they are treading, or they wouldn't look so dejected and forlorn. Horses and mules that are old and useless for anything else are bought for this work. The chemicals destroy their hoofs, and they do not last a great while. If there were a Mexican Henry Berg, he would most certainly try to put a stop to this cruelty. The men who are working among the horses are about as unprepossessing in appearance as the animals. They wear only a shirt and trousers, and both garments look as though cloth was dear when they were planned. The trousers come only to the knee, and the sleeves of the shirt do not reach the elbow. The men who work in the mines and about the reduction establishments are carefully searched on quitting work, to make sure that they do not carry off anything of value. Their garments are without pockets, and thus they have no places for storing away stolen property. But in spite of the absence of pockets, they would manage to steal some of the amalgam if they were not so closely watched and carefully searched. In some of the mines they work with scarcely a thread about them, the heat being so great that clothing cannot be borne with ease. The miners generally work in small teams or gangs, and receive a portion of the ore taken out in addition to their wages, which vary from 30 to 50 cents a day. Sometimes the payment is altogether in ore, which is sold at auction on stated days. We asked if the miners ever gave trouble by striking, and were told that they had not yet become sufficiently Americanized to form themselves into labor unions. The people seem to be entirely content with what they receive, and as they have very few wants and do not try to save anything from one week to another, it is not likely they will change their ways in a hurry. While we are on the subject, wrote Frank in a letter describing the visit to Zacatecas, we may as well say what we learned about silver mining in general throughout Mexico. Silver was known to the Aztecs before the Spanish conquest, but they do not seem to have made much use of it. They worked it into ornaments and various small articles, but among the treasures of Montezuma, 
seized by Cortes, the amount of silver was very small compared with that of gold. The Spaniards had no idea of the immense value of the country when they conquered it, so far as silver is concerned. But they began developing the mines very soon after they captured the country, Fred remarked. Yes, responded Frank. In the expedition commanded by Cortes, there were many men who were familiar with the mines of old Spain, and they were not long in finding the silver deposits of the New World. During the 16th century, the mines of Mexico were extensively worked, and the working continued steadily down to the war for independence, when it gradually fell off. At the time of Humboldt's visit in 1803, about 3,000 distinct mines were in operation. Humboldt estimated that the product of silver in Mexico, from the conquest in 1521 down to 1804, amounted to $2,027,952,000, and the estimate since that time brings the grand total up to more than $4 billion. "'What a lot of money!' exclaimed Fred. "'Suppose we had it and wanted to take it to New York. How could we carry it?' Wait a moment, was the reply, and I'll tell you. Frank made a hasty calculation on a slip of paper, and then answered as follows. Roughly estimated, the weight of that value in silver would be 330 million pounds, or 166,000 tonnes, estimating 2,000 pounds to the tonne. If we had it in the city of Mexico, we would have to engage 416 trains of 40 cars each, with ten tons of silver in each car, to take it to Veracruz. From Veracruz we would need 166 steamships, carrying a thousand tons each, to take our precious freight to New York, and I'll let you figure out how many warehouses we would need to store it in, and how many policemen would be required to take care of it. Well, said Fred, there's one thing you've forgotten. Remember that the most of this silver has been brought from the mines on the backs of mules or donkeys. Reckoning one hundred pounds to a load, how many burros would be needed to transport our fortune, supposing we had it? Frank figured again, and found that the silver product of Mexico from the conquest to the present time would load three and a third million burros. Putting them in single file, and allowing each burro ten feet of space, there would be six hundred and thirty-one miles of them, and half a mile or so over. Let's go into the business of silver mining, said Fred. Just see what a lot of money has been made by it, and with very crude methods of reducing the ore. With the improved processes of modern times, there must be a fortune for everybody. I don't know about it, replied his cousin. Anyway, we'll ask Dr. Bronson's advice before we venture. The appeal to the doctor resulted in a good deal of sound information, to the effect that silver mining is generally unprofitable, and anybody should think twice before venturing into it. And so far as the Mexican mines are concerned, he said, there are very few of them that are doing more than paying working expenses, and some do not do that. Fifty or more American companies are engaged in this country at present. A few have made money, but the majority have not yet received back what they put into their enterprises or any interest upon it. And unless I am misinformed, it is next to impossible to buy a good mine here. If a Mexican has a mine he is willing to sell, you may be pretty sure it isn't worth buying. The same rule holds good in all mining regions the world over, and is hardly necessary to discuss. The mining laws of Mexico require that the owner of a mine must work it for four consecutive months in each year, with four regular miners, and a penalty of forfeiture. Unless he complies with this law, the mine becomes the property of the government, and is sold at auction. The laws of Mexico formally prohibited foreigners not naturalized or provided with special licenses from owning or working mines, but this provision was repealed, and foreigners may now legally acquire mines in any part of the republic, provided one of the partners in each mining company resides in Mexico. From Zacatecas, our friends proceeded in the direction of the capital, their next stopping place being at Aguas Calientes, 120 miles farther south at nearly 2,000 feet lower in elevation. Zacatecas is 8,044 feet above sea level, while Aguas Calientes is 6,179. For the first part of the journey, the railway winds among the hills. Then it comes out into a rich and comparatively level country, 
where great quantities of corn, wheat, barley and wool are produced. The plains and hillsides were dotted with flocks of sheep, and the numerous fields showed that the land was favourable to farming industries. Farming in Mexico is in a backward condition, the implements being mainly of the primitive type. American ploughs, harrows, mowers, reapers and other farming implements and machines have been introduced, as already mentioned, since the advent of the railways, but the Mexican labourer does not take kindly to their use. It is said that on the haciendas where improved farming implements and machinery have been introduced, they have been maliciously destroyed or put out of working order by the peons. Their hostility to labour-saving inventions is just as great as that of the same class of people in other parts of the world. During the construction of the railways, some of the contractors brought a supply of wheelbarrows to replace the gunny sacks with which the peons have been from time immemorial accustomed to carry earth on their backs or heads. Being made to understand that they must use the wheelbarrows instead of the sacks, they filled the vehicles with earth and carried them on their heads. The contractors were obliged to return to the use of the gunny sack, as they found more work was done with it than with the wheelbarrow. The Indians living in the neighbourhood of the cities come down from their homes in the hills, bringing on their backs large baskets filled with garden vegetables, chickens and other marketable things. The story goes that when an Indian from the hills has sold his burden, he puts a stone weighing 50 pounds or more in his basket in order to give him a grip with his feet on the ascending road which leads to his home. The agricultural labourers of Mexico are not an enterprising race and care nothing beyond supplying their daily wants. They were formerly held in a condition of slavery both before and after the Spanish conquest, but slavery was abolished soon after the War of Independence. Therefore, the agricultural labourers, miners and all other classes of working people for the last 50 years and more, have been free. The miners are said to be better workers than the farmhands, as they are not migratory in their habits, and generally spend their lifetime in the places where they were born, unless compelled to go elsewhere in search of employment. Before the conquest, beasts of burden were unknown, and everything that had to be transported was moved by human muscle. The priests imported donkeys to take the place of men in carrying burdens and from the animals thus introduced, the present race of burros is descended. Cattle, sheep, horses and hogs were brought from Spain previous to the importation of donkeys, which did not make their advent until the 18th century. Horses, cattle and mules in great number are raised in Mexico annually, but the stock growers do not pay much attention to other animals. The foregoing was learned by Frank and Fred during their ride from Zacatecas to Aguas Calientes, and therefore this is its proper place in the narrative. There must be a hot spring where we're going, said Fred, as Aguas Calientes means hot waters. You're right, replied the doctor. There are hot springs in the city, and all through this region, and the baths of the city are famous, like most hot baths, for their beneficial effects in rheumatism and other diseases. Of course, a hot bath was one of the things to be sought, and the travellers found it without difficulty. There was a bathing establishment in the city, but they were advised to shun it and visit the suburban baths, which were easily reached by the tramway. The temperature of the water is 106 degrees Fahrenheit, and the supply is abundant. The baths, combined with the general beauty of the place, have made Aguas Calientes a popular health resort, and with the improved accommodations that are sure to follow the advent of the railway, the popularity will increase. It's the prettiest city we've seen since we came into Mexico, wrote Frank in his notebook. Prettier than Monterrey, Saltillo, or any other of our halting places. It abounds in gardens, and the people seem to have a passionate fondness for flowers, if we may judge by the extent to which they cultivate them. Around the city the country is fertile, and there are finely cultivated fields, luxuriant vineyards, rich meadows, and everything to please the eye. It is said that artists have a special liking for this place, and now that I've seen it, I'm not at all surprised. Whoever laid out this city had an eye to the picturesque and realised that land was plenty, and he gave it one large plaza and ten smaller ones, and adorned several of the plazas with gardens. 
Then there are some fine buildings belonging to the government. There are thirteen churches, a hospital and a college. And I must not forget that there is a jail, which is well patronised and is said to be very attractive for a jail. We have been through the market, which is supplied with more fruit than we have seen since we left Monterey, together with several varieties that we have not observed elsewhere. They have a population of about 25,000 here, and the chief industry is in manufacturing. They make cloth of various kinds, including some fine woolens, and we have seen handsome work in leather and some very pretty pottery. Everybody we've talked with says it's a pity it's not the time of the annual fair, which lasts from the 23rd of April to the 10th of May, and brings in a large number of people from the surrounding country. There are many curious costumes and customs to be seen during the fair, which is a period of feasting for all who attend it. Mr. Janvier says it resembles our Thanksgiving, as everybody then lives upon cacones, or turkeys. The festival is a very ancient date, and was held before the advent of the Spaniards. In such a beautiful city we have looked for beautiful inhabitants, but haven't found a great many, though it is proper to say we haven't been able to hold a review of the whole population. While walking in one of the gardens we saw several pretty girls of Spanish blood, accompanied by their duenas, for according to Spanish custom no young girl is allowed to walk out alone. They were dressed much after the fashion of Paris or New York, except that they wore the lace veil or mantilla over their heads instead of the bonnet, which is the fashion with us. Their taste seems inclined to gaudy colours derived perhaps from the luxuriance of nature around them. The lower classes of the people are much more picturesque than the upper, and the women more so than the men. Their skins are dark, and their hair and eyes are invariably black. They keep their teeth white, and are said to do so by a vigorous application of the juice of the soap plant. A piece of the stalk of this plant is chewed until it forms a sort of brush. It contains a soapy juice that has cleansing properties beneficial to the teeth. Many of the young women are pleasing to look upon, but they are said to lose their good looks before reaching middle life for the reason, no doubt, that they have to do a great deal of hard work. Their dress is a cheap calico, short in the skirt and generally bright in colour, with a loose jacket or waist. If their heads are covered, it is with a reboso chiquito, a scarf of silk or cotton that is wrapped around the head and shoulders, and has a long fringe which falls down the back. The reboso is very convenient for carrying a baby, who is suspended there, exactly as babies are carried in Japan. End of chapter 6 Chapter 7 of The Boy Travelers in Mexico This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Betty B. The Boy Travelers in Mexico by Thomas Wallace Knox. Chapter 7 Satisfied with the day at Aguas Calientes, the party took the southbound trains and did not stop until reaching Salau after a run of 130 miles. An hour or more after leaving Aguas Calientes, they crossed the Barranca or Canyon through which the Encarnacion River flows. The bridge by which they crossed it is built of iron and is more than 700 feet long. It is fully 150 feet above the water and the view as one looks downward from the center of the bridge is apt to cause dizziness to a nervous traveler. Perhaps you don't know what a barranca is, wrote Frank in his next letter to his mother. Well, it's a deep channel which the water has worn in its steady flow for thousands of years through the earth or soft rock. The channel of Niagara River from the falls to Lewiston may be called a barranca, and so may any similar cutting made by a stream, whether large or small. Some of the Mexican barrancas are 2,000 feet wide and 1,000 or 1,500 feet deep. Their sides are almost precipitous, and every year the waters wear a deeper way through the rock or earth. Did you ever walk through a field and come suddenly upon a ditch or brook? that was not visible a few yards away? Well, that's the case with some of these barrancas. 
you come upon one without being aware that you are near it you may be galloping along enjoying the fresh air and the pleasure of a ride when all at once your horse stops and as you draw the reins you find yourself on the edge of a precipice looking down hundreds of feet perhaps to the turbid stream struggling along its course on the other side of the barranca the country is level again and you could gallop on without trouble but for the yawning chasm that stands in your way the barrancas are crossed by descending to the stream along a sloping road built with great ingenuity and at much expense the stream is passed by an ordinary bridge and the high ground is reached again along another sloping road barrancas have long been a serious obstacle to the construction of wagon roads in mexico and in recent years they have taxed the ingenuity of railway engineers who sought to pass them the first important city on the route was lagos which has a population of twenty five thousand or thereabouts and is devoted to manufacturing farther on is Lyon, which is four times as large and five or six times more important as it is the principal manufacturing city of the republic and was founded about fifteen fifty formerly there was a great fair held at Lyon annually for the sale of goods it was similar to the great fairs of europe before the invention of the railway but has dwindled in importance as the railways have come in and will probably be abandoned before many years what do they make at Lyon? one may ask for answer fred or frank will tell you that they make pretty nearly every kind of article that finds a market in mexico and can be fashioned by mexican hands there are numerous tanneries there and the leather which they produce is made into boots saddles harnesses leggings and other things into whose composition leather enters there are factories for the manufacture of cotton and woolen cloth serapes rebozos and the like there are large shops where hats are made of every mexican style and kind and sent to all parts of the republic and there are soap factories iron foundries cutlery establishments tool shops and so on through a long and possibly tiresome list and it is safe to say that a popular vote of the inhabitants of Lyon would show an overwhelming majority in favor of a protective tariff leonites are firm believers in protection to home industries and look frowningly on any movement to supplant their goods with those of foreign make about seven o'clock in the evening the train reached salau whence there is a branch fifty miles long to guanajuato or rather to marfil its suburb it was nearly nine o'clock when they reached the hotel at guanajuato there was not much to be seen in the evening and so the time was passed mostly at the hotel and devoted to a consideration of the history of the place the youths found that the site of guanajuato was given by one of the early viceroys to don rodrigo vasquez who was one of the conquerors who came with cortez the gift was a reward for don rodrigo's services in assisting to add this valuable possession to the crown of spain according to tradition the discovery of silver was made here by accident some time in fifteen forty eight and it immediately brought a crowd of adventurers in search of fortunes for a long time guanajuato was one of the most productive silver districts of mexico but since the spanish domination ended the product has greatly diminished the yield at present is about six million dollars annually and there are said to be something like two thousand mining claims in the district the most famous mine of guanajuato is that of san jose de valenciano and it is said to have yielded in the days of its prosperity about eight hundred million dollars worth of silver when humboldt visited at the beginning of the century he estimated that it produced one-fifth of the silver in the world it was in bonanza as the miners say for about forty years after it was opened and paid enormous dividends to its owners in spite of the heavy taxes exacted by the government from ten to twenty thousand people were employed in and around the valenciano mine when it was in full operation the galleries chambers and drifts of the mine are said to be more extensive than all the streets of the city and the great tiro or central shaft is nearly two thousand feet deep 
all the lower part of the mine is now filled with water and it cannot be removed except at a cost so great that nobody is willing to undertake it the veta madre or mother vein on which the mine is located is pierced by several other mines and many persons believe that guanajuato has seen its best days dr bronson arranged for his party to visit one of the mines where the process of working could be seen his applications to the administrador or director of the mine that they wished to see was courteously received and the desired permission granted at once fred will tell the story of the excursion while waiting for the pass from the administrador said fred we took a look at the city which has a population variously placed at from fifty to seventy thousand mostly dependent on the mines for their support the city stands in a ravine and reminded us of zacatecas all the world over mining towns are almost always in mountain ravines or valleys and guanajuato is no exception to the rule the streets are narrow and badly paved with cobblestones and locomotion with carriages is not at all easy the little stream that flows through the city is formed into three reservoirs at the upper end of the ravine one above the other when the upper reservoir is filled the water overflows into the next below and that in turn fills the lower one from the water thus collected the city and the mills below it are supplied when the rainy season begins the floodgates are opened and the waters rush in a torrent through the ravine and wash it thoroughly this is the only washing it gets until another year comes around and you will understand from this that guanajuato is a very smelly city and has a large death rate there isn't water enough for a good healthy system of sewerage but this does not trouble the mexicans very much in every mexican town or city we have visited thus far we have seen women at the plaza and fountains and encountered troops of donkeys carrying water water carriers have no occupation here as the liquid is supplied through pipes just as in new york or any other american city the concession to establish waterworks was given to an enterprising citizen senor roca and he made a good deal of money by the operation he built walks and seats all around the reservoirs and thus gave the inhabitants an agreeable paseo or promenade our guide showed us the castillo del grenaditas which is an immense building like a fortress and now used as a carcel or prison it was built in the early part of this century as a storehouse for grain for public use in times of scarcity its walls are several feet thick and it has a large courtyard in the center it was a place of refuge for the spaniards when hidalgo made his pronunciamento in eighteen ten and set up a revolution several hundred spaniards fled to the castillo and shut themselves in they made a vigorous defense and the attacking force was steadily repelled hidalgo tried many times to reach the gates but every time his men attempted it they were shot down at last an indian carrying a flat stone on his back as a shield against the spanish bullets reached the gates and set them on fire the stone which he used in this exploit was shown to us at least one that purported to be the identical shield the besiegers rushed in through the gates and the castle fell a year or so afterwards hidalgo was captured and executed in chihuahua his head and the heads of three of his companions were brought here and hung on hooks at the four corners of the building they were taken down and buried with high honors in eighteen twenty three but the hooks are still in position the one on which hidalgo's head was placed was pointed out to us at almost every step along the streets we were accosted by men who had all sorts of articles for sale shoes clothing spurs cutlery rebozos serapes and similar things were offered and the prices seemed very low but we were told not to offer more than half what was asked for anything and unless we really needed it we had better be careful about offering anything at all we were cautioned to be watchful of our pockets as there are expert thieves in the city who could steal anything for which they set out we saw some grindstones in one of the shops and ask our guide why they were chained to the wall and the chains fastened with padlocks he said it was because there were men around who would steal them on general principles 
they had no use for them nor any idea what they were for but as they were the heaviest articles to be seen they were supposed to be the most valuable in the market we saw that the poor people of this mining city are compelled to be very economical when meat is not disposed of fresh it is dried and sold in that shape the dried heads of sheep and goats were piled on the ground to be sold as food dried with the skin and horns on and the people stood around and haggled for them down to the fraction of a cent an important article of food here is boiled calabasas or pumpkins and another staple of diet is gruel made of coarse cornmeal the guide said the head of a sheep or goat or the nose of a bullock was added on sunday to this very meagre diet and the miners and their families were quite contented with such food truly one half of the world doesn't know how the other half lives we were invited to visit one of the schools but hadn't time to do so any more than to look at the building as we went past it a gentleman whom we talked with told us that the state college is in a flourishing condition and has upwards of three hundred students many of them of pure indian blood education among the people of mexico is not very far advanced but is better than many people suppose it has made great progress in the last twenty years before that time it was very backward and a considerable part of the population could not read or write the government seems to be thoroughly awake to the necessity of having its population intelligent in order to advance the interests of the country in all the towns and villages there are free schools supported by the government or by the local authorities and in the cities there are advanced schools and colleges and a great number of private schools then there are technical and industrial schools where trades are taught and military schools for those who desire a military education and intend entering the army in the cities free night schools for men and women similar to the night schools of new york and other american cities have been established some of them are well attended but that is not the case with all all of the mexican states make liberal appropriations for public primary schools and they tell us that last year there was an aggregate school attendance of five hundred thousand there must be an equal number of pupils in the private schools and in schools maintained by churches missions and benevolent societies so that the whole attendance may be set down as an even million of course this is not up to the standard of the united states especially of the northern portion but it is a great advance for mexico where forty years ago not one person in ten could read it is believed that fully one half of the mexican people today can read and write or certainly a large proportion of them accompanied by our guide we drove to the reyes mine or rather quite near it the administrador met us at his office near the entrance and assigned to us a guide who spoke english though not very well his english was better than our spanish and as he seemed to prefer it we did not try to talk to him in his own tongue we expected to descend by a cage in the tiro but found that the way to the vein was down a stone staircase the steps were slippery in places and we had to be careful about placing our feet as any carelessness might result in a fall frank began to quote the old latin lines about facilis descensus but our guide said chest newt which he said he learned from an american and frank had nothing more to say on the subject we had a long and tiresome walk through the mine and the dim light of the lantern and candles only served to make the darkness visible until our eyes became accustomed to it when we reached the vein we were unable to distinguish the rich ore from the worthless rock in which the mineral lay and soon made up our minds that we were as far as possible from being experts in mining it was well for us that we had laid aside our own clothes and put on some garments especially intended for the underground excursion as we were splashed from head to foot with mud when we came out and were sorry-looking spectacles for a photograph gallery each of us had a candle stuck to the top of his hat by a lump of wet clay every little while one of us knocked off his candle and then there was a halt until it was adjusted we saw many of the peons at work each with a candle fixed in his hat the fashion that has prevailed here since the mines were first opened sometimes they were in little groups 
who put their earnings into a general pool and sometimes they were working singly on spots allotted to them by the superintendents the guide told us that the men worked on shares half the ore taken out being the property of the owners of the mine and half going to the peon the ore is placed in heaps the shares of the miners are sold at auction or private sale or they may be reduced and the proceeds turned over to the proper claimants after taking the cost of the reduction the miners generally prefer the system of direct sales for the reason that they can more readily obtain their pay in this manner than by waiting for the reduction of the ore and extraction of the silver the hardest part of the work seemed to be the carrying of the bags of ore up the long flights of slippery steps to the mouth of the mine from the lower levels the water is removed by pumping and in some place it is carried in pigskins on the backs of naked indians to where the pumps are at work a pigskin filled with water on the back of a man climbing up the sloping steps looked at a little distance like some strange animal which has not yet been assigned a place in natural history these skins have the exact shape of the pig and are without cut or seam and we naturally wondered how they were obtained so nearly whole as they seemed to be we had seen them before in the mexican towns as they are in common use by the water carriers and one day we asked an american resident how they skinned pigs in mexico why said he it's easy when you know how they don't give the pig anything to eat for a couple of days then they tie him to a tree by his tail hold an ear of corn about three feet in front of his nose and so coax him out of his skin another man told us that the body of the animal is beaten with a club till the bones are smashed to pieces and the flesh reduced to a pulpy mass which is then drawn out through the neck along with the fragments of bone this seems more probable than the other process at any rate we give it the preference from the mine our friends went to one of the reduction haciendas where they saw the process of extracting silver from the ore which has been described on previous pages there are about fifty reduction mills at guanajuato some worked by horse or mule power others by water and others by steam three kinds of crushers are in use the mexican arastra the chilean mill and the american stamp mill all of which have their advocates who prefer them to the others the patio process is employed here as well as elsewhere and hundreds of horses and mules are annually worn out in treading the oars an american named parkman made an improvement on this system by rolling a loaded barrel over and through the mixture by means of horses or mules walking in a circle as in an old-fashioned cider mill the barrel mingles the ore and the chemicals as well as the horse's feet could do it and the injury to the hoofs of the animals is prevented as they do not come in contact with the mass sometimes heavy wheels are used instead of the barrels and they are arranged on a graduated scale so they move slowly from center to circumference of the torta or pulp heap as they revolve and from circumference back to the center again in this way the entire surface is gone over the reduction of the mass takes from twenty to thirty days and is thoroughly done from the hacienda they were taken to the mint where silver coins are made in the same manner as in mints in other parts of the world the machinery of the mint is of english construction and several englishmen are or were connected with the establishment to superintend the more delicate parts of the apparatus from the mint they went to a hill called the cerro de san miguel which gave them an excellent view of the city and the hills that surround it the number of elegant residences in sight convinced them that there is yet a great deal of wealth in guanajuato notwithstanding the decline in the yield of silver from the mines the next step in the journey towards the capital was made at Kiritaro. 85 miles from Salau, or 100 from Guanajuato. It is a city of from 50 to 60,000 inhabitants. It has no mines on which to base its prosperity, but is devoted to manufacturing, having been famous for 200 years and more for its production of cotton goods. The largest cotton mill in Mexico is at Querétaro. It is known as the Hercules and stands in a ravine about two miles from the city. 
it was built by Signor Rubio, is enclosed by a high wall loopholed for musketry and could stand an ordinary siege very fairly, provided the besiegers brought no cannon. A defensive force of 40 soldiers is maintained at the mills, and they are armed with rifles and howitzers. The Hercules Mill employs about 1,500 operatives, all Mexicans, with the exception of a few foreigners, to look after the general management of details and keep the machinery in order. Not far from it is a smaller and older mill, which is surrounded with pretty gardens that require a considerable annual expenditure to keep them in order. Frank thought he would commend the plan to American mill owners and suggest the addition of gardens to their establishments. Fred was of opinion that the manufacturers of Lawrence and Fall River would not look favorably upon the suggestion, as they were much more interested in making the best possible showing in their bank accounts than in beautifying their surroundings. The Carataro mills are chiefly employed in turning out manta, a variety of cheap cotton cloth out of which the garments of the lower classes of the population are made. The Hercules mill makes 6,000 pieces of cloth 30 yards long every week and it pays the weavers about one cent a yard. The employees make from two and a half to five dollars weekly and are furnished with lodgings at very low rentals close to the mills. They work from 6 a.m. to 9.30 p.m. with half an hour's intermission for breakfast and an hour for dinner. End of chapter seven. Chapter 8 of The Boy Travellers in Mexico This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Richard Stibbard The Boy Travellers in Mexico by Thomas Wallace Knox Chapter 8 One of the first things to attract the attention of the youths was the aqueduct by which Querétaro is supplied with water. They learned on inquiry that it was built by one of the citizens at an expense of half a million dollars. The story goes that it was the result of a banter between him and another wealthy Mexican, one offering to supply the city with water if the other would build a shrine and saint of solid silver. The offer was accepted and the agreement carried out by both parties. The water comes from a mountain stream five miles from the city and is brought through a tunnel and afterwards along a series of arches, some of which are ninety feet high. It was finished in 1738, and has ever since supplied Querétaro with an abundance of water. The most interesting site of Querétaro is the Cerro de las Campanas, or Hill of the Bells, and thither our friends proceeded, as soon as they had partaken of the midday meal, which was ready on their arrival at the hotel. There is a fine view from the hill, and they greatly enjoyed it, but they were more interested in the spot where the last Mexican empire came to an end. Three black crosses mark the place where Maximilian and his generals Miramon and Mejia were shot on the morning of the 19th of June, 1867. This was the last scene in the drama of the imperial monarchy which Louis Napoleon sought to found in North America at the time of the American Civil War. Frank and Fred had already familiarized themselves with the history of Maximilian's career in Mexico. Frank had committed a portion of the story to paper, and with Fred's assistance it was completed during their stay at Querétaro, and mailed homeward with their next batch of letters. Here it is. From the time Mexico established her independence of Spain, down to 1860, there was a bitter hostility between the two parties into which the influential portion of the population was divided, the Conservative or Church Party and the Liberals. The Conservatives represented the Catholic Church, whose religion was brought to Mexico by the priests that accompanied Cortés and sought to convert the people from paganism. They succeeded in great measure, and as long as the Spaniards were in power, the Church was in full control. It possessed a great part of the wealth of the country, the most moderate estimate is that one-fourth of all the property in the country belonged to the church, and some authorities say that the proportion was far greater. When independence was established, the liberals began active opposition to the church party, and the country was hardly ever at peace from one end to the other. 
Revolutions followed each other with great rapidity. Several presidents were not allowed to enter upon the duties of their office at all, and the first president to complete the full term for which he was elected was Benito Juarez. Historians are not agreed as to the number of revolutions that have taken place in Mexico, but it is safe to say that they were not fewer than 36 in the limit of 40 years, most of them being accompanied by bloodshed. In that period there were no less than 73 rulers, nearly all of them exercising very brief authority and some none at all. As time went on, the hostility of the church and liberal parties to each other grew more and more bitter, till it culminated in the War of the Reform, between 1855 and 1858. In 1859, President Juarez proclaimed the famous laws of the Reform, which forbade priests to appear in public wearing their robes of office, suppressed the monasteries and convents, and gave the property of the church to the government. The value of this property is said to have been more than $300 million. The liberal army captured the capital city six months after the proclamation of these laws, and they were immediately put into operation, and with great severity. The country was deeply in debt, and in 1861 the Liberal Congress passed a law suspending payment of the interest on its foreign debt. This gave England, France and Spain an excuse for sending a naval and military force to Mexico. They captured Veracruz, and then an arrangement was made which caused the withdrawal of England and Spain, but France remained, and was evidently determined to conquer the country. The French advanced towards the capital, which they captured June the 9th, 1863. There were 40,000 French troops in Mexico, and they were joined by a Mexican force which was in the interest of the Church Party. In July, a Congress of Mexican notables proclaimed that the government of Mexico should be an hereditary monarchy, under a Catholic prince, and offered the crown to Maximilian, brother of the Emperor of Austria. Maximilian accepted the offer and came to Mexico with his wife, Carlotta. They arrived in July 1864 and were crowned Emperor and Empress of Mexico in the great cathedral of the capital city. The Emperor selected Chapultepec as his imperial residence. A fine avenue was laid out from the castle to the city. Trees were planted, streets were improved, and for a short time it seemed as if peace and prosperity were coming to Mexico. Juarez was still President of the Republic. He and his army were driven far to the north, but they continued to fight, and in October 1865 Maximilian signed an order which became known as the Black Decree, condemning all Republican officers captured in battle to be shot as brigands. Many of them, including several generals and colonels, were shot accordingly, and this act exasperated the people. The American Civil War had ended. The United States government put 60,000 troops along the western frontier of Texas, and then intimated that the French forces must be withdrawn from Mexico. The diplomatic correspondence lasted six months, and our government threatened armed intervention unless the French troops were recalled. They were withdrawn. Maximilian had no foreign support, and his own army could not cope successfully with the Republican forces. Juarez, with his army, advanced towards the south and the imperial army marched to meet him and was defeated. A republican army under General Diaz captured Puebla and put the imperialists to flight. Carlotta went to France and vainly besought Louis Napoleon to continue his aid and keep a French army in Mexico. Then she asked the Pope to exercise his influence, and finding that was of no use, she became hopelessly insane. Maximilian started for the coast, intending to leave the country. Unwisely for himself, he changed his plans and joined General Miramon at Querétaro, where there were 5,000 imperial troops. Querétaro was besieged by 20,000 troops under General Escobedo. The siege lasted two months and ended on the 15th of May, when the key of the position was captured, and the emperor and his army surrendered. The emperor was taken on the Hill of the Bells, the very spot where he was afterwards shot by order of the court-martial which condemned him to death. A very concise history of the events of that time, said Dr. Bronson, when Frank paused in reading their joint production. Have you anything more to add to it? 
Yes, sir, we have, was the reply. We have thought that the story of the court-martial and the last days and hours of Maximilian would be interesting and ought to form a part of our narrative. That is quite right, the doctor answered, and if you have not finished it, I will hear it some other time. On a subsequent occasion, Fred presented the following, which was heartily approved by Dr. Bronson as deserving a place in the narrative of their journey through Mexico. Maximilian was condemned to death on account of the Black Decree, and the officers who had carried out his orders were sentenced to the same fate. The wife of General Miramon went to San Luis Potosi to intercede with President Juarez for her husband's life. The princess Salmsalm went at the same time to do a similar service for Maximilian. The princess, in the account of her interview, says, I saw the president was moved. He had tears in his eyes, but he assured me in a low, sad voice, I am grieved, madam, to see you thus on your knees before me. But if all the kings and queens of Europe were in your place, I could not spare that life. It is not I who take it, it is the people and the law. And if I should not do its will, the people would take it, and mine also. Miramon's wife told a similar story about the wish of the president to be merciful and reprieve her husband. She says he was wavering when his minister of foreign affairs said, It is today or never that you will consolidate the peace of the republic. Then the president told her as gently as he could that it was impossible to grant her request. The government of the United States asked that Maximilian's life be spared, and the Emperor of Austria sent a similar request, but all to no purpose. On the morning of the execution, Maximilian rode in a coach with his confessor from the prison to the Hill of the Bells, and Miramon and Mejia, with their confessors, followed in another coach. An adobe wall had been built up for the occasion, and the three men were placed in front of it, and about ten paces from the firing party. Maximilian held a crucifix in his hand and looked intently upon it as the order to fire was given. The president caused the remains of the ill-fated emperor to be carefully coffined, and they were sent home to Austria for internment in the imperial vault of the Habsburgs. President Juarez entered the city of Mexico on the 15th of July, less than a month after Maximilian's death, and carried with him a train of provisions for the relief of the suffering inhabitants. Great leniency was shown to all who had served under Maximilian. Nineteen of the officers who had committed crimes or deserted from the Republican army were shot, others were imprisoned, and some were ordered to leave the country under pain of imprisonment in case they returned. The rank and file of the soldiery were sent to their homes or incorporated into the National Army, and the President did everything in his power to bring peace to the country. And since that time, Mexico has been a peaceful land compared with what it had been for the preceding forty years. When Fred completed the reading of his story, Dr. Bronson said he was reminded of an incident that happened at the time of the execution of Maximilian. I was in Paris, said he when the news came that the execution had taken place. The French papers were not allowed to make any comment upon the affair except to execrate it and denounce the Mexicans in the bitterest terms. Louis Napoleon would have caused the immediate suspension of any paper that uttered a word in sympathy with the acts of Juarez. One of the liberal papers managed very skilfully to get around the prohibition. It printed the telegram announcing that Maximilian had been shot by order of a Mexican court-martial, and directly beneath the telegram it printed the Black Decree of October 1865, to which you have alluded, and with it two letters written by Maximilian's victims, just before they were led to execution. The decree and the letters were copied from the French official newspapers, and therefore they could be printed without risk of interference. There was not a word of editorial comment, nor was any needed. We said there had been peace in Mexico since the fall of the empire, continued Fred, but our words deserve to be qualified. There have been disturbances at different times and in various parts of the country. In 1871, there was something that almost threatened civil war, in the shape of a pronunciamento by General Diaz, and for a while things had a serious aspect. General Diaz did not like the election of Juarez for a third time. 
he proposed an assembly of notables to reorganize the government, and that he, Diaz, should be commander-in-chief of the army until the assembly had done its work. This would have been practically equivalent to making him president, but the whole scheme was ended by the sudden death of Juarez in July 1872. Lauda de Tejado then became president, and for three years everything was peaceful. Then came another revolution, which drove Lerdo from the capital and installed Diaz in the presidential chair. At the end of his term, Diaz was succeeded by General González, who was a poor man when he became president and a very rich one when he left office. He left it peaceably and was succeeded, on December 1, 1884, by Diaz, who has shown himself a man of ability and has managed the affairs of the country very creditably. There you have Mexican history boiled down, said Fred. Perhaps it may be tedious to some of the boys at home, and if it is, they know how to skip. The conversation that followed this reading naturally turned upon Mexican affairs. Dr. Bronson signified his readiness to answer any questions the youths might ask, or, if he did not know the correct answers, he would try to tell them where the desired information could be obtained. President Juarez was a native of Mexico and not of Spanish descent, was he not? Frank asked. Yes, said the doctor. He was a full-blooded Indian, his parents having been people in very humble circumstances. He has been called the Washington or the Lincoln of Mexico. To him, Mexico owes the laws of the reform and the concessions that have brought railways into the country and opened it up to commercial relations with the rest of the world. He was the first Protestant president of the country, all his predecessors having been of the Catholic faith. He is described by those who knew him as a man rather below the average height, stoutly built without being corpulent, exceedingly plain in dress, but always fastidiously neat. Ordinarily, he wore a dress coat of black broadcloth, with other garments to match, and on state occasions he substituted white gloves and cravat for the everyday black ones. He used to ride in a plain coach with no liveried servants, which was quite a contrast to the grand turnout of Maximilian, who had a state carriage like that of Louis XIV. His complexion was Indian, and so were his features. His eyes were small and black, and his face, which was always clean-shaven, bore an expression of great firmness. He was not talkative, and was the same determined, silent man in prosperity as in adversity. His faith in the success of the Republic was never shaken, even when he was living in an adobe hut on the banks of the Rio Grande, with less than 500 followers and a reward offered by Maximilian for his head. When he arrived at El Paso del Norte, he was accompanied by only 22 friends, who have since been called the Immaculate. I have read somewhere, continued the doctor, a curious story connected with his history. When Mexico was conquered by the Spaniards, a priest of the Aztec temple at Taos in New Mexico kindled a fire upon its altar and planted a tree in front of the edifice. He prophesied that when the tree died, a new white race would come from the east and conquer the land, and when the fire went out, a new Montezuma would arise and rule Mexico. The tree died in 1846 during our war with Mexico and the fire went out when the last of the Aztec priests of Taos died, in the year that Juarez became president. Was he ever imprisoned or banished, like most of the leading men of Mexico? Frank asked. Yes, was the reply. He was a native of the state of Oaxaca, where he was educated in a seminary and studied law. He graduated with high honours at the college, and for some years held the chair of natural philosophy in that institution. In 1836, when he was 30 years old, he was imprisoned by the Conservatives on account of his liberal principles. After his release, he became Chief Judge of the Republic, and held several other offices until 1853, when he was imprisoned and banished by General Santa Ana, and lived two years in the United States, suffering severe privations. Events brought him into Mexico again, and from that time he did not leave the country until his death. He was imprisoned a third time in 1857 by Common Four, but only for a short while. We have mentioned the laws of the reform which were proclaimed by President Juarez and caused the appropriation of the property of the church by the government. Did the church have much property besides the convents, cathedrals, and church buildings generally? 
A great deal more than those, the doctor answered. The church owned real estate in vast extent, both in the cities and the rural districts, and some people say more than half the dwelling houses in the city of Mexico belonged to it. It had the reputation of being a very generous landlord, as it rented its houses at a lower rate than similar property could be had from private owners. On this subject I will quote from an English writer, who spent some time in Mexico a few years ago. Thereupon Dr. Bronson read the following from Mexico Today by Thomas U. Brocklehurst. The Church of Mexico has been all-powerful since its commencement. It may be said to be the government, the magistracy, the army, and the master of the homes. Everything in Mexico has been subservient to its dictatura. The priesthood has been entirely free from the national courts of law. They have had courts of their own, and the fueros, or privileges, of the ecclesiastics placed them entirely beyond the reach of secular power. They levied taxes and tithes of everybody and everything they had a mind to. The extent to which the clergy accumulated wealth is almost incredible. They are said to have possessed three-fourths of the whole property of the country, consisting of lands and other real estate, rents, mortgages, conventual buildings, and church ornaments. Moreover, there were no bankers in Mexico except the clergy, so they had complete power over the estates, as well as the souls of the people. In 1850, Señor Lado de Tejara, Minister of Public Works, published a statistical account of the revenues and endowments of the church, with the numbers of the clergy, monks, nuns, and servants connected with the religious establishments. The details he gives, like the evidence of the existing churches and the remains of the disused ones all over the country, quite support his statement that the church was possessed of three-fourths of the property of the state. Another writer, continued Dr. Bronson, says that the property of the church included about 900 rural estates and 25,000 blocks of city property. When this property was confiscated and sold, the church authorities warned all good Catholics not to invest in it. The result was that it went at very low prices and fell into the hands of those who cared nothing for the religion of the former owners. The church people probably see by this time that they made a mistake. Had they allowed Catholics to buy the confiscated property, they could have got it back again into their own hands with very little trouble and at a small valuation. Dwelling houses, shops, and all sorts of ordinary buildings, along with the rural estates and the convents, have been sold for secular purposes but the church edifices proper are permitted to remain in the hands of their former authorities, and services go on there without interruption. The laws of the Reform allow freedom of religious worship, and a Catholic has the same protection as the adherent of any other faith. Were there any Protestant churches in Mexico before the laws of the Reform were proclaimed? Fred asked. No, was the reply. The Catholic Church did not permit them to exist any more than the Puritans allowed a Quaker in their midst, in the early days of the Plymouth colony. Human nature is the same all the world over, and any religious body that has supreme control of a country is pretty certain to exercise its power. You know the old explanation of the difference between religion and superstition? What is that? Religion is what we believe, superstition is what others believe. The boys laughed and said they had heard the definition before. Then the doctor continued. The laws of the Reform tolerated all religions and guaranteed freedom of public worship. During the Mexican War, our army was followed by Cole Porters, who distributed tracts and did other religious work. They followed the example of the priests who accompanied Cortes, but unlike them, they did not succeed in converting the population. Missionary work was begun by the American Baptists in 1863 and followed shortly after by the Methodists, Congregationalists, and Presbyterians. There was much opposition on the part of some of the priests, and in several instances their ignorant followers were incited to hostility. You must remember that the Mexican priests are not as intelligent, taken as a body, as the Catholic priests of the United States, and understanding this, you will not wonder at the open hostility displayed towards all other forms of religion. In the early days of the Protestant missions, the missionaries in Mexico entered upon their duties at the risk of their lives. In 1872, a missionary and his wife settled in Guadalajara. During the first few weeks of their residence in the place, they were stoned whenever they appeared on the streets. 
the governor came to their aid, and in time the prejudice against them wore away. In November of the same year, another missionary, Reverend John L. Stevens, settled in Ahualuco, a town of 5,000 inhabitants, 90 miles from Guadalajara, and began his work. On the 2nd of the following March, at 2 o'clock in the morning, his house was attacked and he was murdered with a brutality which could not have been excelled by Apaches or Sioux. One of his converts was killed at the same time, and others barely escaped with their lives. There have been other martyrs and many cases of persecution. Hostility has not ceased, but it is greatly diminished, and the Protestants have obtained a foothold in Mexico. There are not far from 300 Protestant congregations in the country, with 15,000 communicants and 30,000 adherents. There are about 100 foreign missionaries, many of them accompanied by their wives, as many more ordained native ministers and twice that number of unordained native helpers. There are many day, Sunday and theological schools which have been established by the missionaries, and there are printing establishments which are sending out religious batter for all who are willing to read it. There are more than 50 church edifices, some of them built expressly for the purpose, the others being old structures, altered for Protestant use. In closing this talk on religious matters, Dr. Bronson remarked that it would take many years for the quarrels between the Church Party and the Liberals to come to an end, but in the meanwhile, Mexico would continue on her progressive way, and all her friends, of whatever creed, would be encouraged to hope for the best results. End of chapter 8 Chapter 9 of The Boy Travellers in Mexico This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Richard Stibbard The Boy Travellers in Mexico by Thomas Wallace Knox Chapter 9 From Querétaro to the city of Mexico is a distance of 150 miles. The route of the railway lies through a region which is excellent, both for agriculture and stock raising. Frank and Fred wished to stop at one of the cattle haciendas, but the doctor said they would have an opportunity to see one of these establishments at a later date. So they continued to the capital without making a halt after leaving Querétaro. They crossed the plain of the Casadero, which obtains its name from an incident of the conquest. About the year 1540, the Indians organized a great casadero, hunt, on this plain, to show their good will towards the first viceroy, Don Antonio de Mendoza. A great number of them assembled, and the game was driven in from all directions and duly slaughtered by the viceroy and his friends. Hunts of this sort are of very ancient date. They are practiced by Aborigines in all parts of the world, and even civilized man does not disdain them. Of the civilized class are the kangaroo hunts in Australia, elephant hunts in Ceylon and India, and the chase of wolves and other noxious animals in the western states of North America and in the Siberian provinces of Russia. At the edge of the plain of the Casadero, the train reached the foot of the mountain chain that surrounds the Valley of Mexico. The locomotive breathed heavily as it ascended the slope, dragging its burden behind it. The speed was materially reduced from that by which the plain had been traversed, and the reduction showed very plainly that the grade was steep. Every turn in the road gave a picturesque view, and the youths thoroughly enjoyed their ride towards the famous valley. The top of the ascent was reached at Tula, of which we shall have something to say later on. Then the train entered a gorge which Frank and Fred specially wished to look at. It was the Tajo de Nochistongo, the great Spanish drainage cut, which was intended to save the city of Mexico from inundation. From the windows of the car they shuddered as they looked into the cut, and wondered if never an accident had happened from the falling away of the earth. The cut is twelve and a half miles in length, and is the work of human hands, not of nature. The railway enters the valley of Mexico through this cut, and the track is laid on a shelf or bench along its sides, and high above the bottom. Our friends visited it a few days later, 
and we will here include Frank's account of what he saw and heard. The city of Mexico stands in a valley which has no outlet, the water that accumulates from the rains being evaporated by the heat of the sun or absorbed in the volcanic soil. The city is in the lowest part of the valley and is therefore liable to be overflowed whenever the evaporation and absorption are not sufficient to carry off the water that accumulates. There are several lakes that cover a tenth part of the area of the valley. The lowest of them is salt, as it has no outlet, but the others which discharge into it are fresh. This salt lake is called Tezcoco. It has an area of 77 square miles, and its surface ordinarily is only two feet lower than the level of the Plaza Mayor, or great square of the city. In the days of the Aztecs, the lake surrounded the city, but it is now three miles away from it, owing to the recession of the waters. Lake Chalco is three and a half feet higher than Tezcoco, while Zompango, the most northerly of all the lakes, is 29 feet higher than the Plaza Mayor. The lakes are separated by dikes, some of which were built by the Aztecs before the arrival of the Spaniards, but the greater number are of more recent construction, as we shall presently see. Now it is evident that an unusual flood of water could raise Tezcoco so that it would flood the city, and this is what has happened on five different occasions, in 1553, 1580, 1604, 1607, and 1629. The last inundation continued for five years and caused an immense amount of suffering and loss. The city was covered to a depth of three feet, and the waters were finally carried off by an earthquake, which allowed them to run away through the crevices that it formed. Here's where we come to the history of the Great Cut of Nochistongo. The Spanish government consulted all the celebrated engineers of the day, and they presented numerous plans for draining the city and keeping it out of danger from inundations. Enrico Martinez presented the plan which was adopted. It was to drain Lake Zumpango so that its waters would not be poured into the Texcoco but would run to the Gulf of Mexico by way of Tula. For this purpose, he proposed to make a tunnel through Nochistongo to carry off the superfluous water of Zumpango, or rather of the river Cuatitlan, which flows into it. The tunnel was commenced in November 1607, but when completed it was found insufficient to drain the lake and a new plan was needed. A Dutch engineer was then brought in, and he naturally proposed a system of dikes, similar to those of his own country, and the dikes already built by the Aztecs. He was allowed to carry out his scheme until the arrival of a new viceroy in 1628. The new viceroy would not believe the accounts which he heard of the floods that had occurred, and he ordered Martinez to stop up the tunnel and allow the waters to take their original course. He was soon convinced of his error and ordered the tunnel to be reopened. It was reopened and continued in use until the following June, when Martinez found that it was being destroyed by the pressure of the water, and he therefore closed it to save it from ruin. A disastrous flood followed, and this was the one that lasted five years. How did the people get around in that time? Fred asked. They were forced to use boats, was the reply. But the getting about was the least part of the trouble caused by the flood. Most of the houses were of adobe, and these soon crumbled and fell. The loss was so great that the Spanish government ordered the site of the city to be changed to higher ground, but on representations by the city council of the value of the permanent structures, which would thus be rendered useless, the order was countermanded. The city was restored after the subsidence of the waters. It has been threatened several times since, but though it has been in great danger, the cut and the dikes have saved it. But how about the making of the tunnel into a cut? They put Martinez in prison as soon as the flood came, and he was kept there for several years. Then it was determined to change the tunnel into a cut, and he was released and put in charge of the work. It took 150 years to make it, and though nominally finished in 1789, it has never been entirely completed. Thousands of Indians died during the work of digging this enormous ditch. It was the greatest earthwork of its time, 
and in fact the greatest down to the cutting of the Suez and Panama canals. Here are the figures. Length of the cut, 67,537 feet. Greatest depth, 197 feet. Greatest breadth, 361 feet. The original tunnel of Martinez was four miles long, 11.5 feet wide and 14 feet high. Portions of the old tunnel, or rather of its ruins, are visible today. There is a monument to the memory of Martinez which was erected a few years ago in one of the public squares of the capital city. It might possibly console him for his five years in prison if he could only come around and look at it. As Frank paused, Dr. Bronson took up the subject and said that even with the waters of Zampango drained away, there was still a liability of the overflow of the lower lakes. He added that numerous projects had been proposed. Some engineers were in favour of drying up Tezcoco altogether by turning away the waters that flow into it. Others advised draining the waters into a lower part of the valley, if such could be found and others again proposed a long and large tunnel through the mountains at so low a level that Tezcoco and the city could be thoroughly drained. To this should be added a canal from the upper lakes to flow through the city and wash out its sewers. What will be done about it? No one can safely predict, the doctor remarked. The city is badly drained. Its sewage is only partially carried away, and such of it as the water removes is accumulated in Lake Tezcoco, which is becoming dirtier and more shallow every year. No plan has been proposed that has been pronounced successful, or to which there is not a serious objection. Of course, almost anything could be done with unlimited money, but Mexico, like other cities and countries, has a limit to the amount that might be expended for any given purpose. The smells that greeted the nostrils of the youths on their arrival at the capital convinced them that the drainage of Mexico is little better than no drainage at all. Frank remarked that if it were anywhere else than in the very high region where it is, 7,602 feet above the sea, it would have no need of drainage as all the inhabitants would die of pestilence. Emerging from the famous earth cutting, our friends had their first view of the snowy peaks of Popocatapetl and Iztaccíhuatl, the great volcanoes which lie to the east of the city of Mexico. They had read and heard much of these famous mountains, and had formed many mental pictures of them. To the credit of the volcanoes, it is proper to say that they fully came up to the expectations which had been formed of them. The train sped on over the comparatively level region of the valley. For several miles, the Mexican Central Railway lies parallel to the Mexican National Line, and as there happened to be a train on the other track, the passengers had the exhilaration of a race as a concluding feature of their journey. They had left Queretaro a little before noon. It was seven o'clock in the evening when the train rolled into the Buena Vista station outside the city, and the journey over the Mexican Central Railway came to an end. Dr. Bronson had telegraphed for a courier from the Hotel del Jardin to meet them at the station, and the man was there in accordance with his request. The key of one of the trunks was given up to meet the requirements of the local custom house, after the manner of the octroi of Paris and other continental cities. Our friends had found this regulation at all the towns where they had stopped on their route but the trunks had invariably been passed without being opened on the assurance that they contained no merchandise. The Hotel del Jardin proved to be quite satisfactory so far as the rooms were concerned, but there was not much to be said in favour of the supper to which the travellers sat down, after removing the dust from their garments and making themselves generally presentable. The boys ascertained on inquiry that the hotel was built around the garden of an old convent, and that a portion of it was really the convent edifice. Some of the rooms are the former cells of the monks, and the youths concluded that the monks were very comfortably lodged. If all stories, or even a quarter of those that are told, are true, the Mexican monks had an easy life of it when ever so inclined. No one doubts that there were many honest and conscientious men among them, but there is also little, if any, room for doubt that a great many men entered the monasteries with hardly a spark of religious feeling about them, 
solely for the purpose of getting a living without working for it. The number of idlers among them was fully equal to the proportion to be found in the ministry of the Church of England. A union of church and state, whether Protestant or Catholic, is certain to develop a large number of adherents who live in idleness at the expense of others and bring discredit upon honest and zealous workers. During their stay in the city of Mexico, our friends found that it was the better plan not to stipulate to take their meals in the hotel where they had their rooms. They breakfasted, dined and supped wherever they pleased, and found the arrangement very satisfactory. In this way they tried all the restaurants, from the most pretentious to those of the second and third grades, and found the experiment an interesting one. Here are Fred's notes upon hotel life in the capital. We have visited all the hotels and find them pretty much alike. As far as we can ascertain, we could not improve our condition by changing from the Hotel del Jardin, and so have concluded to stay where we are. We have dropped somewhat into the fashion of the country. You know we always do so when it is at all possible, but not altogether. We rise about six in the morning and have chocolate and a roll or two at seven, and then we go out sightseeing, shopping, or write letters until eleven when we have almuerzo, which is a solid meal corresponding to the French déjeuner à la fourchette. So far, we are in the line of the Mexicans. This is their only solid meal. And late in the day they have chocolate and some light refreshment, just before going to theatre or opera. We have so long been accustomed to at least two meals a day that we take a second one, similar to the almuerzo, somewhere about six o'clock. They tell us that it would not have been easy to obtain this second meal ten or fifteen years ago, but so many foreigners have come here of late that the restaurants are accustomed to it, especially those patronised by foreigners. They tell some funny stories about the hotel customs here. One is that the advance agent of an excursion party went to a hotel and asked the price of rooms. Two dollars a day was the reply. I have a party of sixty people, said the agent. What terms will you make? It will be two dollars and a quarter a day for each one, said the landlord. Sixty people will make a great deal of trouble. Another story was told by a gentleman who came to the city some years ago and met a friend who had arrived one day before him. They left together, and when they came to settle their bills, the one who came first, and had been there fourteen days, was charged for two weeks at ten dollars a week, twenty dollars. The other was charged two dollars per day for thirteen days, twenty-six dollars. He protested, and in reply to his protest, the landlord explained that when a patron was there fourteen days or more, he was allowed weekly terms, but under fourteen days he must pay by the day. Stay here another day, said the landlord, and your bill will be twenty dollars. Very well, the stranger answered. I'll hold my room till tomorrow. But as I have the money in my hand, I may as well pay you now. The landlord accepted the money, made out a bill for twenty dollars, and receipted it. But when he found the gentleman was really going away immediately, he protested that the stranger would not be entitled to weekly rates unless he actually occupied his room that night. All the chambermaids here are men. We have an Indian mozo to look after our rooms, and have not seen a woman about the house since we came here, either as housekeeper, chambermaid, or laundress. On each floor there is a muchacho, who takes care of the keys and is supposed to be responsible for the safety of our belongings, and I'm glad to say we have lost nothing during our stay. The mozo and muchacho both expect a financial remembrance, and so do the waiters in the restaurants. Their expectations are very reasonable, and they receive their gratuities with a quiet dignity that is far preferable to the manner of the attendants of hotels and restaurants in London or Paris. The almuerzo, which I mentioned as the heavy meal of the day, is so important that the business houses and banks close from noon till half past two or three o'clock, when everybody is taking breakfast, dinner, and supper all in one. It is necessary to transact in the forenoon any business that you have to do, as it is not at all certain that men will get back to their offices again in the afternoon. The leisurely ways of the Mexicans are not at all satisfactory to the impetuous citizen from the northern states of the Union. 
The prices of the restaurants seem to us not much, if any, behind those of Europe and of New York and Chicago. The table d'hôte dinner at the best restaurants is one dollar, and sometimes more, but we have found a restaurant, the Café Anglais, where the head waiter speaks English and the manager seems to be specially desirous of attracting American custom. At this restaurant the charge is one real for the seven o'clock breakfast of chocolate and bread, and five reals for the eleven o'clock breakfast. Dinner is five reals, and all three of the meals are furnished for thirty dollars a month or one dollar a day. Of course, we do not want board by the month, nor to go among Americans, whom we did not come here to see. We have been eating Mexican dishes at the Fondas, and for four reals have had excellent meals. Fonda means restaurant, and fondita means café. Fonda also means hotel, and a hotel for travellers only. There is another kind of hotel or inn for horned cattle and horses, as well as for human beings. Establishments of this kind are called maisones or posadas. Bright and early on the morning following their arrival, the youths were out to see the sights of the Mexican capital. They did not wait for the early breakfast, but on hearing the bell from a neighbouring church tower, they sallied forth in time to see the streets filled with people on their way to morning mass. Fred made note of the fact that women seemed to be very much in the majority, and he was not surprised to learn afterwards, in conversation with the gentleman who resided in the city, that religion in Mexico has its greatest hold upon the women. The men are negligent of, or as a general thing, indifferent to, religious subjects, said his informant, and were it not for the women of Mexico, the church would have very little hold upon the population. The ladies were in mantillas, which are the rule of society for morning mass, though not for promenades at later hours of the day. Since the influx of foreigners in the last decade or so, the fashions of Mexico have undergone a change and steadily approached the Parisian. But the mantilla still holds its place for morning mass and will probably do so for a long while. Of course, the priests might change it if they desired to do so, but they are opposed to innovations and were, speaking generally, bitter opponents of the railway and telegraph. The mantilla is a very becoming outside garment for a pretty woman whose brunette complexion harmonizes with what she wears. Frank and Fred carried with them for hours, if not for a longer period the recollection of some of the faces that came within the range of their vision on that morning walk. They were frequently accosted by the sellers of crucifixes, rosaries, and other things appertaining to the religion which was represented by the people on their way to Mass. Evidently the morning is the best time for these vendors to dispose of their wares, and they endeavour to make the most of it. Rather incongruously, these dealers in sacred things were jostled by the sellers of lottery tickets. These gentry pursue their avocations at all hours and in all places and are very persistent. They offer to sell you the ticket that will be sure to draw the highest prize and in every way possible exercise their ingenuity to persuade you to buy. The tickets are of all prices and can invest much or little according to his means and inclination. Frank investigated the subject of lotteries in Mexico and found that they were a regular institution of the country. In fact, they are to be found in pretty nearly all the countries of Spanish America. The government gives charters to certain associations and very often runs the lottery itself. The profits are large and the government makes a handsome revenue from the business. The sale of tickets amounts to about $3 million a year in Mexico and after deducting the value of the prizes and the expense of conducting the enterprise, the net revenue to the government is not far from $800,000. Frank did not invest in the lottery, but he went to witness one of the drawings. It took place in public and seemed to be perfectly fair. The numbers were drawn from the boxes by blind boys, who were brought from one of the hospitals for the blind and were accompanied by the professor in charge of that institution. Sometimes, when a blind boy or man cannot be easily obtained, the drawing is made by an Indian who cannot read, and he is carefully blindfolded, so that there can be no suspicion of fraud. Judging by the large attendance at the drawing, it is evident that the lottery is very popular in Mexico. 
Nearly everybody seems to speculate in the tickets, and when a drawing is made and the lucky number announced, there is intense excitement. There is an old adage that lightning does not strike twice in the same place. It would seem as if the proverb should be reversed, as the story goes that Signor Manuel Garcia, the owner of a hacienda near Manzanillo, won the highest prize in the Grand National Lottery three times in succession. Flower sellers were out in goodly number when the youths took their morning walk, and the wares they offered were fresh and attractive. We have already seen the fondness of the Mexicans for flowers, as shown in Monterey and elsewhere in the north. The city offered no exception to the rule, and the size and beauty of the bouquets, combined with their low price, were calculated to astonish the visitors. For twenty-five cents, Frank bought a bouquet, which he sent to Dr. Bronson's room. It was about two feet high and the same in diameter, and was composed principally of roses of a dozen varieties. While Frank was paying for his purchase, Fred sniffed at it, and was surprised to find that in spite of their beauty, the roses had hardly any perfume. On inquiry, he learned that this was the case with nearly all flowers in the Valley of Mexico, and was supposed to be due to the rarity of the air. We had some difficulty at first, said Fred, in finding our way about the city, for the reason that the names of some of the streets change at each block. This plan, which is very annoying to a stranger, and even to a resident, is being given up, and they told us that in a few years they hoped to abandon it altogether. Just think what New York or Boston would be with such a system as this. End of chapter 9Chapter 10 of The Boy Travellers in Mexico This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Richard Stibbard The Boy Travellers in Mexico by Thomas Wallace Knox Chapter 10 In Paris, said Frank in his notebook, the Church of Notre Dame is the first object of interest to the stranger. In Vienna, he goes first to St. Stephen's, and in Rome to St. Peter's. So, in the capital of Mexico, we go first to the cathedral. It is a magnificent building, and would do honour to any of the capitals of Europe. The spot where it stands is historic. The Spaniards destroyed the Aztec city that stood here, and built their own upon its ruins, and where now stands the cathedral, the Teocalli, or Temple of the Aztecs, was formerly to be seen. It is saddening to think of the rivers of blood that flowed here in the sacrifices which the Aztecs deemed necessary to their religious exercises. The historical authorities say generally that 60,000 persons were slaughtered in a single year on the altars of the great Teocalli of Tenochtitlan, the Aztec city that stood here and was destroyed by the Spaniards. Most of them were prisoners of war, but when there was not a sufficient supply of prisoners, the Aztecs themselves were chosen for sacrifice. The Spaniards may have shown great cruelty in their treatment of the people they conquered, but they did well to put a stop to this terrible shedding of blood in the name of religion. The Teocalli was a pyramid of earth, faced with stone, and is said to have been 150 feet in height. Steps led up and around its sides, and they were so arranged that in mounting to the top the pedestrian made a complete circuit of the structure. On the summit was the sacrificial altar, and this is supposed to have been very nearly where the centre of the cathedral is at present. The sacrificial stone from the Teocalli is now in the museum. It is shaped like a millstone, is three feet high by nine in diameter, and is elaborately carved on the sides and upper surface. There is a bowl in the centre, and a gutter leading from the bowl to one side to permit the flow of blood from the victims. But we are wandering from the cathedral in considering what preceded it. The Teocalli was destroyed and the materials were used for filling up the neighbouring canal. Then a small church was erected, and followed by a larger one. And this again was removed in 1573 to make room for the present cathedral which was completed 94 years later at an expense of $2 million. 
It stands on the eastern side of the Plaza Mayor and is a very conspicuous object in the panorama of the city. Like most Catholic cathedrals, it is in the shape of a cross, its greatest length being 426 feet and its greatest width 200 feet. It is 175 feet high and its towers rise to a height of 200 feet. We ascended to the top of one of the towers and advise all visitors to the city to do likewise as they will have from it one of the finest views in the world. As we looked from the tower, we agreed with Bishop Haven that never did a city have such an environment. The whole city lay below us, spread out like a map. There are a few chimneys in Mexico, and consequently there was no smoke to mar the view, and we readily traced the streets and avenues, stippled with the green of the squares and gardens that abound so numerously. We looked over the plains and down upon the lakes, and then our gaze swept at the mountains that surround the valley in a jagged chain that covers nearly two hundred miles of distance in its girdling course. The snow-covered peaks of Popocatapetl and his sister and companion, the white woman, seemed to rise higher than we had before seen them, and added a solemnity to the picture in addition to that which it already possessed. North of the city rises the hill on which is built the Church of Guadeloupe, and on the west is that of Chapultepec. As we looked on the latter, we thought of the heroic attack upon the fortress by the American army in our war with Mexico, while the former secured our respect as one of the places which are sacred in the eyes of pious Mexicans. The two million dollars which I mentioned as the cost of the cathedral were for the walls alone, at one time the wealth of the church in silver and gold and costly pictures was something almost beyond calculation. But it has been repeatedly plundered and the aggregate work of the despoilers has stripped off much of its magnificence. But even now it is very rich and as long as peace continues is likely to remain so. There are six altars, fourteen chapels and five naves. There are paintings by famous artists of Spain and there is a balustrade around the choir which is said to weigh 50,000 pounds and is so valuable that the church authorities refused an offer to replace it with a balustrade of solid silver of equal weight. The balustrade was made in Macau, China, and is of Tambago, a composite of silver, copper and gold. It was brought to Acapulco and transported thence on pack mules to this city. We visited the chapels in which the remains of some of the great men of Mexico are buried, notably the chapel of San Felipe de Jesus, which contains the tomb and monument of the unfortunate Iturbide, the first emperor of Mexico. On the monument he is called the Liberator, and we are told that his birthday is remembered and honoured as it justly deserves to be. We haven't yet told you who Iturbide was. He was born in 1783, his parents having come from Spain shortly before his birth, and settled at what is now Morelia, in Mexico. He became a soldier and fought in the wars against the revolutionary movements in the first fifteen years of the present century. In 1816 he went into private life, having been dismissed from the service in consequence of quarrels with men high in power. Then he began to dream of securing the independence of Mexico. And when the revolutionary movement became general in 1820, he joined it. He was soon at the head of the army. The revolution succeeded. Independence was acknowledged and Iturbide was proclaimed emperor, May the 18th, 1822, and crowned on the 21st of the following July. But peace did not follow his coronation. There was a new revolution with Santa Ana at its head, and Iturbide was forced to abdicate the throne and leave the country. He went to Italy and afterwards to England, but in 1824 the desire to regain his crown led him back to Mexican soil, where he had been proclaimed a traitor and an outlaw. He landed at Soto la Marina on the 14th of July and was arrested. Five days later he was shot by order of the military commander. As he fell, he assured the multitude that his intentions were not reasonable, and exhorted them to religion, patriotism, and obedience to the government. And here his body rests, the judgment upon his conduct 
having been long ago reversed. His grandson now lives in Washington. Maximilian, being childless, chose young Iturbide, the grandson, to be his heir to the throne of Mexico, but there is little likelihood that he will ever ascend its steps. The atmosphere in Mexico does not seem favourable to imperial plants. In the days of its glory, the high altar of this cathedral was the richest in the world. There were candlesticks of solid gold upon it. They were so heavy as to make a load for a strong man, and some were so large that the strength of one man was not sufficient to raise them. The other ornaments and appurtenances of the altar were of corresponding richness and value, some of the crosses, pyxes, and censers being studded with diamonds, pearls, amethysts, sapphires, emeralds, and rubies. There was a statue of the Assumption, which was of gold set with diamonds, and is said to have cost more than one million dollars. It is gone, and so is a lamp, which was valued at seventy thousand dollars, and with them many other things of great value have disappeared. Someone says that it cost one thousand dollars to clean that famous lamp, but the revolutionary troops cleaned it out for nothing. The balustrades of Tombago remain undisturbed, possibly because the real value of that metal was unknown at the time of the looting of the cathedral. Like Catholic churches everywhere, the cathedral is always open, and men and women come here for prayer whenever opportunity offers, in addition to their attendance at Mass. In nearly every chapel we saw one or more kneeling figures. All classes meet here on common ground and the poor Indian may be seen worshipping side by side with the richly clad and jewelled lady whose family is of the purest blood of Spain. On great festivals the church is crowded and the mingling is most indiscriminate. At such times pickpockets are said to abound, and they manage to steal handkerchiefs and purses while kneeling devoutly at the side of those whose possessions they covet. Mexican thieves are quite adroit, and some of their performances are, professionally considered, worthy of the highest praise. Before leaving the cathedral, we inspected the famous calendar stone of the Aztecs, which is in the base of one of the towers. Fred will tell you about it. My business is now with the churches. Frank added to his notes that in addition to the cathedral, there were 46 large churches in the city, all of them broad and high, and ornamented with domes or towers. One, the Sagrario, adjoins the cathedral, and is connected with it by a large door. Its façade is richly, and, as Frank thought, rather grotesquely carved. One of the most fashionable churches is the Profesa, which is crowded during Lent with the ladies of the best society, all arrayed in solemn black in accordance with the church-going custom already mentioned. Our friends went there, and also to the church of San Fernando, which is near the cemetery, and is the resting place of most of the illustrious men of Mexico. Generals Miramon and Mejia, who were shot with Maximilian, are buried there. San Fernando also contains a monument to President Juarez, which is considered one of the best works of modern sculpture. It was made by Manuel Islas, a Mexican sculptor. The monumental group is in a small Greek temple, and represents the dead president lying at full length, with his head resting on the knee of a feminine figure, which represents Mexico. Dr. Bronson and the youths paid a visit one morning to the church, where the remains of Cortes the Conqueror rested at one time, and by many are supposed to be resting today. It was the desire of Cortes, in case of his death in Europe, to have his bones transported to the New World, they were brought to Mexico in 1629 and rested quietly in this church for nearly 200 years, when they were secretly removed, through fear that the tomb would be violated by the revolutionists, who had a bitter hatred of everything Spanish. They were first placed in another part of the church, and then sent to Italy, where they now are. From present indications, the Mexicans are not likely to ask for their return. When we left the cathedral, we gave a glance at the Aztec calendar stone, which Fred was to describe to us. Listen to his account. The Aztec calendar stone, writes Fred, is exceedingly interesting. 
both from its historic character and as a work of the sculptor's art. Some say the name is incorrect and that the stone is not intended for a calendar. We will not enter into the dispute, but accept the name by which the antiquity is best known. It is of circular shape, 11 feet in diameter, and is said to weigh 25 tons. A great deal has been written about this stone, and there has been a wonderful amount of speculation and theory concerning it. I haven't space or time to consider everybody's story, and will take that of Signor Cervero, who, as we are told, is one of the best authorities, if not the best of all. Signor Cervero says the stone was engraved in honour of the sun, and for this reason it is often called the Stone of the Sun. According to this gentleman's account, the stone was made in the reign of King Ashayakatl, about 1479 of our era, and was originally placed horizontally in the Temple of Mexico. When the temple was destroyed by Cortes after the conquest, the stone lay for a while in the Great Square. It was buried about the middle of the 16th century and remained beneath the surface of the plaza until 1790, when it was unearthed and placed where it is now to be seen. Here is what Signor Cervero says of the meaning of the sculpture on the stone. The face in the centre is the god-star throwing his light on the earth, which is represented by the tongue protruding from his lips. He has the pupils of his eyes turned upward, and they are seen through the sacred mask that covers the upper part of his face. The hieroglyphics on the diadem encircling the head represent the division of time and the Mexican method of numbering the years. The civil year, like ours, was 365 days. Each four years had different emblems repeated successively, without reference to other chronological arrangements. The first year was called Toctl, or Rabbit, the second Acatl, or Reed, the third Tepatl, or Flint, the fourth Kai, or House. In addition to these periods, the years were arranged by the number of thirteen, four of such periods making fifty-two years, or a Mexican age, when the festival of fire occurred. This was a most serious event for the Mexicans, as the priests taught the people that the world might come to an end, and terrible demons would descend from above and eat up mankind. The two claws on the dial at the sides of the mask represent computations of numbers, for which the hand was used in a sort of deaf and dumb alphabet. The large V-shaped ornaments denote four equal divisions of the day, and the smaller ornaments of the same shape indicate the division of the day into eight parts. The ornaments lying between the Vs represent eight divisions of the night. The twenty ornaments in panels in the circle inside the Vs are symbols of twenty days, or one Mexican month. The rest of the stone is differently interpreted by different writers, but they generally agree that it represents the relations of the months to the year and the years to the Mexican cycle. And here is a good place, said Fred, to make some notes about the Aztecs. Properly speaking, they were only one of the tribes or nations that occupied the plateau of Anahuac or Mexico at the time of the conquest by Cortes. They migrated from the north, the aggregate time consumed in their migrations being nearly 200 years, and finally settled in the Valley of Mexico, at a spot where they saw an eagle sitting on a cactus and with a snake in his beak. This eagle and cactus have been adopted as the symbol of Mexico and are seen on the national flag and on the coins. The Aztecs found the valley occupied by the Toltecs, who had been there for several centuries. They made war on the Toltecs, took possession of the country, and proceeded to build a city on the site of the present capital. It was called Tenochtitlan, Cactus on a Stone, and the foundations were laid about A.D. 1324. Lake Texcoco was then much higher than it is now, and the new city was surrounded by water and greatly resembled Venice in the abundance of its canals. It could only be approached on narrow causeways, and there was a fleet of boats on the lakes, which prevented attack by water. With this stronghold as a base, the Aztecs gradually conquered all the surrounding people, so that they had possession of the entire valley at the time of the arrival of Cortes. One of the tribes of the Aztecs was called Mexicans, from Mejí, their chief. 
This tribe seems to have become more powerful than the rest, though originally it ranked as the seventh. It gave the name to the whole people, and from the people the name passed to the country. If you think the Aztecs or ancient Mexicans were a barbarous people, look at some of their laws and customs. They had a complete system of laws, and they had courts in all their cities and towns to administer the laws. They had inns along the roads for the free accommodation of travellers, and bridges or boats at the crossings of rivers. Creditors could imprison their debtors. Slaves about to be sold might free themselves by seeking refuge in the royal palace. And treason, embezzlement of taxes, and any crime against the person of the sovereign would cause the death of the offender and all his relatives to the fourth degree. Slander was punished by cutting off the lips or ears, and death was the penalty for robbing in the market, altering lawful measures, or removing the legal boundaries of land. Prisoners of war were devoured, enslaved, or offered as sacrifices, and there were two sorts of prisons, one for debtors and others not charged with capital crimes, the other for condemned criminals and prisoners of war. They had no beasts of burden, and when Cortés landed with the few horses that he brought on his ships, he struck terror to the hearts of the people, who had never seen such an animal. All burdens were carried on men's backs, and they had towers erected along the principal roads for forwarding the king's dispatches. These towers were about six miles apart, and couriers were always standing ready to receive messages, which were brought from the last tower or station by a man running at the top of his speed. Letters were carried three hundred miles in a day by this method. This system is almost identical with that of the great Khan of Cathay, as described by Marco Polo, except that the Khan had his post stations only three miles apart instead of six. I think I hear you ask something about their language and how they wrote. Well, they had no written language like ours with letters and words, but they had a picture writing, in which everything was represented by drawings and paintings. They had records of this sort of all their history, and their books and papers would have filled a large library, but they were burned by the Spaniards, who thought it a sin to allow these pagan documents to exist. Only a very few of the picture writings preceding the conquest have been preserved. When Cortés landed on the coast of Mexico, a full account and description of his ships and men were sent to the king by means of these pictures. The Aztec picture writings have a remarkable similarity to the hieroglyphics of the ancient Egyptians, and some writers believe that the Aztecs are the lost tribes of Israel, who wandered to America and brought the Egyptian form of writing with them. That will do for the present about the Aztecs, said Fred. If you want more, you must wait a while till I take breath. Fred made a sudden descent from the 16th to the 19th century, and as he closed his notebook, he suggested a stroll to the Grand Plaza. Frank assented, and away they went. It was the hour when fashionable people were out for their daily airing, and the display was well worth seeing. There was a flower show in the Zocalo, a garden in the centre of the plaza. It is not a relic of the conquest, but of very modern origin, as it was laid out by Maximilian, who had a good eye for the beautiful. Many persons complain of the Zocalo, as it partially obstructs the view of the cathedral. Frank and Fred found the flower show very interesting, not only on account of the floral products which they saw, but also because of the artistic arrangement of the bouquets. Some of the bouquets contained strawberries and other small fruits on account of the contrasts of colour, and there were many bunches and baskets with little flags, on which were mottos, patriotic, sentimental, and otherwise so that all reasonable tastes could be accommodated. There was a band of music playing, and the fashionable population seemed to have assembled in the Zocalo to see and be seen. Not the least interesting part of the show was the crowd of promenaders. The ladies were in the fashions of Paris, perhaps six months after the date of their issue in the French capital, and every young lady was accompanied by her duenna, an elderly woman, who never for a moment left the side of her charge, and scarcely removed her eyes from her. Fashionable, young, middle-aged, and old men were there, but the younger seemed to be in the majority. 
Some of them wore the national costume, the trousers and short jacket, ornamented with silver buttons and the broad-rimmed sombrero, covered with silver braid and embroidery. Others had adopted the walking costume of Europe, and from the number of these it was evident that the old fashion is dying out. Frank and Fred thought it a pity that such should be the case, as the Mexican dress is picturesque and certainly distinctive of its wearers. Some of the ladies wore the mantilla in combination with their Parisian dresses, while others had adopted the French bonnet, with all the delicacy of trimming that adapts it for fine weather only. From the Zocalo, the youths wandered to the shops along one side of the square, where they lingered for some time among the curiosities which were exposed for sale. The first thing to attract their attention were the famous feather pictures which are made by the Indians, exactly as they were made in the days before the conquest. The secret of this work has been handed down from father to son, and is known in its perfection to a comparatively small number. We saw some feather pictures, said Frank, that were marvels of beauty and skill. The brilliant plumage of the paroquet, hummingbird, trogon, and other members of the ornithological family of Mexico is used for this work, and the colours are as skilfully blended as are the pigments of an accomplished painter. Considering the time required for their production, these pictures are wonderfully cheap, and we have bought several to send as curios to our friends at home. The ancestors of the feather artists of today made the famous feather cloak of Montezuma, which excited alike the admiration and the cupidity of Cortés and his companions. End of chapter 10 Chapter 11 of The Boy Travelers in Mexico This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Betty B. The Boy Travelers in Mexico by Thomas Wallace Knox. 11. Fine as is the artistic taste of the Indians of Mexico today, it is far behind that of the people whom Cortez found there. According to history and tradition, their work in the precious metals surpassed that of any of the goldsmiths of Europe. They fashion gold and silver into the shape of plants, birds, fishes, and quadrupeds, and their imitations were marvelously correct in all their details. All this art seems to be lost, with the exception of the working of silver filigree, which still holds high rank. Cortez sent to Spain some exquisite specimens of Aztec work in gold and silver, and the cupidity of the king, impelled by the necessities of the government, put all these precious works of Occidental art into the melting pot, the resort of the modern burglar when he wishes to remove the trace of his depredations. All through their journey in Mexico, the youths had been impressed with the little figures modeled out of wax or clay, representing the various people of the country and their occupations. These statuettes are made by uneducated savages with hardly any tools, colored with native pigments and baked in the sun or in primitive ovens. Water carriers, porters, muleteers, mozos of all names and kinds, flower sellers, beggars, street peddlers, basket makers, all and many more are represented. The figures are generally covered with cloth tinted of the appropriate colors, but if not so tinted, the colors are wrought into the plastic material of which the figure is composed. Our young friends bought a goodly supply of these figures and had them carefully packed for transportation. Fred thought they were fully equal in artistic design and workmanship to any of the figures they had seen in Japan, China, or India representing the trades and occupations of the Far East. Mention has been made of the pottery of the Guadalajara Indians, which is wrought into a great many fantastic forms. These Indians have great ability in portraiture. They will model in a wonderfully short time a statuette of an individual, either from life or from a photograph. An enterprising American once planned to take some of these people to the principal cities of the United States and Europe and open an establishment for the manufacture of statuettes of individuals at ten or twenty dollars each his project was not carried out 
for the reason that the Indians refuse to leave their homes. The native Mexican is averse to changing his residence, and it requires a great inducement to take him away from his native soil. The women show unusual dexterity with the needle, and their embroidery equals that of the natives of India and other eastern lands. They display great industry and patience, and while seated in the marketplace beside the wares they offer for sale, their spare moments are generally devoted to stitching. In no part of the world where we have been, said Frank, have we found a more musical people than the natives of Mexico. They catch on to a tune or air with great readiness, and gentlemen who live here tell us they have known Indians to sing a common melody through without a mistake after hearing it only once, and this too when they have no scientific knowledge of music, or even of its first principles. They learn readily to play upon musical instruments, and a street band can be organized and trained in less time than a street band in any other part of the world. Some of these bands are composed of boys of about 15 years of age, and their performances almost invariably excite the admiration of musical strangers. We are told that the government is encouraging the musical tastes of the people by giving free instruction to pupils in the National Conservatory of Music and supporting them during their studies by small allowances of money. We have heard of pupils that came on foot for hundreds of miles to be musically educated in the capital. In order to secure admission to the conservatory, they must pass an examination similar to that of musical schools in other parts of the world. Mrs. Gooch, the author of a book on Mexico, mentions two girls who walked from Querétaro to the capital to present themselves as pupils in the conservatory. She says she heard them sing selections from Italian opera, and the sweetness, strength, and range of their voices were far beyond the average, and produced a profound impression upon the audience. Speaking of girls, said Fred, reminds us that Mexican children of both the upper and lower classes treat their parents with the greatest respect, and set an example that the children of the United States might do well to follow. They remind us of Japanese and Chinese children more than of any other we have seen, and are very much unlike the little folks of English-speaking countries in this one particular. Since we came into the country, whenever we have seen a badly behaved child, we have found that he belonged to a foreign family. Old people are invariably cared for by their children, who would suffer all sorts of privations rather than have their parents want for anything they can possibly provide. Having seen and described the Aztec calendar stone, Frank and Fred were naturally drawn to the National Museum and to the sacrificial stone, which has been mentioned and is one of the great attractions of the place. It is a block of porphyry, said Fred, like a huge millstone, three feet high and ten feet across. All around the sides are relief figures representing captives being held by the hair of their head. There are fifteen of these groups, and they are said to represent fifteen victories gained by one of the emperors over his many neighboring states. A symbol in the corner of the panel of each group shows what city or state is represented. The stone was made about the year 1486 of our era, but its complete history is unknown. Tizoc was the emperor whose deeds the stone commemorates, and it is sometimes called Tizoc stone in consequence of this fact. The stone of sacrifice is sometimes confounded with the gladiatorial stone, which was generally placed in the courts of the temples and was the scene of a gladiatorial combat. Mr. Charnay in Ancient Cities of the New World says the captive, if a man of distinction, was tied to this stone and allowed to fight with several opponents in succession, and if he succeeded in defeating them all, he was permitted to escape. They took good care not to let this happen very often, as the numbers were against him, and furthermore, he had only a wooden sword ornamented with feathers, while his enemies had weapons of obsidian, which were sharp as steel. When he was vanquished, as he generally was, he was immediately stretched on the gladiatorial stone or on the stone of sacrifice. A wooden collar was placed across his neck to prevent his struggling, and five priests held his head and limbs. 
then a sixth priest who wore a scarlet mantle opened the breast of the victim with a sharp knife of itzli or obsidian tore out the heart held it up to the sun for a moment and then cast it at the feet of the divinity to whom the temple was dedicated while this was going on the multitude knelt in adoration of the divinity the body of the victim was thrown down from the stone to the people by whom it was divided to be served up at their feasts the difference between sacrifice on the gladiatorial stone and the stone of sacrifice was that the latter was on the top of the temple where everybody could see it while the former was in the court of the edifice and only accessible to a select few the same authority continued fred tells us that the mexicans were very punctilious about this ceremony even when they were the victims of it a soldier when captured was reserved for sacrifice he would consider himself disgraced and would rather suffer death than be liberated except after a gladiatorial combat there is a story of a chief who was captured and taken before montezuma he had a high reputation as a warrior and on learning his name the king treated him with honor spared his life and offered him his liberty the chief refused the offer and demanded that he should be devoted to the gods according to custom after trying in vain to have him change his mind montezuma ordered that the chief should be tied to the stone and permitted to fight with some of the king's best soldiers while the king himself accompanied by his officers should witness the combat the chief killed eight men and wounded twenty but he was finally overpowered and carried off to be sacrificed to the war god Witzilipochtli. but you haven't said what these knives were with which the priests killed their victims frank remarked as fred paused what is obsidian it is a mineral substance replied dr bronson to whom the question was referred and is formed by the cooling of the lava from a volcano when lava cools it forms into obsidian and pumice everybody knows what pumice stone is obsidian is a substance hard enough to scratch glass and is capable of taking a high polish and a keen edge the mexicans called it itzli and used it for making knives razors arrow tips saws and other implements did they have a knowledge of any of the metals besides gold and silver they had no knowledge of iron but they made use of copper and knew how to temper it so as to make it nearly as hard as steel they used it for many of their implements but they also had great skill in the use of implements of stone flint obsidian and other minerals they knew about lead and tin but made little use of them copper being their only metal for making into tools knives scissors and hatchets of copper were abundant bernal diaz who accompanied cortez mentioned six hundred hatchets of copper that were paid to the conqueror as tribute by one tribe of natives there are scissors in the mexican museum which are said to contain tin copper lead and platinum and humboldt says the peruvian indians made use of a similar alloy in making scissors and other implements frank and fred thanked the doctor for the information they had received and then turned to contemplate the statue of the god of war to whom the brave chief just mentioned was sacrificed it is a hideous statue said fred about ten feet high and appearing at first glance to be composed of heads and hands it was found in the great square not far from the calendar stone and after close examination we found that it had a skirt of snakes it was also called the god of death and this significance is shown by a skull which is sculptured near the center skulls and snakes were favorite objects of adoration with the mexicans if we are to judge by the frequency with which we find them displayed it is said that there was a wall around the principal temple of tenochtitlan composed of colossal heads of snakes carved in stone some of these have been found and are preserved in the museum there is a coiled serpent there covered with feathers instead of scales it is carved in stone and is a very creditable piece of sculpture they called our attention to a figure which is called the indio trist or sad indian it seemed to us that the name was not justified as the indian was anything but sad mr brant's mayor thinks this figure was set on a wall or battlement and held a candlestick or the staff of a banner in its hand 
it was found in the year 1828 on the street that is now called Calle del Indio, Tris, in commemoration of the discovery. Another interesting object was the shield of Montezuma, which has upon it the feather work for which the people are famous, and also his cloak of the same material. It is evident that the feather workers, wonderful as they are, have degenerated since the time of the conquest. They used to make feather cloth, and we have seen such curiosities in the shape of scarfs, serapes, and rebozos ornamented with feathers, and said to be very old. They make none of these things now, but confine themselves to pictures on cards where the feathers are made to adhere by means of paste or wax. Each feather is handled separately, and none of the skin is ever applied to the card. You can give them a design and they will fill it up very quickly. Well, perhaps we have tired you out among the curiosities of ancient Mexico, and we will turn to more modern things. We could spend hours among the weapons which illustrate the warfare of the ancient Mexicans, and also the implements that reveal their domestic life and ways. Some of the Aztec picture writings, which we have already mentioned, are to be seen in the museum and after what we had heard of them, we found them very interesting. One of the specimens preserved here is supposed to represent the migrations of the Aztec tribes. Among the modern objects is the standard raised by Hidalgo in 1810, in the revolution which ultimately resulted in the independence of Mexico from Spain. The gun, handkerchief, and cane of Hidalgo are also shown, together with other mementos of that hero. Then there are a portrait of Cortez and the standard which was carried at the head of his columns in the conquest of Mexico, and there are the armor of some of his companions and portraits of the successive viceroys that ruled the country by authority of the King of Spain. Maximilian has been repeatedly brought to our minds by the relics of his ill-fated reign. Here is his table service of silver, and they tell us that the metal is not solid, but plated. The Mexicans consider it typical of the plated empire which he undertook to set up in America through the aid of the charlatan emperor Louis Napoleon. His state coach is also preserved and shown to visitors. Evidently it is highly prized as the doors of the room where it is kept are always locked and a fee is required to open it. The vehicle is the finest in America and it even surpasses, so it is said, the state carriages of many of the imperial and royal establishments of Europe. It is lined with white silk brocade, and the trimmings are of heavy silver thread. The wheels are so thickly gilded that you might suppose them to be of solid gold, and the body of the coach is dark red in color. The harness is in keeping with the coach, and altogether the vehicle makes an interesting show. We are told that Maximilian negotiated large loans in England to set up his empire here, and that the debt he incurred forms one of the financial burdens now resting on Mexico. From the museum, our friends went to the palace, which occupies the eastern side of the Plaza Mayor, and is said to be the largest building in the city. Before the conquest, Montezuma's palace stood on the site which fell to Cortez when the conquerors drew lots for the possession of the city of Tenochtitlan or rather the place where it stood. Cortez erected a building here which remained until 1692, when it was destroyed in a great riot, and the present palace was begun. It has been added to from time to time, so that it now is neither symmetrical nor handsome. Several departments of the government, including the presidency, are located in the building, and its great extent renders it of decided utility. We went through the palace in charge of a guide from the hotel, wrote Frank in his journal, and found it well worth the time and trouble of a visit. In one respect, it reminded us of the capital of Washington, as it seemed to be the resort of office seekers, claim agents, lobbyists, and all that sort of people, which every resident of Washington knows so well and so numerously. They were in all the patios and in the corridors in all directions. We asked how many rooms there are in the palace, but nobody whom we asked could tell us, and after repeating the question several times, we gave it up. Some of the rooms are magnificently furnished. They represent, to a certain extent, 
the varying fortunes of mexico under different rulers one room called the hall of iturbi has its walls hung in crimson damask and displays the eagle and serpent of mexico this room is not far from the hall of the ambassadors the largest room in the palace it is over three hundred feet long but is narrow in proportion to its length in this hall we saw portraits of the principal heroes of the mexican war of independence together with portraits of juarez diaz and other presidents they are mostly by mexican artists some being well and others badly painted at the end of the hall is a painting twenty five feet long by ten in height representing the great battle of puebla of may fifth eighteen sixty two when the french were so completely defeated the battle commonly mentioned in mexican history as the cinco de mayo it is by miranda a native artist and though it is not a fine specimen of painting it is a correct representation of the ground on which the battle was fought at least so a gentleman says who has personally visited it the scene illustrated in the battle is the turning point when a regiment of ragged indians from Hawaka came into line drove back the french and gave the victory to the republicans this battle is regarded as the waterloo or gettysburg of the french in mexico it sealed the fate of maximilian's empire and re-established the republic speaking again of maximilian reminds us of a room which is on a corner of the palace so that it has two windows at right angles this was his favorite apartment and in the latter part of his reign he used to pace its floor for hours an english visitor says he could look from it two ways at once though not the way to hold his throne one window looks upon the marketplace and the other on the plaza mayor the room is now the storage place of relics no one seeming to care to put it to any other use from the palace to the pawn shop may not seem a very natural step though frank said it had probably been taken by more people than would be willing to acknowledge it dr bronson and the youths took this step at the city of mexico and it was not a very long one either the monte de piade is not far from the national palace it corresponds to the famous mont de piete of paris and is in most of its features analogous to that french institution here is what fred learned about it it has been in operation for more than a hundred fifty years and was founded by count de regia don pedro toreros whose intentions were purely philanthropic he endowed it with three hundred thousand dollars in the hope of relieving the poor and those in temporary need of money from the oppression of the empeños or ordinary pawn shops according to the rules of the institution the depositor gets one-third the estimated value of his goods at an interest varying from three to twelve and a half per cent per annum he must renew his tickets every eight months and when he ceases to pay interest upon his loans the goods are kept for seven months and then offered for sale at an appraiser's valuation if there is no offer for them in one month the appraisement is reduced and then they are offered for another month the performance is repeated monthly for six months and then the goods are sold at auction if they do not bring as much as the appraised valuation the appraisers must make up the deficiency out of their own pockets anything and everything of any value may be pawned here and the vaults have contained at different times money jewels and precious metals sufficient to endow an empire not all the property here stored has been pawned many valuables are brought here for safety as the place is a sort of fortress in its way and most carefully guarded they showed us through the vaults where the diamonds pearls rubies and other precious stones are kept and we saw more of these costly baubles than we have ever looked at before in a single hour we glanced through vaults where pictures of silver plate watches clocks porcelain and kindred things were stored and there were taken to the money vaults which at times have contained millions of dollars in silver and gold the monte de piedad was until a few years ago a regular banking institution and its notes were good as gold all through mexico its credit was impaired by the withdrawal of its reserves by the government and its banking business received a severe blow money is not loaned on real estate or on anything else that cannot be deposited within its vaults 
they tell us that a foreign merchant once came here to borrow money for business purposes and was accompanied by two friends who were to endorse his paper and go his security the official into whose hands they fell said the establishment would make the loan at the usual rates but before completing the transaction he showed the securities the room in which they would be locked up until the note was paid we did not ask further particulars but presume the loan was not made the profits of the bank formerly went to the church but latterly they have been used for establishing branches elsewhere in the city and all over the country the monte de piedad is a national institution and of great value to the people one dollar is the smallest amount loaned and the largest is ten thousand dollars and the loans are said to average large and small about sixteen dollars each the number rarely falls below two hundred loans in a day and sometimes rises to two thousand about one-third of the articles deposited in the bank are never redeemed sales of clothing are held on certain days of the month of precious stones on other days and of pictures and statuary on others while we were looking through the room devoted to sales dr bronson saw an article which he desired and he at once offered to buy it at the price which was marked upon the card attached to it i must first offer it for sale said the official in charge of the place the law requires that i shall do so so he held up the article and asked if anybody present would give more it happened at the time that there was no one in the room but ourselves and the officials of the bank the chances of any other offer were not great as neither frank nor myself was likely to make a higher bid after a brief pause he handed the article over to dr bronson and received the money rather i should say he received the money and handed over the article as the bank does not let anything out of its possession until the cash has been paid into the proper hands end of chapter eleven chapter twelve of the boy travellers in mexico this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit LibriVox.org. recording by a fine voice the boy travellers in mexico by thomas w knox chapter twelve we have been much impressed and amused said fred in a letter to his mother with the mexican or rather the Spanish forms of politeness. Whenever we are introduced to anybody, he immediately says, Remember that your house is at number blank on blank street, notwithstanding that we may have told him we are comfortably quartered at the hotel. In one day, a dozen or twenty houses were offered to us, and ever since then, if no more than two or three are tendered between sunrise and bedtime, we think it is a very poor day for business. Sometimes the form is varied by saying, my house and all it contains are yours. It would be better if they would send us the title deeds to the establishment with a bill of sale of the furniture acknowledged and receipted before a notary. But thus far, nobody has gone as far as that. It is a form of politeness and nothing more, the youth continued, and the people who offer us their houses are about as sincere as Americans are when they say, delighted to see you or happy to meet you, to the people they are introduced to in their own country. Or is the New York hostess who says to a departing guest, Must you go so soon? When she has really been wondering to herself why the visitor tarried so long. It seemed very odd until we got used to it and learned the real meaning of the words, to be told on entering the dwelling of a man we had not known five minutes, You are in your own house. Or that we were the masters and he was the humble guest. Dr. Bronson says, they really mean to have us make ourselves at home, and they certainly show great hospitality. But it would be a sad mistake to take them literally and act as though the place belonged to us. Every time we admire anything, a piece of furniture, a garment, an article of jewellery or bric-a-brac, or anything else of value, we are immediately told that it belongs to us, and if it is portable that we can carry it away with us. If we should be so boorish as to accept the offer, the person who made it would not display any annoyance, however much he might feel. He is too polite for that. What would they do under such circumstances, I hear you ask? I can best answer by telling a story we heard yesterday. 
An English lady who had just arrived and had not learned the forms of Mexican politeness one day admired a set of jewellery, which included a very costly necklace of diamonds and other precious stones that had belonged to the family for two or three hundred years. She was told that the set of jewellery was hers, and believing they meant what they said, she took it away with her when her call was ended. Of course the story was at once told to the friend who had made the introduction, and the latter at once went to the guileless stranger and explained the situation. She returned the jewels immediately with the explanation that, on reaching home, she had found they did not match the dress with which she expected to wear them. She added that she had a fine set of jewellery, which she thought would be an appropriate present for one of the young ladies of the family, and she would send it with great pleasure. A polite message was returned declining the offer, and hoping it would be in the power of the family to render the English visitor some distinguished services during her stay in the city. In this way the whole difficulty was bridged over, and the parties were good friends. A similar story was told us regarding an American lady who visited Mexico several years ago and, through her ignorance of the local forms of politeness, accepted the offer of a rare and beautiful shawl. Mutual friends arranged the matter amicably, but the fair American was greatly mortified when she learned the mistake she had made. My house and all it contains are yours. Dr. Bronson says there used to be a harmless lunatic in San Francisco and afterwards in New York who went about the streets dressed in the old continental costume. With his long and snowy hair and quaint costume, he was a noticeable figure. He was under the belief that he resembled Benjamin Franklin, and he used to exhibit a photograph representing himself standing at the base of the Franklin Monument in Boston. His passage by steamer was paid from San Francisco to New York by some friends, and during the voyage the vessel spent a day at Acapulco. Uncle Freddy as he was called, went on shore with other passengers and was introduced to the governor. The governor made him the usual offer of his house and everything it contained, and when the hour came to go on board the steamer, the recipient of the offer refused to accompany the other passengers. He declared that the governor had given him the house and he was going to remain and enjoy it for the rest of his life. Explanations were useless, and after vainly trying to induce him to change his mind, the passengers seized Uncle Freddy and carried him bodily in their arms to the boat, which lay in readiness to take them to the ship. It was necessary to lock him in his room until they had left their anchorage and were steaming outside the harbour. Seeing and being seen. Of course you will naturally infer that the Spanish people are insincere in their politeness, and certainly appearances are against them. But they do not mean anything by it any more than the people of the United States do in their polite ways of speaking. There is this difference that we do not go as far as the Spaniards in saying empty words, and that is about all. Dr. Bronson says there's a good deal of hollowness in society everywhere, that people could not get along at all together, and there would be no society at all if everybody spoke exactly what he thought at all times. Think what would happen if Mrs. Smith should remark to Mrs. Brown when the latter is leaving the house after a prolonged visit, I'm glad you're going, you've stayed too long instead of saying and acting exactly the reverse. And think too what would happen if Mr. Jones, on being introduced to Mr. Robinson, should say, I don't care a straw whether I know you or not, instead of glad to make your acquaintance, or something of the sort. The Marketplace, City of Mexico One of the attractions of the Mexican capital is the marketplace. There are several mercados, or markets, in the city, the principal one being the volador, which is close to the National Palace, and overlooked, as already mentioned, by one of the windows of the room which was Maximilian's favourite apartment. History says it was for a long time the property of the family of Cortez, as it happened to be on a portion of the land which he secured at the division of the spoils of conquest. For nearly two hundred years the city paid rent to the heirs of the conqueror, and only in comparatively recent times bought the site and now owns it in fee simple. Frank and Fred visited the marketplace several times during their stay in the city. In fact, it was one of their principal sources of amusement. They were never tired of studying the ways of the natives who throng the place and offer their wares for sale, and they realized the force of what they read in one of the descriptions of Mexico, that the markets had changed very little since the days of Montezuma and the Aztec rule.
Interior of a House near the Marketplace. Here is what Bernal Diaz wrote of the market as he saw it in 1519. We were astonished at the crowd of people and the regularity which prevailed, as well at the vast quantities of merchandise which those who attended us were assiduous in pointing out. Each kind had its particular place, which was designated by a sign. The articles consisted of gold, silver, jewels, feathers, mantles, chocolate, skins dressed and undressed, sandals, and great numbers of male and female slaves, some of whom were fastened by the neck, in collars to long poles. The meat market was stocked with fowls, game, and dogs, vegetables, fruits, articles of food ready-dressed, salt, bread, honey, and sweet pastry, made in various ways, were also sold here. Other places in the square were appointed to the sale of earthenware, wooden household furniture, such as tables and benches, firewood, paper, sweet canes filled with tobacco mixed with liquid amber, copper axes and working tools, and wooden vessels highly painted. Numbers of women sold fish and little loaves, made of a certain mud which they find in the lakes, and which resembles cheese. The makers of stone blades were busily employed shaping them out of the rough material, and the merchants who dealt in gold had the metal in grains as it came from the mines, in transparent quills, and the gold was valued at so many mantles, or so many exequples of cocoa, according to the size of the quills. The entire square was enclosed in piazzas, under which great quantities of grain were stored, and where also were shops for various kinds of goods. Mexican Bird Sellers The description of the market by Bernal Diaz, wrote Fred in his journal, would answer very well for today, so far as the appearance of the sellers and many of the buyers is concerned. They bring the produce of their farms and gardens to market just as they brought it before Columbus discovered America, and the chief difference today is that slaves, gold, silver, feathers, and some other things named by Diaz are not now offered for sale. The Indians bring fowls and vegetables just as of old, and in the same way, in baskets carried on their shoulders, or on those of their family. Since the introduction of the railway, some produce comes to Mexico by train, and in course of time the old custom may disappear, but it will not do so in a hurry. View on the canal. There is a canal from the lake to the city, wrote the youth, and it comes directly to the marketplace, so that the natives bring their boats close to where they sell their wares. Much of the dealing takes place on board the boats or close to them, and the crowds that gather around while a bargain is in progress are very interesting. Some of the shops and stalls are at the very edge of the canal, so that the prows of the boats stick in among them, and you realise what a serious matter it would be to the market people if by any accident the lake and the canal should be dried up and disappear. The whole system of local supply would be radically changed, and until a new order of things could be established, the inhabitants of the capital might run the risk of starvation. The busiest day of the market is on Sunday, and the noise of the place is almost deafening. The ordinarily silent Mexican becomes very voluble in the marketplace when there is a prospect of making something by talk. The description we have given of the market of Monterey will answer for this one, with the exception that you must multiply everything by ten or twenty, and add several things we did not see there. One part of the market is devoted to the sale of coffins. They are made on the spot and had a specially sombre appearance to us, as they are all painted black. The shops in which they are made are in a narrow alley, and the workmen engaged in the dreary industry seemed as unconcerned as did the makers of furniture or picture frames. We hired a canoe and took a short ride on the canal. Its banks are low and marshy. They are devoted to the culture of vegetables, and the gardens had a luxuriant appearance, as though the soil was prolific. The lake, as before said, is brackish and shallow. Formerly it contained the famous Shintanampas, or floating gardens. But when we asked for them, we were told they did not now exist, though the name is retained. We will say more about them later on. Disappointed in one of the objects of our journey, we settled down to an enjoyment of the sights of the canal, but our pleasure was a good deal marred by the number of smells the boatmen stirred up from the bottom. Resident on the banks of the canal. How old the canal is, nobody can tell. 
It was in use long before the conquest, for when Cortés came here, the boats of the Aztecs were plying on its waters, and he observed the activity of the local commerce when he walked along the banks while he was the guest of Montezuma. There are little villages near the canal. They are the homes of the people who till the gardens and supply the markets of the city with vegetables and with grass for horses and other quadrupeds. Sunday Diversions at Santa Anita To see the Chinampas, it was necessary to go to Santa Anita, or better still, to the lakes, Xochimilco and Chalco. Santa Anita is a sort of Coney Island without its ocean, a place of recreation for the middle and lower classes, especially on Sundays and feast days. We went there on a weekday, when it was comparatively quiet. A gentleman who lives here says that on Sunday, the place is crowded with people, all bent on amusing themselves. The first thing they do on arriving is to deck themselves with wreaths of poppies and other flowers, which are sold for next to nothing, and grow here in great abundance. After obtaining a supply of flowers, they dance, drink pulque, eat tamales and other Mexican delicacies, and have a thoroughly good time as they understand it. There are other villages of the same sort farther along the canal, but they are not so well patronised by the Sunday excursionists as Santa Anita. We seem to take our lives in our hands in starting on our journey to the lakes, as we had a scene with the boatman at the bank of the canal, which was anything but agreeable. We had been told that we ought not to pay more than two dollars for a boat for the entire day. The men began by demanding five or six dollars, and as all talked at once, and each tried to persuade us to patronise him, and leave the others to look elsewhere for patronage, we had an active time for a while. The men would not abate their demands, and we walked away. Then they reduced their figures, and after ten or fifteen minutes spent in bargaining, we secured a craft. It was about twelve feet long and four wide, flat-bottomed, had an awning over the centre where we could sit in the shade, but could not stand erect, and was propelled by means of two boatmen, working poles in the bow. They pushed with their poles against the bottom or sides of the canal, and thus sent the craft along, at the same time stirring up the mud and several dozens of vile smells. We met and passed other boats of the same kind, and also small chalupas, or canoes, containing one or two persons, and resembling narrow dugouts more than anything else. Then we met cargo boats of various kinds, some piled high with grass, and others with heaps of baskets, or sacks in the centre, and propelled by several men, who patiently pulled the craft along. Crew of a cargo boat. Frank made a sketch of the crew of one of the cargo boats at their work, while going forward they carried the poles horizontally above their heads. On reaching the bow of the boat, each man fixed his pole in the mud at the bottom, and then rested his shoulder firmly against the upper end. This done, he walked slowly aft, thus propelling the boat, and as one set of men went aft, while the other was going forward, the boat made steady progress through the water. Dr. Bronson said it was a reminder of the navigation of the Mississippi before the days of steamboats. Shinampas or Floating Gardens The Shinampas as they exist today are in the neighbourhood of Santa Anita and along the sides of the canal all the way to the lake. The ground is low and marshy and in ancient times was probably a part of the lake or of the great body of water that covered most of the valley. The Shinampas are masses of vegetation, reeds and bushes covered with soil above and they are so loosely fastened they rise and fall with the changes of the height of water. They are said to have been formerly drifted about by the winds and waves, and were then really shinimpas. Now they are made fast by means of poles, and their owners know where to find them. An excellent description of these marvels is to be found on page 159 of Mr. Brocklehurst's book, and we take the liberty of copying it. When a tract of vegetation, composed of reeds, water plants, and bushes, interwoven and laced together, becomes so dense that it will bear a superstructure, strips of turf 20 to 30 yards long by 2 yards wide are cut from some suitable firm place, floated to it down the canal and laid upon it. This is repeated several times and thus an island is securely raised 2 to 3 feet above the level of the water. A little soil is spread over it and it becomes a shinampa or floating garden on which Indian corn, vegetables and flowers are grown. 
The gardens vary in size from one to two hundred feet in length, and from twenty to a hundred feet in width, according to the nature of the vegetation which supports them. The lakes Chalco and Yochimilco are covered with this sort of vegetation. The lakes have a varying depth of from ten to fifteen feet, and to secure the gardens in their proper places, long willow poles are driven through them into the ground below, where they soon take root. The poles also throw out roots into the bed of the floating gardens, and so hold them steady. It is said that thieves pursued by soldiers or the police have been known to dive under these chinampas and come up on the other side. Any enterprising citizen of the United States who thinks of coming to Mexico for a life of crime would do well to become an expert swimmer and diver before venturing into this country. Peon's house on a chinampa. These gardens become firm enough in a few years to support men, dwelling houses, and even horned cattle and horses, although the water continues to circulate freely beneath them. The government taxes the inhabitants or owners sufficiently to pay the expense of maintaining an inspector and several assistants. The chinampas are separated by narrow canals, and the duties of the inspecting party are to keep the canals free from weeds and see that the islands are properly fastened so that they cannot drift about with the wind. We may add to the story of the youth that at the time of the conquest there were thousands of these chinampas, and they annually paid a good revenue to the Aztec authorities. The Valley of Mexico appears to have been more densely peopled at that time than it is today, as every inch of solid earth was tilled to its fullest capacity, and the necessity arose for utilizing the marshes and also the surface of the lakes. In the days of Cortes, the floating gardens covered Lake Texcoco, but as time has gone on they have disappeared from that brackish sheet and are now practically confined to the two lakes we have mentioned and the canals leading to them. Cactus growths near the hill of Estrella. Our young friends kept a sharp watch for the hill of Estrella and there was a good-natured rivalry between them as to who should be the first to discover it. Frank was the fortunate one in this instance for he caught a glimpse of the conical peak while Fred was looking in the wrong direction. It is of porphyritic sandstone and about 500 feet in height. The sides are steep in some places and here and there it is possible to discover some of the old masonry which converted the hill into a huge teocalli like the pyramid of Cheops. Rock inscriptions made by ancient Aztecs. The modern village is at the base of the hill and there the youths landed and engaged horses to carry them to the summit. The view is quite extensive and shows a wide area of lakes and valley and the mountains that engirdle them. But they would hardly have made the ascent of Estrella for the view alone. It was rather because the place has an ancient fame and was at one time the most sacred in Mexico. We have mentioned elsewhere, said Frank, that the Mexicans had ages or cycles of 52 years and at the end of each cycle they had an unusual ceremony the Festival of Fire, which was not repeated till the end of another cycle. Well, this hill was the scene of the ceremony, which was held on the evening that the constellation of the Pleiades approached the zenith. According to Prescott's history of the conquest of Mexico, a procession of priests on that evening led a noble victim, a captive of the highest rank, to be sacrificed on the hill of Estrella. For five days previous, the people had extinguished all their fires in their temples and dwellings, broken their idols, and given themselves up to despair, as they were taught that the world was coming to an end. After the Pleiades had passed the zenith, the victim was slaughtered, and a new fire was kindled, by the friction of sticks in his wounded breast. Then couriers stood ready with torches, which were lighted at the new fire, and from the hill of Estrella it was carried all through the kingdom. For thirteen days following this event there was general festivity everywhere and the festival of fire may be considered the national carnival of the Aztecs. Frank and Fred were naturally eager to ascertain what kind of fishes were to be found in the lakes and they learned in a very practical way. Near Estrella they saw some men fishing with rod and line and at their suggestion one of the boatmen obtained some of the fish which proved to be a species of trout. They were not more than three or four inches long, and in order to cook them, the boatman made a charcoal fire in the bottom of his craft. The fish were fried on the coals, 
and were remarkably fat and juicy. The youths thought they had not in a long time tasted anything so delicious, but the doctor reminded them that they were hungry, and since early in the morning had been out in the open air. Home scene near the lake. There are several varieties of fish in the freshwater lakes of the Valley of Mexico, but in the salt or brackish Lake Texcoco there is only one kind, and some people think he is not entitled to be called a fish. He is shaped like one, but has four legs and a long eel-like tail. He belongs more properly to the lizard family than to that of the fishes, and is a disgusting object to contemplate. He grows to about ten inches in length. Frank thought he should go hungry a long time rather than eat of this reptile, who is called axolotl in the Aztec tongue, and ajolote by the Spaniards. Does anybody venture to eat this creature? Fred asked. Certainly, answered his informant. The Indians eat its flesh, which resembles that of an eel. White men who have got their prejudice say it is toothsome, and many a stranger has devoured axolotl under the name of fried eel, and enjoyed it too. There's a great deal in a name, and in prejudice, was the youth's commentary, as he changed the subject to something else. That something was a peculiar article of food even stranger than axolotl. Its scientific name is Aguatlea Mexicana, and it consists of the eggs of a peculiar fly, which are deposited on the reeds and rushes growing in the shallow places along the borders of the lake. A traveller who visited Mexico two and a half centuries ago wrote of this substance as follows. The Indians gathered much of this and kept it in heaps, and made thereof cakes like unto brickbats, and they did eat this with as good a stomach as we eat cheese. Yea, and they hold opinion that this scum, or fatness, of the water is the cause that such great number of fowl cometh to the lake, which in the winter season is infinite. Custom has not changed in two hundred and fifty years. They sell these cakes like unto brickbats in the markets of Mexico today, and the Indians eat the stuff with good relish. It bears some resemblance to fine fish row, and after all, prejudice again being removed, and one being hungry, it is not bad eating. The Indians gather these insects by myriads and pound them into paste, which is afterwards wrapped in corn husks and forms an article of food second only to the one just mentioned. The laying capacity of the insect, which is about the size of an ordinary fly, is something marvellous, surpassing the abilities of the choicest fowls that ever were reared. A dead fly. You may judge how abundant these insects are, said Frank, when I tell you they settle down so thickly on the water that we thought they were shoals or mud banks. Fortunately for us, they didn't sting, nor did they even settle on the boat. In one of his letters to the king describing the country he had conquered, Cortes gave a minute account of the lakes in the neighbourhood of Tenochtitlan, and naturally mentioned the fact that they had no outlet. He solved the mystery of the disappearance of the waters by gravely declaring that there was a large hole in the bottom of Lake Texcoco by which the lake was drained. A century later, an engineer was sent from Spain to find the hole in the bottom of the lake. He made many surveys, but was unable to discover it, and finally concluded that the surplus water was carried off by evaporation. End of chapter 12、Chapter、13 All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Betty B. The Boy Travelers in Mexico by Thomas Wallace Knox. Chapter 13. One day, while Frank and Fred were strolling along the streets, observing the people in their ways, studying the architecture, and making other observations according to their custom, their attention was drawn to a young man. Who was walking slowly up and down in front of a house. His movements were so peculiar that Frank asked their guide what the man was about. Oh, he's playing the bear, was the reply. And what is playing the bear, I would like to know, the youth responded. He's making love, the guide explained. That's the Mexican way of courtship. This was a subject of special interest to the youths, as they knew their sisters and all the other young ladies at home 
would wish to know about it accordingly they proceeded to inform themselves concerning the mexican form of wooing and here is the result of their inquiries courtship in this country wrote frank is a serious matter and requires a great deal of patience young ladies are carefully secluded from anything more than the most formal acquaintance with young men and there is no such thing here as the freedom of social manners that we have at home when a young man has fixed his thoughts upon a fair damsel whom he has met at a party or to whom he has been introduced in the zocalo he begins his courtship by walking up and down the street in front of her house and keeping his eyes fixed on one of the balconies which he has somehow ascertained is the proper one for his gaze a hint has been conveyed to the young lady that he will be there and also to her parents and sisters this hint may be given by the priest who frequently serves as an intermediary by some relative of the young man or by means of a note sent to the young lady herself through the meeting of the portero or doorkeeper whose trouble must be paid for with cash in advance this promenading in front of the house is kept up for hours at a time day after day and also at night and what is called playing the bear it is generally done on foot but sometimes the lover appears on horseback the lady having been notified through the subsidized portero at what hour he may be expected the lover is observed by the lady and her mother and the other feminine members of the family who sit inside the window and are partially if not wholly screened from sight if the match is favored by the parents the bear business lasts only a month or perhaps two or three months but if it is not so favored the lover may keep it up for a long time or until he gets discouraged and withdraws his suit of course it happens here as in other countries that parental opposition occasionally develops the young lady's affection and then the young couple resort to all sorts of stratagems to exchange billets doux letters are raised or lowered by means of strings or transmitted through the hands of the portero already mentioned in the case of parental opposition the portero runs a great risk and consequently must be highly paid courtship under such circumstances is a luxury that only the affluent can afford when the proper time arrives provided everything is running smoothly the young man accompanied by a gentleman friend older than himself calls on the father of the girl and makes a proposal for her hand the father says he will see about it and the visitors take their leave the father asks the girl if she desires to marry the young man however much she may desire to do so she must profess indifference and say she cannot tell until she has met him then he is invited to call and when he responds he is met by the entire family including the servants after he becomes the novio official or accepted lover he has the privilege of calling without a friend but at no time is he ever left for a moment alone with the young lady all interviews must be in the presence of a member of the family or of a duenna no matter how long the courtship may continue after the formal acceptance as the time for the marriage ceremony approaches the groom has a serious matter to contemplate the matter o money connected with matrimony he must furnish the house and home and also buy the bridal outfit not infrequently the parents of the bride relieve him a part of the expense though they allow him to buy the jewels and bridal dresses one thing that he must provide according to a long established custom is an ivory covered prayer book whatever else he fails in he must not be negligent in this eight or ten weeks before the ceremony the pair must register at church giving their names ages etc very much as they do in some of the american states a similar registry is made at the civil office the bands must be published for five sundays and the bride must state before the priest and a notary that she marries of her own free will the civil marriage takes place a few days before the ceremony in the church and when the matter is ended the young couple are fairly launched into wedded life hadn't you better say something fred remarked about the ceremony itself that's hardly necessary replied frank as it is not much unlike the ceremony in all catholic countries and has been described over and over again there are some local customs however that may be worth noting 
For instance, a lady describes a wedding that she saw here in a church, where the groom passed several gold coins into the bride's hands, as an indication that she was to manage their financial affairs. But the chances are more than even that he did not permit her to do anything of the kind. When they knelt at the altar, a silken scarf was put around their shoulders and a silver cord around their necks to indicate their complete union. A cynical commentator might say, observed Fred, that the silver cord indicated that the couple was united by financial considerations. That's something I've nothing to do with, answered Frank quietly. We'll go on with our description, but it is said that marriages in Mexico depend more on social, family, or business matters than upon sentiment. After the church ceremony, he continued, there is a festival to which intimate friends are invited. Then the pair send cards to all friends and reasonably intimate acquaintances announcing their marriage, and the notice winds up with an equivalent for the at-home card of married couples in the United States and England. And one thing more, added Frank, while we are on the subject, a woman who never marries is not stigmatized as an old maid, as is often the case in the northern states. Nobody ever thinks of suggesting that she has never had an offer of marriage. The remark about her always is that she is difficult to suit, even though no man may ever have thought of showing her any attention. Of course you understand that in the marriage just described, I had the upper classes in mind. Among the common people, there is much less ceremony and formality. Marriages are generally arranged by the parish priest who conducts the principal part of the negotiations, and he has also a great deal to say on the subject among the middle or tradesman class. There is as much feasting and revelry as the parties can afford, and generally more than is prudent for them. Sometimes matches are made up by the parents of the young couple without any consultation with them. But as children in this country are obedient to their parents, they are very unlikely to make any opposition to matches thus arranged. Frank invested a real in a pamphlet called El Secretario de los Amantes, or to translate somewhat freely, The Handbook of Lovers. It is probably the most widely circulated book in the Mexican Republic, and is as popular among young people as is the complete letter writer among those whose education has not been all they could wish, and who have occasion for epistolary correspondence. The earnest attention which was given to this little work as soon as it fell into the hands of the youths led to a suspicion on the part of the doctor that Frank and Fred meditated a little love-making on their own account, by way of experiment, but so far as we have been informed, nothing of the kind occurred. Should any later information on the subject come to hand, it will be duly set forth in the second edition of The Boy Travelers in Mexico. The Secretario contains a code of cipher writing, forms for using numerals in place of the letters of the alphabet, symbols for each of the 24 hours of the day and night or the fractions thereof, and the one-hand alphabet for deaf mutes. The necessity for this alphabet in lovemaking and the practice that comes from it may probably be the reason why many Spanish Americans occasionally make signs in conversation instead of speaking in words. There are chapters of advice to lovers, and there is a full signal code for the use of the fan, the handkerchief, the sombrero, and the glove. Spanish women have long been famed for their skill with the fan and for the conversations they can conduct with its aid, and it has a very important place in the language of love. In most editions of the book, there is a separate chapter on the language of flowers and their various meanings accordingly as they are arranged or combined with others. A love story can be told in the skillful construction of a bouquet, at least enough of it to form the opening chapter. There is also a language of fruits, and Fred suggested that there should be one of tortillas, frijoles, tamales, and other articles of the Mexican cuisine. Here is a wide range, said he, for the author of El Secretario, provide each of the lovers with a thermometer, and then the temperature of a tortilla, as it is tossed into or out of a window, can be made to express a great deal. Forty degrees Fahrenheit might mean, my love is cold and 120 degrees would say, I'm sighing like the furnace. 90 degrees signifies, look out for the old gentleman, 
and one hundred would literally say i'm up to par the new edition of the book with the tortilla annex ought to sell like like hot cakes frank remarked and then the subject of matrimony was dropped the youths next considered the subject of the funeral a ceremony with which the church has quite as much to do as with weddings it was fred's turn to make an investigation and commit his information to writing and the following is the result of his efforts one of the odd things about funerals in this city wrote the youth is that they go by rail to the cemetery the enterprising manager of the street railways formed his scheme and then bought up all the hearses so as to compel the populace to adopt his plan there was opposition to it at first but a short trial showed that it was much more economical than the old system there is a good service of funeral cars and they are graduated to suit all purses that have any money at all in them the range of prices is from three to one hundred and twenty dollars for the lowest sum a single car drawn by a mule is supplied and for the highest figure one may have a hearse car gorgeously draped plumed and liveried drawn by a pair of black horses and with attendants appropriately liveried and of most solemn countenance the hearse car is followed by two and perhaps three cars containing the mourners friends of the deceased and others who go to make up the funeral cortege and these cars are as appropriately draped as the hearse ranging between the highest and lowest figures are half a dozen or even more outfits so that any desires can be met another curious custom is that poor people rent handsome coffins to be used during the funeral ceremony the body being transferred to a plain unpainted box as soon as it reaches the cemetery funeral cards are printed in the newspapers along with the advertisements and sometimes they have been inadvertently placed among the amusements they are also posted on the street corners and in other places where they can be seen and printed cards heavily bordered with black are sent to relatives and friends there is a fashionable card form for a funeral as much so as for a wedding and it would be a great social blunder to vary from the conventional style friends and relatives must respond to these cards and any one who has a large circle of acquaintance is obliged to write a good many notes of condolence in the course of a year when we first arrived in the city we were somewhat surprised at the large number of people in mourning until we learn that mourning is worn not only for relatives but for friends and there is a prescribed time for which it must be worn in each case suppose a schoolgirl's father or mother dies her companions put on mourning for fifteen days if the girl herself dies they go into mourning for a month the same rule holds throughout society and there is also a rule that when one visits a house where the family is in mourning the visitor must be costumed in mourning also the result is that fashionable people are in mourning for a goodly part of the year and a mourning suit or dress is a necessity for everybody's wardrobe it is not the custom generally for ladies to attend funerals but they send cards of condolence and make visits of pesame regret immediately after the ceremony families in mourning are secluded from society very much as in other civilized countries the old cemeteries which are now in the city limits are closed and no more burials can be made there they have a general resemblance to the cemeteries that we described in chapter twenty two of the boy travelers in south america those who can afford permanent burial for their relatives or friends take a perpetual lease of the niche where the corpse is deposited in such case the word propriedad is placed over the entrance along with the date when the entombment was made if only a temporary lease is taken the remains are removed at the end of five years to make room for a new tenant the bones are either buried in one of the new cemeteries or thrown into a pit where the bones of hundreds who once breathed the air and walked the streets of mexico are indiscriminately mingled the new cemeteries are laid out in modern fashion we visited those of campo florida and la piedad and saw some very tasteful tombs which indicated to us both the tender remembrance of the mexicans for their dead and the skill of the designers of the monuments we have also visited the english french german and american cemeteries all of them have recently increased their population with greater rapidity than formerly owing to the influx of foreigners 
in the american cemetery our attention was specially drawn to the monument which marks the resting place of four hundred soldiers who fell in the attack upon mexico the circumstance of their death being told by a brief description the english and american cemeteries are side by side and as time goes on it is probable that both will need additional ground a medical publication here gives the annual death rate of the city of mexico as about thirty seven in one thousand but it says that many indians come here from the lower lands and die of exposure and the effects of the rarefied air at this great elevation in one year recently there were thirteen thousand eight deaths of which five thousand five hundred seventy seven were males and six thousand four hundred thirty one females four thousand two hundred ninety two deaths were from pneumonia bronchitis and pulmonary and tuberculosis affections and there were one hundred seventy nine deaths from smallpox diseases of the lungs are dreaded and those who have resided here for any length of time take great precautions against them it is not considered safe to remove the hat in the open air for any length of time and a stranger should be very particular about venturing into a draft he should also take care not to emerge suddenly from a dimly lighted room to the dazzling sunshine the air at this elevation is very pure and the light is consequently strong we have been told that persons neglecting this precaution have become permanently blind frank and fred had learned before being long in mexico that there were many things to be avoided in the rarefied air of the valley or if not avoided they should be taken with caution ascending stairways or other laborious exercise at an elevation of seventy six hundred feet had to be done with deliberation and the least unusual exertion was sure to put them out of breath they were more sedate in their walking than in new york or other cities on or near sea level and as for running it was quite out of the question frank said he was sure that much of the traditional slowness of the people was due to their high elevation and the need of taking things easily yes replied fred that's probably why this is the land of manana the people don't like exertion and so they put off till tomorrow everything that can be postponed together with many things that have been positively promised for today if they had been in a more northerly climate said frank it is probable that the mexicans would be more advanced than we find them their location in the tropics has not been to their advantage the opening of our railways will connect them with northern climes and if we can fill the valley of mexico with our atmosphere it may enable them to breathe quicker than they do now the attention of the youths was turned from the elevation and atmosphere to some of the customs of the country which they had learned from their guide or from others they were told that it was estimated that about one-fifth the population was in household or domestic service in one form or another directly or indirectly the direct form would include those attached to a household the indirect those who supply water wood charcoal and other necessities of life or perform outside work for families or individuals the wages are low but a great many servants are employed so that the aggregate foots up to a large amount there are from ten to twenty servants employed in a house wrote fred and we are told that large establishments will have thirty or even more it is very much here as we found it in india a great number of people each with an allotted thing to do and a servant would risk losing his place rather than do anything that belonged to another here is a list he added that i have copied from the description of a mexican household by an american visitor portero doorkeeper cochero coachman lacayo footman cabalarango hostler mozo man of all sorts of work cargador public carrier camarista chamberman in a hotel or valet in a private house recamarera chambermaid in a private house ama de laves housekeeper mistress of the keys cochinera cook galopina kitchen girl pilmana nursemaid there are other servants such as the molendera the woman who grinds the corn for making tortillas the costurera sewing woman or the planchadora ironing woman the most important servant is the portero who has general charge of the house 
and sometimes of a large building in which several families live. He is the exact counterpart of the German doorkeeper, and like him generally lives with his family in a narrow retreat, which is situated so that he can command the entrance and observe who comes in or goes out. Servants do not change places as often as in England or the United States. It is by no means rare for them to spend their entire lives with a family. Their parents before them served it, and their children will do so when they themselves are gone. The cook receives from two to five dollars a month, and chambermaids and seamstresses the same. The men servants are paid from ten dollars a month upwards, and out of their wages they are required to buy part of their food, and in some cases all of it. At least this is a theory, though the practice is that the employer really supports them, though indirectly. Servants are nearly always in debt to their employers, and this state of affairs is encouraged by law, as they are not allowed to leave a place as long as they are in debt. The only way in which this can be done is for the employer to assume the debt, pay the creditor, and then collect the amount by holding back a portion of the servant's wages each month till the obligation is discharged. When Fred read aloud the foregoing account of the Mexican servants and their ways, Dr. Bronson suggested that he might add something about the lavanderas or laundresses. That's so, replied the youth. I had forgotten about them for the moment. Then he sat down and wrote as follows. Some of the houses have laundries where the washing is done, but many dwellings are not thus provided, and the clothes are taken outside to be cleansed. In the smaller cities, the washing is done on the banks of a stream or lake, the clothes being first put into a tub or box and soaked in water in which soap has been dissolved. Then they are pounded with sticks or stones and rubbed with the hands. The work is not done with gentleness, and a few trips to the laundry generally wear out garments made of ordinary material. Some of the lavanderas undertake to wash, starch, and iron the clothes, while others attend only to the washing and leave the other work as a separate contract with the planchadora. The employer is generally expected to furnish soap for washing clothes, and very often the servants are supplied with it for their own use in addition to their wages. End of chapter 13「Chapter Fourteen of the Boy Travelers in Mexico. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Betty B. The Boy Travelers in Mexico by Thomas Wallace Knox. Chapter Fourteen From Laundries to the Fine Arts is a Step from the Practical to the Aesthetic. After finishing their account of Mexican domestic service, Frank and Fred accompanied Dr. Bronson in a visit to the National School of Fine Arts, which is commonly spoken of as the Academy of San Carlos. It must not be understood that this was their first visit to this excellent institution. They had been there several times, and it was their intention to continue to look at the paintings in the Academy whenever they had an hour or two to spare. Within ten years after the arrival of Cortez, a college was founded in the city of Mexico by one of the Franciscan brothers, and to this college departments of music and drawing were attached. This may be considered the parent art school of Mexico, and from it is descended the Academy of Fine Arts as we see it today. No great progress was made in art matters until near the end of the 16th century, when a Spanish artist Sebastian Arteaga came to Mexico and was shortly followed by Vasquez and Echave, the last name being accompanied by his wife, who was an accomplished painter and is traditionally said to have been Echave's teacher. The 17th century brought several artists from Spain, and they did some good work. At the same time, native talent began to assert itself, and several artists and sculptors of Indian blood made for themselves lasting names. In the 18th century, the most noted artist, who was also sculptor and architect, was Tregueras, a native of Zelaya in the state of Guanajuato, on the line of the Mexican Central Railway, and he deserves more than passing attention. The Church of Our Lady of Carmen at Zelaya was designed by Tregueras, 
and is famous throughout mexico for its beauty and artistic proportions the tower and dome are especially the admiration of architects and artists and the whole effect of the structure whether in a near or a distant view is most agreeable the interior is adorned with frescoes and paintings in oil by trigueras and he has been not inappropriately styled the michelangelo of mexico frank and fred gleaned the foregoing information from mr Janvier's mexican guide during their first visit to the academy and they also learned from the same excellent authority that the present academy had its actual beginning in seventeen seventy nine through a school of engraving established in the mint the success of the engraving school and the general interest in it caused the director of the mint to seek the permission of the viceroy to establish schools of painting sculpture and architecture and the permission was readily granted later the matter was referred to the king who issued in december seventeen eighty three an order for the foundation of the academy on the fourth of november seventeen eighty five the formal opening of the academia de las nobles arts de san carlos de la nueva españa took place and this is the institution which the youths visited on repeated occasions whenever they had any spare time on their hands it is proper to say that the school was originally opened in the mint but in seventeen ninety one it was removed to the building where it is now like most other institutions of mexico it has had many ups and downs consequent upon the political changes through which the country has passed at present it has an allowance of about thirty five thousand dollars annually from the government and is regularly a government affair its name having been changed in eighteen sixty eight to the national school of the fine arts prizes are given for meritorious work by the students all tuition is free and there is an average attendance of about one hundred throughout the year one prize which is specially sought is an allowance of six hundred dollars a year for six years to enable the recipient to study art in italy within the last few years night classes have been established for working people and have been well attended we will not undertake to give you a list of all the paintings we saw wrote frank nor even a part of them as in any event it would be tedious to anybody at a distance the pictures are arranged in three large galleries and two small ones and they are grouped together according to their age and the nativity of their painters one gallery contains paintings by the old masters of europe another is devoted to old mexican masters and another to pupils of the academy the finest picture in the last named collection that of the pupils of the academy is by felix para and is entitled las casas protecting the aztecs para painted it before he had seen any country except mexico and he received the first prize at the academy of rome on account of the merit displayed in this work i will not attempt to describe the painting but send a photograph by which you may judge of it the coloring is of course lost in the photograph but you can get an idea of the drawing and the sentiment of the picture las casas is represented standing on the steps of a teocalli and at his feet is the dead body of a mexican chief who has been slain by the spaniards while an aztec woman clings imploringly to the robe of the priest the painting is a historic one and the story it illustrates is this las casas was a spanish prelate who accompanied columbus to the west indies and afterwards came to mexico he was horrified at the treatment of the natives by their conquerors and he crossed the ocean no less than twelve times to intercede with the king of spain in their behalf he was unsuccessful in nearly all his efforts though he finally persuaded the emperor charles v to make some effort to redress the wrongs which the indians were suffering at the hands of the spaniards he risked his life on many occasions on behalf of the natives as we read in prescott's histories and when the emperor offered him the bishopric of cuzco one of the richest appointments in the spanish colonies he declined it and accepted that of chiapas one of the poorest and most ignorant he died in madrid in fifteen sixty six at the age of ninety-two years every time we visit the gallery we linger in front of this picture and are never weary of admiring and studying it many good critics pronounce it not only the best painting in the gallery where it hangs but the best in the entire collection of the academy 
This is high praise indeed when we remember that the Academy has works by Leonardo da Vinci, Murillo, Rubens, Correggio, and Velasquez. Another fine painting of the modern Mexican school is The Death of Atala. Felix Parra is represented by other works in addition to the Las Casas. One of these is The Massacre in the Temple, which also has historic value. It illustrates the butchery of the natives in the temple by Alvarado, whom Cortez had left at the capital city while he personally went to the coast to meet the ships and troops that had been sent from Cuba to reinforce the invading army. As the history of Mexico was closely identified with the church down to within 20 years or so, it naturally occurs that nearly all the paintings of former days are of a religious character just as we find the paintings in the galleries of Europe. One day in their visit to the academy, the youths met a gentleman to whom they had been previously introduced, and one of them asked if the wealthy people of Mexico gave much encouragement to native art. I'm sorry to say they do not, was the reply. It has not yet become the fashion to buy modern paintings, but some of our rich men are setting the example, and as the country becomes developed and more wealthy, the example may be followed. But just at present, the best patrons of art are the pool key shops, and as their patrons are not very critical, it does not require a high talent to meet their wants. In private houses, there is a greater demand for huge mirrors than for fine paintings, and the value of the plate glass mirrors in the city of Mexico is far beyond that of the modern works of art to be found here. Many an artist of fair promise has been obliged to abandon the dream of his life and obtain a living by painting for the pulquerias or selling silk and woolens behind the counter of a shop. The gentleman then told a story of a native artist who had painted a canvas some eight feet by six, representing the landing of Columbus. Months and months passed, and he could not find a purchaser, though he lowered his price to half its original figure. Then, at the advice of a friend, he made a few changes in the ships, costumes, coloring, and scenery, and entitled the picture Evacuation of Mexico by the French. In less than a week, he found a customer who made not the least objection to the price which was set upon the work. The mention of Pulquerias naturally drew attention to those establishments which abound in Mexico as do beer shops in New York. Fred undertook an essay concerning them and the substance in which they deal. Pulque is the product of the agave mexicana, or maguey plant, wrote the youth, and a description of Mexico without a reference to it would be like Hamlet without Hamlet. It is the beverage of Mexico, as beer is that of Germany, and wine the drink of France. Along the line of the railway, as we were coming southward, we passed many fields of maguey, and several times we saw the collectors gathering the juice of the plant for conversion into pulque. Nobody knows when pulque was invented, as it was in use here centuries before Cortez was born. There are many fables concerning it, and like most fables of the kind, the discovery of the use which could be made of the juice of the maguey is generally attributed to the gods. One more practicable fable is that a Toltec noble discovered it and sent some of the pulque to the king by the hand of his daughter, Xochitl. The king was so delighted with the drink and the maiden that he swallowed the former and married the latter, and their son succeeded him as king. This was the beginning of the downfall of the Toltecs and their extinction as a nation. But the art of making pulque was not lost. The name of the lovely Xochitl has been preserved in the Aztec name of the beverage, Ochtol. During our war with Mexico, the soldiers under Generals Taylor and Scott drank the liquid, and in attempting to pronounce the Aztec name, they generally got no nearer to it than cocktail. They carried the word back to the States, and Dr. Bronson tells us that it is occasionally heard there at this day in clubs and hotels, where it is applied to beverages in which spirits, bitters, and other ingredients are mingled. The maguey belongs to the cactus family of plants, and there are said to be 40 varieties of it. 22 yield agua miel, or honey water, from which pulque is made, and the others are used for hedges and for making paper, cords, and other things. In former times, the natives are said to have had not less 
than a hundred uses for the maguey plant in addition to its production of pulque they made paper from the pulp of the leaves cords and thread from the fiber needles from the thorns shingles and troughs from the leaves and the little clothing they wore was generally made from the thread derived from the maguey the leaves are sometimes ten feet long by a foot wide and like the leaves of the other members of the cactus family they are of great thickness when the maguey plant is about ten years old it sends up a single stalk in the center which often rises to a height of twenty-five or thirty feet this stalk is covered with flowers hundreds and sometimes thousands of them and they are of a yellowish green color after blossoming the plant dies very much as does the sago tree and some other tropical growths a single blossoming is all that it is capable of in its lifetime and here is where the pulque comes in or rather comes out the indians watch the plants closely when the flower stalk is expected to appear and just at the right time they cut out the center of the stem leaving a hollow as large over as an ordinary wash bowl but a good deal deeper the sap which was intended to nourish the flower stalk flows into this cavity and flows so rapidly that it must be emptied every few hours the leaves on one side of the plant are cut away so that the cavity can be reached and then the tilachiquero or collector makes his rounds he is equipped with a gourd open at both ends inserting the broad end into the cavity he sucks up the juice agua miel and then deposits it in a pigskin hanging over his back or in pigskins or earthen jars on the back of the donkey the agua miel is carried to the central station of the establishment where it is poured into shallow vats of pig or cow skin there it ferments and becomes pulque a vile smelling liquid which is said to taste like stale buttermilk it is almost always repulsive to the stranger and sometimes one who comes within smelling distance of pulque for the first time is made ill by it a good maguey yields from eight to fifteen pints daily and continues to do so for three or four months and a good estate of maguey plants is more certain in the revenue it brings to the owner than any other enterprise the plants thrive in the poorest soil where hardly anything else can live a scientific writer on this subject says an analysis of agua miel gives glucose sugar and water as the principal ingredients it froths when shaken gives an abundant precipitate with subacetate of lead and when filtered the resultant liquor is colorless pulque is the product of the fermentation of agua miel is an alcoholic mucilaginous liquid holding in suspension white corpuscles which give it its color and has an odor and taste peculiar to itself it is more or less sugary according to its strength and contains about six per cent of alcohol pulque is sent from the estates along the railway in barrels and pigskins and the amount consumed in the capital is about eighty thousand gallons daily there is a pulque train daily to the city we passed it at a side track and easily detected its presence by the smell of fermentation the pulque shops are as discernible to the nose as to the eye they are numerous in all the cities and large towns and very properly are under the eyes of the police there are eight hundred twenty of these shops in the city of mexico they pay a license fee to the government as do beer and wine shops in european countries and the law requires that they shall close at six p m and what strikes a new yorker with astonishment it is in force too the city derives a revenue of a thousand dollars a day from the pulque brought here for sale in addition to what it receives for shop licenses the railway probably gets a thousand dollars also for the daily transportation and altogether the national drink of mexico costs a great deal of money liquors called mezcal and tequila are distilled from pulque and contain a larger percentage of alcohol then there is a stronger liquor called aguardiente burning water which is literally described by its name some gentlemen who have tasted it say that it is like swallowing a torch-like procession or a whole collection of fourth of july fireworks from pulquerias to police courts is a very natural step and one which is taken by a good many natives of mexico frank and fred took it 
though not after the Mexican fashion, as their movement was voluntary, while that of the native is performed by invitation or demand of the police. The better classes of the population know next to nothing about the police courts or where they are held, and it was only after a great deal of inquiry that the youths learned where and when to go. The guide who had shown them the sights of the city claimed to be unable to tell them, and when they ascertained for themselves, he was somewhat unwilling to accompany them. It is barely possible that he had been there on his own account altogether too often to make a voluntary visit agreeable. They found the court in the municipal palace at one side of the Plaza Mayor. Ascending a staircase, they were shown into a waiting room, and beyond it there were several smaller rooms. Two or three gentlemen were seated at a table in each of the rooms and seemed to be busily engaged in discussing something. Frank asked the guide what they were doing. One of them is a magistrate, was the reply, and the others are the lawyers, who are laying a case before him. One is the prosecutor and the other is for the defense. But where are the accused and the policemen? They're downstairs, or perhaps they haven't got to the palace yet. They don't come into these rooms at all. The magistrate hears the case through the lawyers and doesn't have the prisoner brought before him, as you do in your country. On further inquiry, the youths learn that the magistrates hear the cases in this way and decide whether the complaint shall be dismissed. The prisoner let off with a fine or sent to the Bellum prison at the edge of the city. Some of the prisoners were, as the guide said, downstairs, but the greater number were in a building separate from the palace and situated on a narrow street close by. There is a court in the prison building in which the magistrates hear cases in the same way as at the municipal palace, without seeing the prisoner. They hear the testimony for and against him and decide accordingly. At the Bellum prison they found another court, where cases were more carefully considered, but they learned from a gentleman with whom they afterwards talked on the subject that the Mexican courts are overcrowded with work, and prisoners often have to wait weeks or months and even years before their cases can be heard. A prisoner against whom a serious accusation has been made can never learn when it will be called to trial. His friends are not informed, and the only thing they can do is to watch and wait day after day, or possibly pay heavily to somebody for his influence with the authorities. Matters are better now than previous to the laws of the reform, but they are still far from what they should be. We judged, said Fred, that the Bellum prison was greatly overcrowded, as the courtyard was full of people, and so were the corridors that overlooked the yard. The prisoners sleep on mats on the floor of the dormitories, which are about 170 feet long. One hundred men lie in a row on the mats along the floor of the dormitory, so that there must be very little room to walk around. The fare of the prisoners consists of twelve ounces of bread daily, one pound of meat, and a bowl of soup. Three times a week they have stewed beans in addition to the other food. A prisoner whose sentence exceeds one month is compelled to work, but he is paid for his labor. One half his wages go to his family, if he has any and the rest is saved up by the prison authorities until the man is discharged when the money is given to him. This seems to me an excellent system, and it should be adopted in our own country. In that case, an ex-convict would have something to live upon for a while, instead of being, as is too often the case, driven into crime to save himself from starvation. To show the character of Mexican offenses, I will quote from the records of the prison for one month. The whole number of prisoners was 1,278, and they were charged with crimes as follows. Thefts, 198. Fighting, 109. Stabbing, serious, 518. Stabbing, slight, 313. Wounding with sticks or clubs, 140. Observe that two-thirds of the number were in prison for the use of the knife, and you get an idea of the propensities of the lower classes of the population. We have already mentioned the adroitness of Mexican thieves, and we heard several stories while visiting the prison that confirm what we have heard. There's a saying here that if you drop a coin, it will be caught before it reaches the ground. They told us a story about the chief magistrate of Mexico City, which we were assured was entirely true. It sounds like a chestnut, but is good enough to be repeated. Here it is. 
the magistrate was one day on the street when he remarked to a friend that he had left his watch hanging over the head of his bed at home in less than an hour a thief was at the door with a fat turkey he said that it was sent by the magistrate who wished his wife to send him his watch which he had left at the head of his bed she sent the watch and when his honor came home that night he learned of the trick that had been played he consoled himself with the reflection that he had a fat turkey for the next sunday's dinner and would not be obliged to buy anything for that important meal but the next day an accomplice of the watch stealer called and said the magistrate had sent him to get the turkey which they desired to produce in court the man who stole the watch had just been arrested and the turkey was needed to secure his conviction as it was one of the properties in the case of course it was promptly sent so the good man lost both his watch and his turkey and had never heard of either of them again there is a short road to justice called ley de fuga which is sometimes traveled in mexico it may be translated into running the gauntlet by mexican law an officer has the right to shoot a prisoner trying to escape sometimes when bandits or murderers are captured they are allowed to try to escape and in their effort to secure their freedom they take the chance of being killed recently this disposition was made of seven bandits who murdered a german named mueller in the state of durango and then robbed his house compelling mrs mueller to show where the valuables were kept they were captured while seated at table in mueller's house after completing the robbery a party of soldiers happening to arrive there most opportunely as their conviction and execution were certain they accepted the offer of the officers to permit them to try the lay de fuga but not one of them succeeded in escaping End of chapter 14chapter fifteen of the boy travelers in mexico this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org read by betty b the boy travelers in mexico by thomas wallace knox chapter fifteen one of the most attractive drives in the neighborhood of mexico is along the paseo de la reforma the avenue leading to chapultepec in point of fact it is generally the first drive taken by a visitor and he is pretty certain to be favorably impressed with it chapultepec was a royal residence before the conquest during the spanish rule it was the home of the viceroys and since that time the president of the republic has generally lived there when he could live at all in the city or its vicinity maximilian selected it for the location of the imperial palace and enlarged the then existing buildings the avenue leading to it owes its origin to his ambition and is a monument of his taste for the beautiful whether the ride to chapultepec is taken by the tramway or in a carriage the stranger will find it full of interest and he would do well to try both means of making the visit if he is an equestrian he will hire a saddle horse and make the excursion on horseback between seven and nine o'clock in the morning when it is the fashion to appear thus on the paseo dr bronson and his young friends followed the prevailing custom and through the aid of the manager of the hotel were satisfactorily provided with steeds but they were very modestly mounted in comparison with some of the mexican equestrians whose saddles and saddle cloths were elaborately ornamented and said to have cost all the way from one to two thousand dollars each some of the horsemen were armed with sabers and revolvers a souvenir of a custom which is no longer necessary but was emphatically so not many years ago the road to chapultepec and indeed the roads anywhere in the suburbs were infested with brigands who used to rise up from unexpected spots as though at the hand of a magician and perform their work in a very expeditious manner the enterprising brigands were not content with robbing people on horseback or in carriages but occasionally devoted their energies to kidnapping residents and holding them for ransom as an illustration of their performances frank made note of the following story one evening while a gentleman was at dinner with his family in the suburb of tacuba a party of brigands appeared and commanded silence on the part of all under pain of death 
they harmed no one and did not rob the house but they hurried the gentleman into a carriage and drove away with him it was naturally supposed that he had been taken to a place of concealment among the foothills of the mountains that encircle the valley but it turned out that his captors drove directly to the city and secreted their victim in the cellar of a house there he was kept for several days until the police were so closely on the track of the kidnappers that they fled and left him to make his escape subsequently they were captured and executed but the circumstance was not at all a pleasant one for suburban residents to contemplate fred observed that the paseo de la reforma begins at the equestrian statue of charles the fourth very nearly a mile from the plaza mayor it may also be said to begin at the alameda a beautiful garden of poplar and other trees and occupying a historic site the alameda includes the ancient indian marketplace and the plaza del quemadero where the victims of the inquisition were burned to death on a stone platform which was long since removed successive viceroys improved it and within the last few decades it has been planted with flowers and otherwise beautiful so that it is now a very attractive spot the statue of charles the fourth is a fine work of art and notable as the first bronze casting of any magnitude on this side of the atlantic humboldt pronounced it second only to the statue of marcus aurelius and it has received the unstinted praise of many critics who have seen it it was cast in eighteen o two and placed upon its pedestal in the following year during the war for independence it was in eighteen twenty two covered with a large globe of boards painted blue and in this condition it remained for two years when it was taken down and placed in the courtyard of the university in eighteen fifty two when the hostility to the spaniards had somewhat abated the statue was restored to its pedestal and has peacefully rested there ever since the casting is in a single piece and weighs thirty tons and the height of horse and rider is only a few inches less than sixteen feet from the foot of the statue to the base of chapultepec is a distance of three thousand seven hundred fifty yards the paseo de la reforma runs straight as a sunbeam along this measured length and it has a width including the sidewalks of fifty-six yards at regular distances there are glorietas circular spaces like the rond point of the champs elysees in paris which are intended for statues of men eminent in the history of mexico one of them is already occupied with a statue of columbus who is represented drawing away the veil that hides the new world at the corners of the pedestal are four life-size figures in bronze and frank and fred were pleased to observe that one of them represented the good missionary las casas who labored earnestly for the protection of the indians a statue of guatemozin the last of the aztec kings is destined for the next space but had not been erected at the time of the visit of our friends the third space was intended for a statue of cortez and the fourth for one of juarez the occupants of the other glorietas had not been named but they will be men famous in the history of mexico from present indications maximilian is not likely to be chosen as one of the heroes to be preserved in bronze the glorietas are four hundred feet in diameter and surrounded with stone benches for the accommodation of pedestrian visitors the paseo is lined with shade trees so that it affords pleasant walks the center of the roadway is reserved for people on horseback while the carriages move along the sides on pleasant afternoons the vehicles are so numerous that the police have sufficient occupation to keep them in proper line and the turnout is a fine one in every way frank and fred compared the display one afternoon with that of london paris and new york under similar circumstances and after careful consideration they agreed that the mexican pageant was more attractive than any one of the rest the ground is level the road finely macadamized and the way perfectly straight the horses and carriages are the best that can be procured the equestrians are splendidly mounted and their apparel and equipments are picturesque the ladies are handsomely attired and many of them have pretty faces the panorama of hills and mountains 
loses none of its grandeur and altogether we are in love with the paseo de la reforma so wrote frank and his cousin gave his hearty endorsement of the opinion thus presented don't forget said fred to make mention of the aqueducts that supply the city with water as they are in sight from this drive one comes from back among the hills near the old convent of el desierto and the other leads from a great spring at the foot of chapultepec the latter aqueduct gave shelter to our soldiers during their attack on the gates of the city after the storming of the castle from one pillar to another of the aqueduct they dodged the fire of the mexican artillery and infantry and so gained the front of the gateway i'll not forget that replied frank nor the old cypresses under which montezuma is said to have sat and walked but before we get to them we'll mention that an american company proposes to make an extension of the city of mexico by building a suburb on the level tract of land through which the paseo runs this was one of the dreams of maximilian but he had no time or opportunity to put it into practical shape his idea has been taken up by the peaceful invaders from the north and if it is carried out as they propose it will not be many years before the land is materially transformed artesian wells have been sunk in this level space and have found an abundance of water and the projectors of the suburb say they will have their own supply without depending upon either of the aqueducts chapultepec is a delightful spot wrote fred whether considered as a public resort a royal or presidential residence or for the panoramic view presented to the visitor as he looks from its top it is an isolated rock or hill rising about two hundred feet and with a length of one thousand or twelve hundred feet and the top is crowned with the buildings which have seen many changes among their occupants as well as in themselves the sides are steep in some places but gradual in others the steep parts predominating all around the base are cypress trees whose age is unknown but they are certainly very old and their venerable appearance is increased by the moss that depends from their limbs the tree of the greatest interest to us was that which bears the name of montezuma if tradition is correct the emperor sat beneath its shade and it was possibly while resting here that he received the news of the approach of those strange white men who had landed upon the coast and rode upon animals the like of which were never before known in america it is a wonderful tree one hundred seventy feet high and forty-six in circumference like the other great trees of chapultepec it is a cypress and like the others too it is heavily draped with moss as though in mourning for the aboriginal ruler whose kingdom was torn away by the invader from the tree of montezuma we went to his bath which is not far away and is the famous spring that fills the aqueduct already mentioned the water is cool and clear and supplied the ancient tenochtitlan just as in later days it was made to supply the spanish city which rose on the side of the aztec one the aqueduct through which the water flows is exactly on the line of that of the aztecs the spanish aqueduct was begun in sixteen seventy seven and has nine hundred four arches from its starting point at chapultepec to its terminus in the salto del agua or waterfall in the city the water of chapultepec is called agua delgada or thin water while that supplied by the san cosme aqueduct is agua gorda or thick water from time immemorial the spring has been flowing and it is supposed to be fed by underground channels from the mountains after the tree and the baths we visited the palace or such part of it as was open to the public there is not much worth seeing inside the building the most interesting feature about it being the view from the roof all the valley of mexico with its girdle of mountains was before us it was like the view from the cathedral tower with the difference that the city formed a part of the horizontal view in one direction while from the tower it lay beneath and around our feet and the same view that included the city embraced also the snowy peaks of popocatapetl and the white woman which lay a little to the right of the cluster of domes and roofs standing between us and the silvery sheet of Texcoco. In the opposite direction was Tacuba, the spot where Cortez thought of rebuilding the city 
which was to rise in place of the Tenochtitlan he had destroyed. It is to be regretted that he did not do so, as the site is better adapted to a city. It admits of good drainage, which the present one does not, and would undoubtedly be healthier. The present palace stands on the site of the one occupied by Montezuma. Chapultepec was called the Hill of the Grasshopper by the Aztecs, and in their maps of the valley, the hill is represented with a grasshopper as large as itself perched on the top. We are wondering whether they really had grasshoppers of that size. What a famine they would create if they were as numerous as they are today in some parts of the West. What a magnificent place this must have been in the time of Montezuma, according to the description in Prescott's history. Here was an aviary that alone required 300 attendants, and there was a menagerie of corresponding extent. Then the king had granaries of immense extent to guard against suffering in case of famine, and there were armories with weapons sufficient for a military force of thousands. The halls of the palace were spacious, and the royal dining table was supplied with delicacies of all kinds from every part of the dominions. Fresh fish were provided daily by a line of couriers in the same way that they were supplied to the Khan of Tartary in the days of Marco Polo, and also to the royal table of Japan. According to the accounts, the runners made the journey from the coast to the city in very nearly the same time that is now made by the railway. We were shown through the palace, which has large halls and galleries, and is surrounded by terraces paved with marble and affording fine views of the valley and mountains. Some of the halls and galleries are elaborately ornamented, while others are quite plain. A portion of the decorations ordered by Maximilian still remain, and others have been covered or partly obliterated. The most interesting hall was the Grand Saloon, where banquets are occasionally given. It is memorable for having been the scene of Maximilian's Feast of Belshazzar, as the Mexicans call it, his grand banquet on his return from the Orizaba, just before he started for Querétaro, for capture and for execution. Many of the porcelain dishes marked with the imperial cipher were broken at this banquet and are kept as souvenirs by those who secured them. A friend of ours in New York has one of them. It is part of a saucer and was given to him by a gentleman who was in Mexico shortly after the fall of the empire. The National Military College is at Chapultepec and adjoins the palace building. We were told that it is conducted on a plan similar to that of our military academy at West Point and contained between three and four hundred students. There was a military school here at the time of our war with Mexico. The cadets enlisted for the defense of Chapultepec, fought splendidly, and many of them were killed in the battle. A few years ago, a monument commemorating their gallantry was erected in the garden on the side of the hill, and it should be visited in honor of the brave youths who fell there. And this brings us to the incidents of the capture of Chapultepec. Do you see that large building back of the grove, said our guide, pointing his finger in an easterly direction. We followed the direction with our eyes and indicated that we saw it. Well, said he, that is Molino del Rey, the king's mill, and that's where some of the hard fighting took place. Just beyond it is the Casa Mata, and over there and there are the fields of Contreras and Churubusco. From this point, you can take in the whole range of General Scott's battles in the valley that resulted in the fall of the city of Mexico. We studied the situations, and since then, we've read up the history of the battles and will try to tell you something of them. Frank and Fred kept their promise and wrote an account which we are permitted to give in their words. It will be remembered that before the Battle of Buena Vista, a part of General Taylor's army was sent to join General Scott in his advance upon the capital of the Republic. General Scott proceeded to besiege Veracruz and the castle of San Juan de Uloa, which protects it. The fortress is a strong one and the Mexicans were so confident of the abilities of Vera Cruz to hold out against any force the Americans could send against it that they left a garrison of only 5,000 men, did not provision the city against a siege, and neglected to send away the women and children. The Americans besieged the city on the land side, the whole army landing without accident or opposition. 
the siege began on the ninth of march eighteen forty seven and on the twenty sixth of the same month the city and the castle surrendered then began the march towards the capital as soon as the provision trains could be made ready the mexicans made no opposition until the americans reached the foot of the mountains where the battle of cerro gordo was fought on the eighteenth of april the mexicans being commanded by general santa anna and the americans by general twiggs the mexicans were defeated with a loss of one thousand killed and wounded and three thousand prisoners including five generals and many other officers general santa anna fled from the battlefield on a baggage mule and the mexicans were very much demoralized perote and puebla were occupied soon after the victory of cerro gordo and then the army halted in its advance to wait for reinforcements which were on their way from the united states it was not until the beginning of august that general scott was ready to move towards the capital and when he gave the order it was with only ten thousand seven hundred thirty eight men to follow him colonel childs with one thousand four hundred men was left at puebla which was a very important point on the road by which supplies were to be forwarded three days the army struggled up the eastern slope of the mountains that surround the valley when they looked down on the beautiful valley with its lakes glistening in the sun the towers of the city rising in the center of the level expanse the black fields of lava the hills rising here and there the green expanse of cultivated land and the causeways covered with people the soldiers gave a loud cheer and in spite of the fatigue of the ascent were ready to dash forward to battle to oppose them general santa anna had assembled an army of three times their number and erected forts to guard every approach to the city after carefully surveying the ground general scott decided to advance to the south of the lakes if he had continued on by the national road which leads from mexico to vera cruz he would have encountered the fortress of el peñon on which fifty-one guns had been mounted the engineer said he would lose one-third his army in capturing the fort and hence his decision to go to the south of the lakes general worth's division advanced to st augustin nine miles from the city where there is a large field of lava known as the pedregal which artillery or cavalry could not cross the mexicans had entrenched camps at contreras and also at san antonio and general scott decided to attack both these points at once generals twiggs and pillow were to advance upon contreras while general worth moved toward san antonio during the night of the nineteenth of august it rained and the men camped without fires early in the morning of the twentieth the order to march was given the mexicans were taken a good deal by surprise contreras was won by a sharp fight that did not last long and the invaders pushed on to san angel which was evacuated as they approached some of the cannon taken by the americans were those which were lost at buena vista and the men who lost them were the very ones who had the good fortune to make the capture san antonio was abandoned before the americans reached it but a stand was made at churubusco further on this was attacked in front and rear at the same time santa anna considered it the key of the mexican position and the place was defended by thirty thousand men they made a good defense and at one time it looked as though the assailants would be repulsed some of the most gallant fighting of the day was performed by a south carolina regiment the palmettos in a charge upon a mexican force largely their superior in numbers and backed by a battery of artillery churubusco and contreras had fallen and it would have been easy for the americans to advance and take possession of the city before the mexicans had recovered from their panic under injudicious advice general scott offered an armistice to enable negotiations for peace to be made it was promptly accepted and lasted a fortnight but resulted in nothing when santa anna felt that he had repaired his damages he sent an insulting message to general scott and hostilities were resumed very early on the morning of september eighth the advance began the troops moving in the direction of the casa mata and the molino del rey the molino was attacked by the artillery and afterwards by the infantry at one time the americans recoiled 
under the shower of bullets and their heavy loss in men and officers but it was only for a moment the molino was carried the mexican cavalry behind it was put to flight and the road was clear to chapultepec the home of the montezumas and the viceroys for four days the army rested and on the twelfth the order to advance was given the cannonade against chapultepec began at daybreak on the morning of the thirteenth and at eight o'clock general quitman advanced along the tacuba road and general pillow from the molina del rey the mexicans fought stubbornly but the americans pressed on and while the garrison was occupied in one direction an attack was made in another and the position was taken when the mexicans fell back to the city general scott ordered the pursuit to be continued on both the roads leading from chapultepec to the city gates of belem and san cosme away went the pursuers and here as stated elsewhere they found great advantage from the aqueducts springing from one archway to another they managed to dodge the mexican bullets and get close to the gates there they adopted the plan of boring through the houses as they had done at monterey and in this manner by sunset they were practically though not literally in possession this was the end of the fighting at midnight a party of mexican officers came out with a flag of truce and proposed the surrender of the city and at the same time the remnant of the mexican army marched out of the northern gate and fled to guadalupe hidalgo on the morning of september fourteenth general scott entered the city and surrounded by his staff and principal officers rode in triumph to the grand plaza through the crowd of men that thronged the streets and scowled as they clutched their knives and muttered threats against los yankees he was followed by six thousand men of his army their uniforms were ragged and soiled with mud but their weapons were in ready condition for service which happily was no longer needed negotiations for peace were begun immediately and on february second eighteen forty eight the treaty was signed at guadalupe hidalgo it was ratified in the following may and as soon as it could be done conveniently mexico was evacuated by the american troops and the two nations became friends again and we shall all hope that the friendship will never be broken commenting on the war with mexico general grant said for myself i was bitterly opposed to the measure the annexation of texas and to this day regard the war which resulted as one of the most unjust ever waged by a stronger upon a weaker nation it was an instance of a republic following the bad example of european monarchies in not considering justice in their desire to acquire additional territory end of chapter fifteen chapter sixteen of the boy travelers in mexico this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by a fine voice the boy travelers in mexico by thomas w knox chapter sixteen the noche triste tree the tree of montezuma and the traditions connected with it called the attention of the youths to another famous tree of mexico it was the abol de la noche triste or tree of the mournful night when it was mentioned to dr bronson the latter said before we go there i wish you to inform yourselves about the tree so that we can talk intelligently concerning its historical associations frank and fred promised to comply with his request and in their case a promise was equivalent to its performance a day was set for the excursion to popotlan where the tree stands on the morning of that day frank said they were ready with their story it was presented to the doctor at the breakfast table and pronounced satisfactory here it is as it was read by fred departure of cortez from cuba those who have studied history carefully know that cortez sailed from cuba to make the conquest of mexico he had a fleet of eleven vessels the largest of them was of one hundred tons three were of seventy tons each and the rest were open barks his whole force consisted of one hundred and ten seamen five hundred and fifty-three soldiers two hundred indians and a few indian women for servants his regular soldiers consisted of sixteen horsemen 
thirty musketeers and thirty-two crossbowmen. All the rest of the soldiers were armed with swords and spears. In addition to these he had fourteen pieces of artillery, with an abundance of ammunition, and he had sixteen horses, which were the first ever seen in America. This was the force with which he started for the conquest of a people numbering millions, and ruled by a king, with a large army equipped with spears and bows and arrows, and protected by coats of mail of thick wadding. The first mass in the temples of Yucatan. He landed first on Cotsumel Island, near the coast of Yucatan, where he proceeded to convert the natives to Christianity. He did it in a very summary way, by calling on the natives to destroy their idols and embrace the new religion. When they declined to do so, he set his soldiers to breaking and overturning the idols and throwing them out of the temples. Then he erected an altar, reared a cross and an image of the Virgin, and ordered one of the priests who accompanied him to celebrate Mass, which was done in the presence of his kneeling followers. Battle with the Indians From Yucatan he sailed for the coast of Mexico, which he reached at the mouth of the Tabasco River. Here he landed, and after a fight with the Indians, which was won chiefly by the terror inspired by his horses and the sound of the guns, which the natives took for thunder, he occupied Tabasco. Shortly afterwards he had another battle with a force which his historians estimated at 40,000. This army he defeated, and he celebrated Mass on the battlefield, in thanks for his triumph over the heathen. Then writes Diaz, after dressing our wounds with the fat of the Indians whom we found dead, and having placed good guards round our post, we ate our supper and went to our repose. Peace was arranged with the Indians on condition that they should submit to the authority of Cortes and accept the religion he brought them. They had no alternative and immediately became Christians. When this was accomplished, he continued along the coast of Mexico and laid the foundations of Veracruz. There he first heard of the Emperor Montezuma, and the story of his great wealth determined Cortes to make the conquest of Mexico. That was where he burned his ships, remarked Frank, as Fred paused for a moment. Yes, answered Fred, he burned his ships partly in order to make retreat impossible, and partly that he might increase his force with a hundred and ten seamen. He left a small garrison at Veracruz, and then advanced towards the city. Taking part with the tribes who had been annoyed by the tax collectors of Montezuma, he secured their friendship. He conquered the Alaska lands in four severe battles, and then induced them to join him in a march upon Montezuma's capital, as they were not on good terms with the Aztecs, but he could not prevail upon them to renounce their religion and adopt Christianity. First view of the Mexican capital. He reached Tenochtitlan, Montezuma's capital, in November 1518, with 6,000 Indian allies, in addition to his force of Spaniards. Ambassadors from Montezuma met him on the road, and he was welcomed with great courtesy and ceremony. A palace was assigned to him, and he immediately fortified it. While he was laying his plans for taking possession of the country and its immense store of gold, he learned that his garrison at Veracruz had been attacked and one of his soldiers killed, and not only was the soldier killed, but his head was sent to Montezuma. The death of one soldier may not be thought a very serious matter, Fred remarked by way of explanation, but it was so for Cortes. Down to that time, the Mexicans supposed the Spaniards were supernatural beings. They were the children of the sun, and therefore immortal, but the receipt of the head of the slain soldier undeceived them. The meeting of Cortes and Montezuma. He at once took Montezuma prisoner, and having captured the men who attacked Veracruz, he burned them alive in the public square in front of the palace. Montezuma took the oath of allegiance to the King of Spain and was set at liberty after paying an enormous amount of gold and precious stones by way of ransom. Just as Cortés thought everything was quiet, he learned that the governor of Cuba had sent an army under Narvaez to deprive him of the command of the country. As the army was much larger than his own, the situation was desperate. But Cortés was equal to it. He left 200 men in the city under charge of one of his officers, and then hastened to the coast, where he defeated and killed Narvaez and added his men to his own forces. 
Thus the army of 900 men with 80 horses and 12 pieces of artillery that had been sent to conquer Cortes became really his reinforcement. He returned with them to Mexico, where meantime the people had risen against the Spaniards, killed Montezuma, and under their new emperor, Cuitlahua, driven the invaders out of the city. If you want a brilliant account of the evacuation of the city, you will find it in Prescott's history. It is too long to be given here. There is a reminiscence of the terrible retreat, continued Fred, which is shown to every visitor to the city. It is the Salto de Alvarado, or Alvarado's Leap, in the street which bears the name of that warrior. They tell us that where the line of house fronts is broken and shut off by an iron railing was formerly a canal in the ancient city of Tenochtitlan. This is said to be the exact spot where Alvarado leapt across the canal and saved himself from the death which overtook so many of his comrades. He commanded the rear guard and was one of the few who escaped. Bernal Diaz says the opening was so wide and the side so high that no man in the world could have jumped across, no matter how strong might be his limbs. Now we are coming to the Noche Tree's tree, remarked Frank. Yes, answered Fred, Cortes is said to have sat all night under this tree at the time of the evacuation, lamenting over his misfortunes and laying plans for the future. Do you think it is really so? Fred asked, turning to Dr. Bronson. The legend is a romantic one, the doctor replied, and I would not care to disturb it. But if I read the character of Cortez correctly, he was not the man to sit down and mourn under any circumstances. Quite likely he stopped under the tree on that eventful night of July 1st, 1520, but it is more probable that he was planning what to do next, instead of wasting his time in vain lamentations. It is time to go now, said he, glancing at his watch, and we'll have the rest of the story at the foot of the famous tree. Fred folded his manuscript and consigned it to his pocket, and then the trio, accompanied by their guide, proceeded to Popotla by the railway. Taking a car at the west side of the Plaza Mayor, they reached Popotla in little more than half an hour from the time of their departure. They passed through Tacuba, which was anciently an important town, but is now a suburb of the great city, with a population of between two and three thousand. The tree is a species of cedar, called ajuete by the Indians and sabino by the Spaniards. Down to a few years ago it was in fine condition, but one night a fire was kindled against it and seriously injured its trunk. Several of its limbs have since died and been removed, and to prevent its utter destruction by relic hunters, the tree has been surrounded by an iron railing and is carefully watched by a policeman. Visitors may pick up any twigs lying outside the railing, but they are forbidden to tear anything from the tree, however insignificant. After inspecting the tree and commenting upon the fact that it was certainly old enough for Cortes to have sat a whole night beneath it and indulged in any amount of lamentation, our friends resumed the story of the conquest. During the retreat, continued Fred, the rear guard of the Spaniards was destroyed. The retreat lasted for six days and then a battle was fought on the 7th of July, 1520, on the plains of Atumba. Here Cortes was victorious, but he was not strong enough to attempt to retake the city. He went to Latgala, where he assembled a large force of natives, and again marched upon the capital. Meantime the Mexicans prepared for defence, and the emperor having died of smallpox, which the Spaniards introduced, the throne was taken by Guatmozin, the son-in-law of Montezuma. Guatmozin assembled a large army and fortified the causeways so that he believed the place impregnable, but he was not equal to the warlike skill of the Spanish commander. The Battle Upon the Causeway Cortes had again been reinforced by the governor of Cuba. The latter had sent two ships to the aid of Narvaez, of whose fate he was ignorant, and when these ships arrived at Veracruz, they were seized, and the men of the expedition were easily induced to join Cortes. Approached by land being so well guarded, Cortes decided to attack the city by water. Timber for thirteen brigantines was prepared on the other side of the mountains, and carried on the shoulders of eight thousand Lascalans to the banks of a small stream flowing into one of the lakes. There the boats were put together, and though the Mexicans made many attacks, they were always defeated. 
Each boat carried a piece of artillery and 25 Spaniards, and the fleet was sufficient to wipe the war canoes of the Mexicans out of existence. When all was ready, the fleet moved to the attack, and at the same time the land forces proceeded against the city along three of the causeways. The capture of Guatmozin. Altogether, the siege of the city lasted 77 days. It ended on the 13th of August, 1521, and that day may be taken as the commencement of the reign of the Spaniards in Mexico. Guatemozin attempted to escape in a boat, but was captured and treated as a prisoner of distinction. The Mexicans again endeavoured to drive out their invaders, but were unsuccessful, and Guatemozin was put to death under circumstances of great cruelty. He was burned on a bed of coals by order of Cortes, along with several of his nobles and leading men. And this ends our story of the conquest of Mexico, said Fred. Those who think it dry reading are at liberty to skip, but if they have read thus far there will be no need of doing so. What became of Cortes after the conquest? Dr. Bronson asked. He was rewarded by the king with the appointment of governor and captain general of Mexico, and a marquisat with a large revenue, but his success aroused jealousy, as it generally does, and while he was busy with the conquest of the outlying provinces of Mexico, his property was seized and his retainers were imprisoned. He returned to Spain in consequence of this, was received with distinction and returned to Mexico for new enterprises, but he found himself under the orders of a viceroy who had been sent to rule over him. He went back to Spain once more, where with great difficulty he obtained an audience with the king and was very coldly received. He soon dropped out of sight, and the closing years of his life were passed in utter obscurity in Seville. Very much like the closing years of the life of Columbus, Frank remarked. Ponce de Leon. Yes, added the doctor, and you may continue the parallel further among American discoverers and conquerors. Americus Vespucius, or Amerigo Vespucci, died in poverty. Balboa and Sir Walter Raleigh were beheaded. Pizarro was assassinated, Magellan was killed in battle, and de Soto never lived to know the value of his discovery of the Mississippi. Hendrik Hudson was forced into an open boat at sea by a band of mutineers and never heard of afterwards, and Captain John Smith died in retirement, after having passed some time in a French prison. Ponce de Leon, who went to Florida to find the fabled fountain of youth, was mortally wounded in a fight with the natives of that country and his followers were forced into a disastrous retreat. Absorbed with the train of thought aroused by Dr. Bronson's remark, the youths silently accompanied that gentleman on the return trip to the city. Frank concluded that he would never lead an expedition for the discovery of a new world, and Fred decided that he did not care to make a name in history by the conquest of a country that had done him no harm. The Church of Guadalupe in the afternoon they went to the hill which is notable for the church bearing the name of Our Lady of Guadalupe. It is about three miles from the city and in a direction opposite to that of Chapultepe. The present road is comparatively modern, the old one having been given up to the line of railway from the capital to Veracruz. The new road and the old one are parallel. The former has fourteen shrines along the wayside where pilgrims to the church used to pause to say their prayers but the new one is not so well provided. The tramcars run at a rapid rate, the mules often dashing into a gallop, but coming suddenly to a halt when the conductor blows his horn. The youths inquired as to the origin of the church, which is the most famous of all the places of worship in the country, and the object of many a pilgrimage every year. The result of their inquiries was the following story. The church of Nuestra Señora de Guadalupe stands on the spot where the Virgin Mary is said to have appeared to a poor shepherd, an Indian named Juan Diego, in 1531, ten years after the capture of the city of Tenochtitlan by Cortes. He lived in a mud hut near the base of the hill, and one day, his father being ill, he went to obtain medicine for him, and was stopped by the Virgin who abraded him for the slowness of the Mexicans in accepting the religion which the conquerors offered them. She announced that she was to be the patron saint of the Indians and told him to go and tell the bishop what he had seen and heard. 
He went to the house of Zumaraga, who was then Bishop of Mexico, but was turned away unbelieved and almost unheard. The Virgin appeared to him again and told him to gather some roses from the top of the rock and carry them in his blanket to the bishop. He did so, and when the blanket was opened, the picture of Mary was found to be painted upon it and surrounded by the imprint of the roses. The bishop was incredulous at first, but when he reflected that the Indian could not paint and was too poor to employ an artist, he accepted the miracle, and it was soon after adopted by the nation. It was not easy to identify the spot, and so the Virgin appeared again and stamped her foot upon the ground. Immediately there burst forth a spring which is said to possess wonderful healing properties, and it has continued to flow ever since. A small chapel was immediately erected, and soon afterwards the foundations of the church were laid. Pope Clement the Seventh officially proclaimed Our Lady of Guadalupe to be the patron saint of Mexico, and the adoration of the picture spread throughout the whole of America and also to Catholic Europe. At one time, said Frank in his account of the visit, the Church of Guadalupe was one of the richest in Mexico, second only to the great cathedral, but the greater part of its treasure was taken by the liberal government and coined into money at the time of the confiscation of church property. The golden frame of the picture of the Virgin was carried away, but afterwards returned. The altar railing of solid silver was not disturbed. Its value must be very great, as it is massive, and the metal is said to be of the highest standard. Statuette of the Virgin Mary The original painting is kept in an iron frame above the high altar and is shown only on rare occasions. By paying a fee to the sacristan, we obtain a view of it, the material on which the painting appears is of a very coarse fabric, but the picture is distinct and its colours seem to be admirably preserved. Copies of the picture are to be seen everywhere. Hardly a house in the country is without one of them, and they are for sale in all shapes and kinds to suit the most economical purse. Peddlers offer them to you on the streets, and no pious Mexican would be without at least one image of the patron saint of his country. Making a pilgrimage comfortably Pilgrimage to this place is constantly going on, but the great and especial day of the year is the 12th of December, the anniversary of the miraculous appearance. On that day, thousands of pilgrims are here from all parts of Mexico and Central America, and at the conclusion of the ceremonies, there is an exhibition of fireworks in front of the church. After this display, the natives perform the mitate, one of their ancient dances, in one of the halls attached to the church. The high dignitaries of the church are present at the fireworks and also at the dance. According to what we learned of it, the mitate has a resemblance to some of the dances in the Hindu temples of India. We are told that the priests facilitated the adoption of the Catholic religion by permitting the natives to retain some of their heathen customs, and the mitate is one of them. In the War for Independence, the picture of Our Lady of Guadalupe was borne on the banners of the insurgents, and their rallying cry was, Guadalupe! The priest Hidalgo, who originated the insurrection, was so identified with the shrine and its use during the war that his name was incorporated with it and given to the town which surrounds the church. After the independence of the country was secured, it was decreed that December 12th should be kept as a national holiday, and consequently the date is political as well as religious. The Treaty of Peace between the United States and Mexico was signed here on February 2, 1848, and is consequently known in history as the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo. This is the church to which the Emperor Maximilian walked with bare feet from the city, three miles away. He established a title and decoration of the Order of Guadalupe, and during his brief reign it was conferred upon distinguished and other persons who had rendered or might render services to the empire or its ruler. The mention of the devotional act of Maximilian in walking barefooted to the Church of Guadalupe reminded one of the youths of an account he had read not long before of the way in which many of the pilgrims of the shrine were accustomed to inflict self-torture in days gone by. They lashed themselves and one another with whips, gashed their flesh with knives, and in other ways personally injured themselves. Of late years the practice has fallen into disuse, but occasionally a penitente, as he is called, 
may be seen punishing himself for some real or fancied sin. The penitentes walking on cactus leaves. Dr. Bronson told the youths that in some parts of the country a favourite act of the penitentes is to walk over cactus leaves or to crawl upon them on their bare knees. A cross is set up in the yard of a church and the ground in front of it is strewn with the thorny cactus. On this dreadful pavement the penitentes walk to the foot of the cross and believe that when they have accomplished the journey they have expiated all the sins committed by them since the last ceremony of the same kind was held. The doctor said the priests had tried to abolish this practice which was established by the old Franciscan missionaries about 200 years ago but it has so strong a hold upon the Indians that they refuse to give it up. When the missionaries established the order of penitentes, their principal dogma was that no sin could be forgiven without confession and expiation. The society increased in numbers and at length became practically independent of the church. It adopted several dogmas of its own, one of them being the converse of the original and to the effect that no sin could be so great that it could not be washed away by expiation. This new dogma gave the priests much trouble especially among the natives of New Mexico and the neighbouring provinces of the Republic. End of chapter 16「Chapter 17 of The Boy Travellers in Mexico – This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Betty B. The Boy Travellers in Mexico by Thomas Wallace Knox. Chapter 17 On the day following the visit to the Church of Guadalupe, Dr. Bronson was occupied with some business matters that rendered his movements somewhat uncertain. Frank and Fred thought it a good opportunity to make some statistical notes about Mexico, which they had been for some time contemplating, but had postponed in consequence of there being no hurry about the matter. The figures were at hand whenever they chose to use them, and so they had no anxiety on the subject. First, said Fred, we will see the extent of the country, learn how large the population is and of what it is composed. Very well, was Frank's reply. You may put down the figures and other memoranda as I read them off. The youths settled down to their work, Fred at table with notebook and pencil, and Frank with an array of books before him. For an hour or two their heads were, as Dr. Holmes says, anthills of units and tens, as we shall see from the following, which they have permitted us to copy. Mexico lies between the 15th and 33rd parallels of latitude, and the 86th and 117th meridians of longitude. Its greatest length is only a trifle less than 2,000 miles, and its greatest width 750 miles. At the Isthmus of Tehuantepec, it narrows to 140 miles, and this is the place where Captain Eads proposed to make a railway for transporting ships from one ocean to the other. We'll have something to say about this proposition in another place. We cannot find that there has ever been an exact survey of the country, or a careful census of the inhabitants. No two authorities agree concerning the area and population, but an average of the best of them shows that the country measures about 800,000 square miles and has 10,500,000 inhabitants. It is divided into 27 states, one territory, and one federal district. The federal district includes the capital city and may be regarded as the equivalent of the District of Columbia in the United States, though it is much larger in area. One half the population consists of mestizos, or mixed people. One-sixth are Europeans or their Creole descendants, and one-third and more are of pure Indian blood. The following figures are from the last census. Indians, 3,200,000. Europeans and their descendants, 1,500,000. Mestizos, mixed races, 5,800,000. Total, 10,500,000. Senor Garcia Cubas, a Mexican gentleman who has written a statistical work about Mexico, published at the office of the Minister of Public Works, says of the different races of people in the country, 
the difference of dress customs and language shows the heterogeneous character of the population the habits and customs of the people that make up the creole portion of the population are essentially european and conform particularly to the fashions of the french with some features borrowed from the spanish their national language is spanish french is considerably used and english german and italian are receiving increased intention the nearest descendants of the spanish and those less mixed up with the natives of mexico belong by their complexion to the white race the natural inclination of the mixed races to the habits and customs of the whites and creoles as well as their estrangement from those of the natives is the reason that many of them figure in the most important associations of the country by their learning and intelligence including in this number the worthy members of the middle classes from this powerful coalition the force of an energetic development naturally results which is inimical to the indian race many of the natives themselves contribute to this fatal consequence as they have joined the body i have referred to and founded new families with the habits and customs of the upper classes president juarez may be cited as an example of the pure indian of mexico fred remarked who leaves behind him the traditions and customs of his race and adopts those of the enlightened classes i presume so replied frank and every indian who has adopted the dress and ways of the european and identified himself with the nineteenth century habits of thought is helping to assimilate the aboriginal race with the new one in this way the population will in time become essentially european but it will take hundreds of years to bring about such a state of things railways commerce education and liberal ideas will accomplish it and the mexico of the twentieth century promises to be a great improvement upon that of the eighteenth there is now no political distinction on account of race and the social one cannot last much longer having given utterance to the sage remark frank blushed at his audacity in hazarding a prophecy and referred again to the books before him wouldn't it be well said fred to say something about the natives and compare them with the indians of the western states and territories of our own country it certainly would responded frank and so here goes the mexican indian is not much unlike the american one in general appearance as he is of a brown or olive color and has little or no beard his cheekbones are high and he has slender limbs and a broad chest owing to his having been so long accustomed to carrying burdens on his back he is inclined to stoop while the american indian stands erect the mexican indian is also liable to stoutness while the american one is not his dress is pretty much the same in all parts of the country varied of course by the conditions of the climate short and wide trousers of coarse cotton cloth a loose jacket of the same material a serape or blanket for cool weather or at night a straw hat and a pair of sandals form his costume the different tribes are distinguished by the colors of the clothing but this distinction is slowly being effaced now a few words about the creole suggested fred but i have not done with the indians yet replied frank as this is a good place to say something about their houses we have mentioned them in another place but i want to add that in the hot country the indian dwelling is made of wood thatched with palm or banana leaves while in the uplands it is of adobe with a flat roof covered with clay supported by beams and stamped or beaten hard a fire is generally kept burning day and night and near it are the cooking utensils which cost altogether only a few dollars at most the hut has no furniture except a few stools and some mats of cane or rushes which serve as beds at night and seats by day a whole family lives in a space which we should consider small for one person and altogether too restricted for two when the spaniards conquered the country they took possession of the lands and everything else they allowed the indians only sufficient space for their villages and a plot of ground thirty six hundred feet square for agricultural purposes which all the inhabitants of a village were to cultivate in common they still have this common garden but the majority of them abandoned their rights in it 
and earn their living by hiring out with landowners or miners. In former times, a Spaniard spoke of himself as gente to raison, or man of intelligence, while he designated the Indian as gente sin raison, a man of no understanding. The Indians accepted this distinction and often speak of themselves in this way. Of course, this is not the case with the superior ones who have adopted the European ways of living. Now I come to the Creole, said Frank, who are either European or people of European parentage. They were formerly the ruling class of Mexico in every sense of the expression. But since the revolution and the laws of the reform, their position has changed as they are compelled to recognize the equality of the educated Indian, which in olden times they absolutely refused to do. When Juarez, who, as already stated, was an Indian of pure blood, became president, it was a great shock to the sensibilities of many of the old aristocrats, but they survived it because they were compelled to do so. The hostility has generally died out, but a good deal of it lingers and will remain for many generations. I am reminded, said Fred, of a transaction which is attributed to the Pilgrim Fathers of New England when they landed at what is now Plymouth. What is that? They are said to have held a meeting and passed the following preamble and resolution. Whereas, it has been decreed that the saints shall inherit the earth. It is therefore resolved that we are the saints. The Spanish conquerors of Mexico evidently did not think it worth while to pass any resolutions or hold any meetings answered frank with a laugh they went ahead and inherited the earth without bothering themselves about formalities the indians were considered to have no rights that the white men were required to respect and were made to understand that it was owing to the great mercy and tenderness of the spaniards that the natives were not slaughtered down to the last of the race and there is little doubt that they would have been slaughtered had they not been needed for menial work and to make life easy for the newcomers. As before stated, the Creoles have the manners, customs, and dress of Spain to a large extent, though they follow the fashions of France in several particulars. The account of a Mexican courtship shows how the women are secluded as in Spain. The men have the Spanish taste for gaming, bullfights, and gallantry and they have lost little of the polite forms for which Andalusia is famous. Where their means permit, they are princely in their hospitality, and no grandee of Castile could stab his intimate friend with a stiletto more gracefully than can the Mexican Creole in case of a misunderstanding. That the Creole women are pretty and possessed of most fascinating manners is the testimony of all who have seen them. In regard to the mestizo, said Frank, I will quote a few words from Mexico and the Mexicans and let you write them down. Fred assented, whereupon Frank slowly read out the following. The noblest of the Aztecs fell in battle with the Spaniards. Their property fell into the hands of the victors, who at the same time became possessed of the families of those who had fallen. The rude warriors married the dusky daughters, who became their equals by baptism. It was not considered a mesalliance to marry a noble Aztec girl. The sons of Montezuma, who were educated in Spain, received the title of count. The Indian aristocracy adopted Christianity and became amalgamated with the new population. The mestizo is thus the child of a white father and an Indian mother. He is a magnificent horseman. One might take him for an Arab, as lance in hand, he rushes past upon his light steed. In the warmer regions he wears, on Sundays, a carefully plaited white shirt, wide trousers of white or colored drilling, fastened round the hips by a gay girdle, brown leather gaiters, and broad felt hat, with silver cord or fur band around it. The mestizos include the great majority of the rancheros, or farmers, and the arieros, or mule drivers. Many of them are educated and take a leading part in law, politics, and medicine, where they often attain high rank. They are excellent soldiers, especially on horseback, and it is this class of Mexicans that have given the Mexican cavalry its high reputation. How about the Leperos? queried Fred. 
don't they belong among the mestizos yes was the reply that is what the books i am looking at say of them they come from the union of the worst of the two races and are said to possess the vices of both with the good qualities of neither they are the class from which the thieves and beggars of mexico are recruited one writer says a lepero is a thief from infancy and is able to steal as soon as he leaves his mother's arms the chief of police says that nine out of ten of the men and boys selling lottery tickets or newspapers on the streets are thieves and pickpockets and their legitimate business is simply a cloak for the illegal one another authority says that on the line of the mexican railway from vera cruz to the capital nothing that two men can lift is left out of doors after dark all car couplings must be carried into the stations and the rascals used to steal the spikes that held the rails to the ties until the company adopted the plan of riveting them to the rails after they were driven into place brance meyer tells about an englishman who was walking along one of the principal streets of mexico when he suddenly felt his hat rising from his head he looked up and saw it sailing toward the window from which the thief had caught it by the dexterous use of a hook another story that he tells is about a mexican who was stopped on the road by three others who robbed him of his cloak they told him to wait where he was and he would be able to make something by doing so out of curiosity he waited and in a little while an accomplice of the thieves came and handed him a pawn ticket he accompanied the gift with a graceful bow and explained that the cloak had been pawned for thirty dollars we wanted the money and not the cloak the thief explained and as the garment is worth at least a hundred dollars you can redeem it and make seventy dollars by the transaction there was once a lepero who pretended to be converted by the preaching and teaching of a missionary and the good man gave him employment as janitor of the church one day an organ was delivered at the church and the missionary appointed a time when it should be exhibited to his friends the party assembled accordingly and the missionary was surprised to find that the janitor was absent he was still more surprised when he found that the organ had followed the janitor's example and was missing the janitor had carried away during the night to a neighboring empeño and pawned the instrument for whatever he could obtain on it we may add to frank's account of this gentry that the brigands were of the lepero class though very often they had leaders of a higher rank of life the government has executed a good many of them in its efforts to break up the system of highway robbery and altogether the natural instincts of the leperos have been greatly curbed in recent years they are almost always armed with either knife or pistol and make ready use of these weapons on frequent occasions at nearly every festival or assemblage of any kind fights among leperos form a part of the proceedings it is not customary to interfere between the combatants the bystanders forming a circle and looking calmly on until one of them falls fred laid aside his pencil and notebook while frank closed the volumes he had consulted this done the youths went out for a stroll intending to submit the result of their labors to the doctor when next they met him their walk took them to the church of san domingo which was once a magnificent building but has suffered greatly in its proportions and decorations in recent years it was the church of the dominican order of priesthood and had a large convent near it the convent or more properly monastery has been destroyed and the church has lost some of its parts by reason of the extension of streets which were needed for the business of the city close to the church is the school of medicine which is partly supported by government and partly by fees received from the students the building was interesting to frank and fred because it was once the tribunal of the inquisition which was established in mexico in fifteen seventy one and suppressed in eighteen thirteen immediately after the suppression of the inquisition the building was converted into a prison afterwards it was the office of the government lotteries and then a barrack for soldiers the mexican congress met here for a time and in 1854 the building was adapted to its present use as a school of medicine one day the youths accompanied dr bronson in a visit to the school and while he was busy with medical matters they accompanied their guide in looking up the few traces that remain of the inquisition 
some of the cells where prisoners were confined were shown to them and also the room where they were tried after their return from the inspection the youths tried to obtain a full history of the inquisition but were unsuccessful dr bronson told them that no satisfactory and impartial history of it had ever been written all the works that have appeared on the subject being either very hostile or very friendly briefly we may say added the doctor that the inquisition was formally established in the thirteenth century and came to an end in the first part of the nineteenth but trials and punishment for heresy had taken place as early as the fourth century the inquisition was more powerful in spain than in any other country of europe and it never had any hold of consequence outside of spain italy and france and the colonies of spain one historian lorente says that during the whole period of the spanish inquisition from fourteen eighty three to eighteen o eight thirty one thousand nine hundred twelve persons were burned alive seventeen thousand six hundred fifty nine were burned in effigy and two hundred ninety one thousand four hundred fifty six were subjected to rigorous pains and penalties the accuracy of his statements is doubted prescott considering them greatly exaggerated and his figures most improbable and other writers share prescott's opinion the decree by which the inquisition was established in mexico especially exempted the indians from its operations and thereby secured its popularity among them as the public burning of spanish and other heretics afforded much amusement to the natives and was a sort of substitute for the human sacrifices of the aztecs which the conquest had abolished the mexican inquisition was under the special charge of the dominican order the same as in spain and hence was associated with the church of san domingo there is continued the doctor a popular misapprehension concerning the auto da fe or profession of faith it is generally believed to be the burning of the condemned whereas the auto da fe was simply the public ceremony that followed the secret trial by the inquisition the members of the tribunal and all others assembled with them made a public auto da fe or profession of their faith in christianity and the doctrines of the church after this was done the list of the condemned was read together with the punishments accorded to them and then the victims were handed over to the civil authorities for punishment the trial and sentence were the work of the church but the punishment was that of the civil power only the first auto da fe in mexico was in fifteen seventy four when twenty-one pestilent lutherans were burned and from that time on the public burnings were frequent how many people perished in these affairs is not known but it must not be understood that all the victims who suffered were burned alive in most instances even where the body of the condemned man was burned he was killed by strangling thus in one case where fifteen persons perished fourteen were first strangled and only one was burned alive the penalty of death by burning was visited only upon heretics and sorcerers and here added the doctor is a photograph of four victims of the inquisition whose skeletons were found in the wall of the building which was the seat of the tribunal in mexico they are supposed to have been built into the wall at the time of its construction but nothing is actually known concerning them the trials of accused persons were always held in secret the unfortunates were not permitted to see their accusers or even know their names the punishments were death by fire or on the scaffold imprisonment for life or shorter terms with or without hard labor forfeiture of property civil infamy and in mild cases public retraction and penance accused persons might be tortured to make them confess their guilt and an accomplice might be a witness against an accused individual what a horrible system exclaimed frank yes replied the doctor but you must remember that it was very nearly the same form of procedure as that of the civil tribunals of the same countries and times and not unlike what is known in some parts of the world at the present day and furthermore remember that while the inquisitors of spain and mexico were doing the deeds which had been proven against them persecution was by no means unknown in england and america perhaps at the very hour when a victim of the inquisition was being put to death in mexico 
the Christian people of Salem, Massachusetts, were hanging somebody accused of being a witch, or the English Puritans under Cromwell were putting Charles I to death. End of chapter 17